Hello Zebra Herd, welcome back to Pikmin 4. Today is the bonus episode of the series. There's a couple of extra things in the game I still wanted to look at before we're all finished, and that's what today is all about. So with that being said, let's get started with them. All right, so we're back here at the uh, home base. What's going on here? Did everyone forget how to prepare for launch? No, it's my fault, Captain. I was able to clear up our communication issues and make contact with Rescue Corps HQ. They'd like us to stand by for a little longer until they've prepared to receive all the survivors we found here. I believe I speak for all the castaways you've rescued when I say we'll do whatever the Rescue Corps requires. Well then, that, then let's put off our departure for a bit longer. Officers do what need to be done. In the meantime, Bernard, make all the necessary preparations so we can return home as soon as we're ready. Copy that. I'll be standing by and ready for takeoff at a moment's notice. All right, so I guess that's sort of how they explain everything about how we're still here. But um, if we take a look around, I mean, the first thing I wanted to see was uh, just the map. It looks like there might be a new entry in our voyage lock, which is pretty cool, from Alamar. So I wanna see what he might have added into this. Pikmin, all lost. I got careless and all the Pikmin perished as a result. Horrified, I made my way back to the base only to find that the onion had released one Pikmin seed. This behavior likely developed to prevent extinction. I have sworn to take better care next time. Cross my heart. <laughs> Interesting, so I don't know if we have any other logs that we might have missed. As far as I can tell, that should be all of them. So far, I'm just sort of scrolling through. We do have the creatures are back. I was sure I had scoured 100% of the cave before returning to the surface, only to casually re-enter and find it teeming with the creatures I had thought I had defeated. Or perhaps others of their kind have claimed the territory. The underground bursts with life. And I think that's actually just detailing the fact that if we go back in the caves, the enemies will return, which is perfect for the Lily quest we'll be tackling later. Was there any other thing that we had to do here? For the moment, it doesn't seem like it. It seems like that is all of them. Yep, all the way up to number 80. So, very cool. We saw all the Voyage Log entries now, which is great that we're all caught up. But yeah, that's sort of what I wanna focus on for right now is that there's still one more line of side quests to do, and that is the Louie quest straight over here. So if I talk to Louie again, check out something, something hollows in that terrorist place. So yeah, our first one will be that one the Wii mission, if we take a look at this, all of these are clear, all the main missions. We just have the side ones, which most of these are recurring, as far as I can tell, except for Fit for a Feast. So we'll do that soon enough. I just wanna make sure, yeah, we also have the Dandori training. We can get golden all challenges and battles. I might do that today just for the sake of it, but for right now, Fit for a Feast is what I wanna focus on. Go find four dwarf bulborbs. They're super yummy in stews and soups. I think I spotted some at the something something hollows. Okay. That's what I want to do for sure. So we'll head out to the something something hollows, which I think was um, in the sun spotted terrace. So let's talk to you and get going. Be sure to investigate thoroughly now. Life's too short for regrets. All right, ready to explore. Which area would you like to explore? Okay, so yeah, we'll go to the sun speckled terrace. We'll go to whatever cave we're supposed to head into and hopefully we'll find all the enemies we need to find. Okay, so here we are at Sun Speckled Terrace. So there should be a cave called the Something Something Hollows. Uh, this is the Crackling Cauldron. This is the Last Frost Cavern, Industrial Maze. Hectic Hollows is probably what we're after. So I'll try to make my way over there then. In the meantime, let's go ahead and get whatever Pikmin I might need. Looks like, you know, red, yellow, ice should be the combo that we need. And we just gotta make sure we're going the right way, which way over there doesn't matter too much as long as we can just get up there. So we're holding 100 Pikmin, <laughs> pretty nice. And we'll go over here. We do have, of course, the, the forever charge, so I definitely wanna make the most of that. Cause I think it was up over this way, and it would have been this first cave that we found, right? Definitely. So yeah, let's try going to the Hectic Hollows. Once again, it was Dwarf Fulborbs, four of them in total. So that really shouldn't be that hard to find, I don't think. I guess we'll find out. We're gonna have 50 red and 50 ice. Let's see if we can't find a couple of Dwarf Fulborbs. All right, so I think those little guys right over there are dwarf bulbs, and something's happening. Huh? I thought we cleared all the creatures out of this cave, but now it's teeming with them yet again. They must have found all this open territory and moved right in. It just goes to show that even if you explore 100% of a cave, the natural world won't be kept at bay for long. Definitely. All right, so I guess we'll get over here. This place looks just how we left it. We can defeat you and defeat you. So that's already two of them out of the way pretty easily. 
Um, I don't see any more on this side, but it looks like it remembered our bag being moved, so that's good. Uh, we got another one right over here, and right over this way. So that should be four dwarf bull borbs, right? I guess we'll find out in just a moment as they get zipped up. There's one, and here comes two. We'll go ahead and move some more Pikmin over just so that we can get that figured out. But so far, this seems like it'd be pretty easy to figure out, right? I guess the only thing is that we'll have to use an entire day to get back home and talk to Louie again. But with that done, we get a little bit more sparklium and we get it clear. So, I mean, that was really the side mission. Do I wanna just go talk to Louie again? I don't know. Seems like it. Um, not really too much more I can do here. So, I mean, that's all I really wanted to do for this cave and everything. So, maybe I could uh, get a couple of the other quests figured out, just, you know, getting extra um, Pikmin Bloom and stuff, but I really don't need to. So, for the sake of saving time, I think we'll just return to the surface and then I'll end the day. We'll go talk to Louie again and see what we have to do next. So we've made it back home. I don't know if there's really gonna be too much else to read here, but we'll be talking talking to Louie in a moment. Dingo, how are you feeling? Back to your old self? Oh, um, yeah, if it is a feather over here. Ugh, why did I say that? So stupid. Glad to hear it. Then he must be ready for, to assist Zebra. Uh, I don't know. I'm not quite 100% yet. Help, help out the rookie? Ugh. I don't know if we could really even be considered a rookie at this point, but now that we've done that, we can go and talk to Louie in this next day, which I think we're about to reach day 50, right? Quite the accomplishment, the big 5-0. And at this point, there's just not really much more for us to do, but, you know, quick days because of that. But let's go ahead and talk to Louie right over this way, just so that I can get an immediate start on this. So. We'll get over here. Louie was over here before, right? Oh, over this way. Gotcha. Hi, Louie. Uh, how you doing? You got the grub, huh? Then take this. All right, we get 20 material for it. Didn't really need it, but good to have it. Go get more ingredients. I'm still missing some. Okay, so now it's time to find two yellow, yellow Wally Hops. Sure. Next, I want two yellow Wally Hops. I think I saw some at the Blah Blah Courtyard. Blah Blah Courtyard. Uh, I'll have to really think on what that one could be, but obviously the mission's gonna pop up here, Fit for a Feast 2. I want two yellow Wally Hops. If you grill their legs till they're well done, they make for a crunchy snack. You can find them at the Blah Blah Courtyard, I think. I don't know what that is, but I mean, we'll have to take a look for sure. So we're here at the Blossomy Arcadia. I can only assume that, you know, this will be the next area since it's like the second one. So it was the something something courtyard. This is Sightless Passage. That's also Sightless Passage. Okay, interesting. Um, The Drafty Gallery. This one is Secluded Courtyard. Okay, this is definitely what we're after. So I will run over there super duper fast just so we can get that next one done. And I guess uh, we'll see for ourselves if this one's gonna be as fast as the other. It was that one right there. So we just gotta loop around this bag a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry, Ochi. Uh, and then I think it's this one here. If I'm not mistaken, we'll be hopping into the secluded courtyard. Okay, cool. So I don't know what level we'll find these yellow Wally hops, so I'll just start at sub level one and continue to look through until we find them. Okay, so we are on the second sub level of the secluded courtyard, and I believe this right here is a yellow Wally hop. It's yellow, it hops. I think that's, oh no, but it froze. Uh-oh, I didn't think about that. So maybe not what I was supposed to do there. I wonder if I can reset. Oh, maybe just rewind really quickly. Yeah, that's probably our best bet, right? Rewind time from when we entered here. Start of sub level. Okay, yeah. Cause I wanna make sure we don't freeze them. That's, that's not the best idea. Okay, trying again. So let's not use our ice pick then at all. I'll just go like this, send as many of these guys as possible, and eventually it'll get the job done. Come on, keep going, keep going, keep going. Great. And then, what do you need? And also another five over, just like that. And hopefully we can find a few more. So we're supposed to get three in total. That's not a yellow wally hop, and that's the exit. So, I mean, I guess I'll tackle you just to deal with you. And then there's another waiting for us over this way. I sort of need them to like attack us so that they're out of the water. That'd be the most convenient thing. And I guess if I could maybe just do that and then just get them over here like this. There we go. 
Just get them to freeze out and then fight them with this right here. Okay, I just need to call my one ice pick them back because I don't want them to freeze. Come on, keep it going, keep it going. Because we have one of the yellow wally hops. This is our second one right here. And then we're all good. Excellent. So hopefully they can start carrying that over. There we go. And then get another five over there just so they can move it a little bit faster. Once we get that one, once again, we're good to get out of here and that'll leave this day completed. It's super fast, but I mean, I guess it really doesn't matter how high the days get as long as we get this stuff done. That's what matters most, so. Okay, well I didn't mean to cancel that, but I wanted to uh, send a bunch of people in to get them bloomed. There we go, so the side mission of finding two yellow, ho yellow Wally Hops is clear. We can head out of this cave and along with it, we can uh, end the day. Okay, so that's wrapping up another day. Captain, you were the one who personally recruited Bernard to the rescue corps, isn't that right? Yep, I stopped by the Universal Service Post Office to send a package a few years back. Then I heard this voice saying, I can deliver that package faster than absolutely anyone. Huh, and you didn't think that was kind of suspicious behavior? It was pretty suspicious, I guess, but you did deliver my, t my package two days faster than the other guys. Our previous pilot had just retired, so I decided to give him a chance. I think it worked out for the best. It would have worked out even better if he spoke just a little quieter. I don't know, I like his charisma. So we're gonna go just talk to Louis straight away. And hopefully we can get this mission done pretty quickly. Okay, since we've seen this a million times, I will just get through this stuff just for the sake of time, just because doing a lot of repetitive tasks. Walk up here though, if I can. Let's get Ochi to help us. You got the grub, huh? Then take this. Ooh, so we got this one fit for a piece to complete. Go get more ingredients. I'm still missing some. So now we have to find one pickish aristocrab. Where will we find that, though, is the question. I'm in the mood for one pickish aristocrab. You can catch them at that resort place. Okay, so I think I know what they're, they're talking about, but for right now, Let's see our mission over this way. Fit for phase three, I'm hungry for one peckish aristocrat, but I do want a crab, do, do I want crab soup or crab skewers? Tough call. Anyway, you can catch them at the resort place. Get to it. <laughs> All right, let's get to it then indeed. We'll head back in to um, the Serene Shores this time and see if we can't find this resort. All right, we've made it to Serene Shores and with it, I will just check the map really quickly. It's gotta be one of these, right? So if we just pause, what do we got? Uh, There we go, C4 Resort. That's very likely the one we're trying to get to, and it's not too far off. So maybe I could just sprint over. I don't know if I could jump out of the water well enough. Oh, sorry, Hoochie. Um, oh, not quite. Oh, come on. Oh, that would be great. Can't quite do that. So what other way around do I wanna go? Just around like that, I suppose. Can I charge under the water? Whoa, we're power swimmers. This is great. So we just gotta get around here, cancel it really quickly to make sure that Ochi doesn't bump against the wall this time. And we go, go, go over here to the C4 Resort and try to find ourselves a peckish aristocrab. Okay, so we're at level two of this whole area and I'm pretty sure this right here is the aristocrab we're looking for. So that's the blasted creature. There's that blasted creature. All right, so I could give it a taste of a bomb if I wanted to. I don't know if I'll do all that. I mean, right now I'm just having fun doing this. And there we go, we're able to defeat you. We might have lost a couple of Pikmin, but that's okay. I think this is the one we're looking for. Guess we'll find out in just a moment. I'll throw a couple more Pikmin over there to help. And throw a couple more and... Okay, looks like that's all that's gonna work for now. That's okay, that should still be quite enough for it to get over here pretty quickly. So, 13 out of seven. Oh wait, 14? Out of seven? Oh, just at the last moment. There we go. Is that our peckish aristocrat? It is. So, making super quick work of this. Once again, we'll run all the way back home and talk to Louie once more. All right, so let's see what's going on next. You know, when I saw those glow Pikmin-y things, an old memory came back to me. Something I'd almost forgotten. Mm-hmm, what kind of memory? It was back at home. One day, out of nowhere, my body suddenly started to glow. It lasted for like three days, I think. Huh. I don't remember that at all. It was probably just a bad dream or something. Not worth digging into any further. I hope he doesn't remember anything else. Oh no, <laughs> it was a weird experiment. So let's go ahead and try to finish fe Fit for a Feast number three here with Louis. We'll just have to make our way in to uh, day 52, right? All right. 
Okay, so I'm gonna hop on top of Ochi over here and just talk to Louis straight away. I'm guessing there's gonna be a mission for each area at this rate. You got the grub, huh? Then take this. Very cool. Fit for, fit for Feast 3, go get more ingredients. I'm still missing some. So now we need a fiery bulbal axe, just one of them. We talk to you again. I'm so hungry I could eat one whole fiery bull blacks. They might be in that cave called something something the beast. All right, well, something something the beast, here we come. As well as maybe taking a look at our missions here, we have, I'm in the mood for one whole fiery bull blacks. Their eyes are the best part. You may be able to find some in the cave, in that cave called something something beast. So once again, we're heading back into the action. I just need to run over here, talk to Colin and get ready to explore again. So, with this one, we're going to Hero's Hideaway, and hopefully we'll find it there. Okay, so it was not at Hero's Hideaway, instead it was at the Giant's Hearth, or wherever we are now. Um, so I'll try to find it, it was the, something of the beast, right? So it should be Cradle of the Beast, right over here. Sort of, sort of a pain to get to. Sort of wasted a day like that, but that's all right. We'll, we'll find our way over there now. I'm heading the right direction, that is. Um, yes, okay, so I wanna take a left over here. Don't run into the wall, OG. And... Was it this one? I think it's this one. So we'll finally head into the Cradle of the Beast and get another enemy found, the Fiery Bull Blacks. Here we go. Okay, so here we are at sub-level one. There's a Fiery Bull Blacks just chilling out. Boom, hit them and boom. <laughs> Look at how easy it was to do that. All that work running around to the wrong area just to get that figured out, but we do find a way. And now I will just uh, throw a bunch more Pikmin over in hopes to just rush it over a little bit faster. That's really all we needed. It just, that's sort of the downside of these quests is that they're fun to do, but such a bunch of work to get done just for like one little thing. And then I just, most of it's just going through menus and waiting to get to where we're supposed to. So I just have to do the same thing again, return to the surface, end the day, and go talk to Louie once more. All right, another day finished. Ooh, I expect an apology from you, Dingo, and you better make it good. Fair enough. No surprise, he's still angry. I messed up, I'm sorry. I never should have run away and abandoned you out there after the crash. What are you talking about? I'm talking about my pizza. It is time for you to apologize for eating my pizza without asking, oh my gosh. That's worse than leaving them out there to survive. Huh, you're mad about pizza? This is what I get for being sincere. <laughs> hey, pizza's a serious deal. All right then, so let's go ahead and talk to Louie one more time and let's see what our next mission might be. Okay, so I'll hop on and we'll talk to you. Hi Louie. Yeah. You got the grub, huh? Then take this. 20 more material, and go get more ingredients. I'm still missing some. All right, so now we need to find one giant bread bug. I wonder where. Just one giant bread bug. Look for one at a place called something something pass, which I think was at the hero's hideaway for real this time. I guess we'll see soon enough. So we go to the missions, side missions, fit for a feast five, I need one giant bread bug. They're pretty bland on their own, but maybe I can dress it up. Go look for one at the insert word here, palace. <laughs> All right, let's try to find that one then. Okay, now we're at Hero's Hideaway. I thought I needed to be here before, turns out I didn't. Now I do, we wanna go to Plunder Palace right over there. So that should be pretty simple to get to. I wonder if Moss is still here, I guess not. <laughs> Didn't really think about that too much until now, but we're gonna rush over this way and just try to get up there any way we can. It looks like up there ow, is our goal. So let's just try to go over there super fast. Jump, 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 and jump. We got it. All right, heading up here. As soon as it brings us up, we'll just head into that palace and try to find ourselves a giant bread bug. The bread bugs are a little bit more difficult to defeat, but we'll find a way, we'll find a way for sure. So I'm entering this one and we'll try to find that bread bug. Okay, so we're back here, of course. We've defeated this giant bread bug before. This is the uh, final sub-level of this whole thing. I'm just trying to clear out some of these enemies for the sake of it. Oh, hey, you're here. So you're gonna try to take it. I think we just need to fight you, if I'm not mistaken. So here we go, here we go. Yep, we just gotta do a little tug of war. It's so cute, though. And I guess I could just fight you like this, can I? Did that work? Whoa, hey, watch it. Not good. Did we lose any Pikmin for that? I don't think we did. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know if I could just continually do that. Doesn't seem like it worked. So, are you gonna go for this other one? Over here? Okay, they're rushing over. I just wanna try to fight them. I don't know why they let go, really. Maybe if I just send a couple more purple Pikmin. Oh, that squished them. That was good. Okay, call them back over. That might be my best way to do this. And whoa, watch it. I don't know if they're gonna come back over. Here's hoping they do. Come on, it's nice and delicious. You got this little little monster here, don't you want it? I'm gonna try to take it if you don't take it. Come on, we gotta tempt them. It doesn't seem, oh hey, there's another one. Okay, you know what? Maybe I should do it with this guy then. Um, maybe I'll just do like a 30 Pikmin tug of war like that. Let's your strength and pull them back. And you can see it's just dragging them along. That's so silly. Okay, this is our chance then, right? Come on, come on, just a little bit more. Ah, not quite, not quite. So, a little messy, move all my Pikmin out of the way. Yikes, not good. So I need to find something else to sort of tug of war them with. I don't see anything really over here is the problem. And I can't just toss stuff at you like that. Okay, here we go, here we go. So, do a lot of this. That definitely works. Ooh, not good. Oh, did you eat a Pikmin? You might have eaten a Pikmin. All right, get up, Ochi and see if we can't win one of these tug of wars. Okay, ready, and then if I could just try to beat you up this way. Is this working at all? It was working before, it's not really working now. Um, no, no, no. Come on, come on. Keep fighting, keep fighting. It's not really working at the moment. That was working before then. Maybe if I get higher up? Not really, okay. We'll just bring you all the way back over then. We're almost there. <laughs> it's so silly. He's trying so hard. Hey, what are you doing over here? Um. Okay, well I can't do too much about that one. But this one, it doesn't really matter which one I defeat. I just need to defeat one of them. Come on, come on, come on. And that should hit you pretty good. Um. There we go. And did that hurt you? There we go, that's what I'm talking about. So we should just be able to drag you in. Oh, there's still that big tug war happening. Um, I'm a little confused on what happened to my Pikmin there, but it's okay because we got the one giant bread bug is complete. We don't have to worry about the rest of this end, so I will just immediately return to the surface and head back to Louie. Okay, another day completed. I'm curious, Colin. How is it that you know how to do so many different things? Shucks, I don't know. I guess I've just had a lot of odd jobs over the years. To pay my way through college, I cleaned the colony's outer walls and worked nights doing ship construction. I even had a gig collecting space junk at one point. Honestly, there's not much I haven't done. Wow, sounds like you've been through the ringer. Nah, those jobs were all pretty easy compared to this one. Oh, well, this got awkward. <laughs> it definitely has. So we're heading out into the next day as we have before. And we will just um hop back on top of you. Talk to Louie once more. I don't know how many more of these are left. You got the grub, huh? And take this. All right, so that's fit for a feast. Five, if I had to guess, it's probably gonna be six of them in total. Go get more ingredients. I'm still missing some. All right, so find one sovereign bowl blocks. Oh no, I think that's a big scary one. I guess we'll find out. I could go for one sovereign bowl blocks tonight. You can find one for me wherever that giant dog is. Oh no. I think I know exactly what they mean. So it's gonna be in that last area for sure. Um, missions, right over here. Fit for a feast six. Tonight, I'm in the mood for a sovereign bowl blocks. I'll make it into a three course meal. I bet there'll be one at the giant dog's den. All right, very cool. Also, very scary. Let's head all the way over to the last area of the game and try to find that sovereign bowl blocks. All right, so we're here at the primordial thicket. I know exactly what we need to do. We need to rush over to um the cavern for a king, which is on the other side of the map here, so. Hopefully we won't find too much issue heading over, but this is definitely one of the areas that feels a bit odd because of the fact that there's just not much to do here. I'm climb up this way. Am I still heading the right direction? Yep, I gotta go over here. But then we'll just be able to head straight into that cavern and I'll have to try to find the one that's gonna have the bull blacks. Oh no, oh no, oh no, wait, wait, wait. Okay, I made it, I made it. Sorry, Ochi. Don't worry though, just gonna hop into the cavern as soon as we can and try to find whatever level. Of course, there's quite a lot of levels I'll try to find whichever one's gonna have our bull blacks. Okay, we're at sub level 18 of Cavern for a King, which is where I believe we can find, oh no. 
this big guy right over here. We have a lot of the blue Pikmin already, hopefully enough to get through all this. I just sort of did the recommended amount of Pikmin. And oh no, here we go. So we have a lot of items and stuff. I figure that it might be good to use some of them. So if I go to my pack, I can just go ahead and at least throw out a couple of mines and stuff like this. Ready, mine and mine. Oh no, oh no, oh no. And I might just lick one of them up, that'd be great. It looks like it will, so I will just send out as many Pikmin as I can, really power them up too, and let's just see if we can't give you everything we got here. Boom. Oh, look at the damage shell. So easy, so good, that was perfect. So I'll grab all those extra goodies over here. I'll even pick that back up, that's great. And then we just gotta move you over. Okay, so this is why we need a bunch of blue Pikmin though, is to actually get you brought in. Fantastic to see it, so. Throw over as many blue Pikmin as possible, and they're rushing over because they're all boosted up, so that was great, I'm so happy. All right, very, very cool. Grab all you guys too, and that should be a job well done. There we go, find one sovereign, bull blacks complete. We'll just rush right back over to Louie here in just a moment. I got some more stuff here, but I guess everybody's bloomed because of the uh, spicy nectar. So yeah, I'm out of here. All right, another day finished. Going forward, we need to prioritize Ochi's training even more. Russ, prepare plenty of scrummy bones for us to use as rewards. Understood, understood, Captain. How many do you think you'll need? Hmm, good question. Let's start with a thousand or so for now and see how long that lasts us. A thousand? Don't you think that's a bit extreme? <laughs> it might be. All right then, so let's go and talk to Louie real quick. Just get this done. And I'm really thinking this has to be the last one, right? With all the adventuring we've done, I can only hope. So I'll run over to Louie right over here, and we'll find out together. Hi, Louie. Now that I have the ingredients I need, you can have this. Ooh, this is new extra hand. Whoa, mission complete. So what is the extra hand? A sovereign bull blacks feast for supper. It's going to be a good night. I guess so. So is that it for you? I like this planet. I want to show it to Nana someday. <laughs> Interesting. So what is this new thing? Can I talk to somebody about it? What is this new upgrade? I can't just like randomly get an upgrade and not be told about it. Uh, fit for fee six. Extra hand. What does it do? Um, I'm a little confused. Okay, if I go into gears and skills, it's here. Okay, extra hand gear equipped. I hear you only carry the same amount as a single Pikmin. There's absolutely no shame in giving science a noble purpose. Interesting, so we can carry our own thing here, as you can see. Whoa, that's so neat. So we are as strong as one little Pikmin. So I guess if we wanted to, I can send Ochi over, but then I can be the one who picks it up, right? Well, okay, that's not what I wanted. Um, What if I send Ochi off somewhere? If I command Ochi just to run off. Yeah, go to the the base. And then what happens if I'm just here, I can transport it myself. Look at this. I don't know if we'll ever end up using this because you know the game's sort of over, but hey, pretty neat to have it. Just a little tiny way to up our Dandori even more. So that was a pretty cool side quest to do with Louie, and I think really the only final main game side quest I really wanted to get into. But now that we're you know, here at the base, there are a couple of other things I wanna check out. And the first one actually being Ochi. If I switch over to Ochi, a lot of you has asked me to just talk to different people as Ochi, like this. The number one priority for a rescue pup is saving lives. Got it, Ochi? <laughs> so we can just talk to different people and they'll have different lines to say. Oh, hey there, Ochi. What's new? Very cute. So I guess we'll maybe talk to a little bit of people here. Oh, don't you worry. I didn't forget about you. I'm making all sorts of rescue pup gear for you too. Very cool. Hey there, Archie. You're looking perky. Maybe a little too perky. Should I give you a checkup? I think Ochi's good for now. Over here though, we got a couple more people. I don't know if they'll all have unique lines. They're there. Aren't you just the cutest little Ochi? Yeah, some of them might not be able to say too much interesting. Oh, Ochi, you have a good nose for treasure, don't you? Maybe we'll speak to a few of the uh, different uh, rescues over this way. Ah, you look like you're feeling good. But if you start feeling bad, I want you to come straight to me, okay? Well, oh, so cute. 
If I could create a machine to sniff out treasures the way you do, it sure would come in handy for treasure hunting. With me, you've got a friend for life, Ochi. Can't wait to see where the future takes us. I'm glad, I'm glad. So maybe we'll talk to a couple more of these people. Ha ha ha, I can tell you're a truly good dog. And then maybe you. Just by looking into your eyes, I can tell you really believe in your partner. Oh, let's go talk to Olimar and Louie too, just to see if they have anything neat to say. And maybe all the rescue corps members. Like, uh, Dingo. Ah, why are you running loose? That's poor mom management, ugh. What's that newbie doing? Don't they realize how irresponsible this is? I don't think that's the case. Ochi, hey, you getting nice, or getting along nice with your new buddy? I think we are. So yeah, you over here, Alamar. How you doing? You know, you're almost as cute as Bulby. <laughs> cute. Hi, Moss. <laughs> Can we play with Moss? Moss doesn't seem too interested right now. Maybe a little tired. Hi, Louie. Hmm. Yeah. Bigger dogs are better. <laughs> That's a little rude to say. I'm guessing comparing us to the big dog that we um fought as the final boss. Okay. Let's just go back together. And now we're, there we go, we're all combat. That was pretty neat, I'm glad we checked that out. So, all right, with that done, there are still a couple more things I definitely wanna worry about, and I think for right now it's getting the golden medals. If we take a look at our missions right over here, um, we can see that there are a couple missions I didn't really do fully, uh, like beat Din Dory Challenge number four. Um, strength, and spirit alone, or strength and Spirit alone are enough for an adventure. Uh, you also need the ability to imagine achieving the best Dandori outcomes. Take on some battles and polish your Dandori skills. So basically we just need to get gold medal. We're better in whatever we haven't gotten a gold medal in. So that's what I wanna work on for right now. Let's try Dandori training and see what still needs to be improved on. Most stuff I got platinum, but there's a couple of things here that I only got bronze in. So we're gonna try the first one, Ice Cross Course. Educate yourself in all things Ice Pikmin as you seek Dandori mastery. Careful, can, carefully consider um, when to freeze and when to melt the water. Let's give it a try. Okay, so it's time for Dandori. We have um, a lot of stuff to do around here, but for right now, it's sort of just me mentally figuring out what's going on around us. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and get them to fight, and then Boom's gonna tackle you straight away. That feels like a good move. One, two, three, and then back over here. Should be able to defeat you pretty quick. And then one, two, three. While that's happening, I probably wanna call these ice pigment over so that it'll break this ice as soon as these guys have moved off. Um, oh no, I think, I hope. Ooh, will they make it? They will make it, cool. So let's definitely get as many blue Pikmin as we can onto this. And then maybe a couple of the ice Pikmin, not intentionally, but that's what they did. Okay, so I might wanna just charge through all this stuff and then boom, go straight into you. And OG here seems to be fully upgraded, so. I guess we'll have to wait and see if that's really the case here. Oh no, some of our Pikmin having some issues, but come on, we can just keep attacking a little bit more, and boom, gotcha broken up. So that's pretty nice. Excavation put it over there. I don't know if beating them up that way was actually good though, because I do get less points overall, I think. Anyways, we could definitely charge through you just like that, then recruit all of these Pikmin. Um, and that'll be one, two, three over here, and then definitely send Ochi over to this. I think that's a good idea. We would need seven Pikmin for that one. So maybe instead we just send them over here. I get whatever extra Pikmin we need. We should be in a pretty good spot. So you guys over this way, that's six of them. Definitely get them the balloon if we can. There we go, not too bad. And I suppose, since it's not a ton of Pikmin, get them to work on this golden stuff too. Still a lot more to do around here though, so I just wanna make sure we're not wasting too much time. Um, I guess I'll go over here for now because there's a lot of these little things. But I do see those blue Pikmin that I can maybe just call over. There you go. Get them to come on, on a, down this way and that'd be really nice because that gets us up to three of them. I see a few more that are trying to get over here. Um, and then you guys, yep, you got it. Okay, so what are these? One, two, one, two, one, two. We're definitely moving pretty well. I don't think that Ochi can grab this, right? Or maybe Ochi can? Whoa, Ochi can, that's great. Really glad to see that one, actually. Um, we'll call more Pikmin over, but I definitely want this tank to be defeated as soon as possible. So I'll do this. I don't have any spicy nectar or anything, but it looks like they're able to defeat it pretty quickly. So I guess it wasn't too big of a deal after all. We only need seven blue Pikmin for this. So I guess I'll do that and then call you guys over for sure. Um, and what do we need for this one? 12. So I do need one more blue Pikmin. If we can find one at some point, that'd be fantastic. Uh, but for right now, okay, here they are, here they are. 
at least some of them. Yep, okay. Got it, got it. Because there's still quite a lot to do around here. I guess we should focus on this gold if we can. And then send a couple Pikmin at that nectar. Feels like a good plan. Hop on top of Ochi if possible and see what else we can do around here. Because there's definitely a lot more. I want to send one more Pikmin over that way. That's not what I wanted. Over that way. And then maybe one there. And I do see this whole situation over here. So I think I'll do that. I'll grab these ice Pikmin as well because everything is sort of finished off in that corner. Now I gotta sort of just worry about this. So I would like to get up here one way or another. I don't know if that's gonna work. It doesn't seem like it. So maybe I could just yep, get those 10 to work like that. Definitely call those Pikmin over just down this way and see what we gotta do over here. We still have two minutes left over and we're trying our best to get this done. So I think we just call everybody over, do a little bit of that. And then definitely send Ochi over here as well as a bunch of our other Pikmin friends and maybe we can get some stuff done. There we go. Um, so they're all busy at work, two minutes remaining. I'll call some friends over. Just whatever Pikmin are available and it looks like it's quite a lot of them at the, at the moment. So that's really, really good. We're doing quite a good job with a lot of things here but I definitely need to toss a few of them up this way for that and then two more over there. Over here, same deal. Just try to break up some more of that gold. Whatever Pikmin I do have left over, which is 14 of them, can make their way over here. So seven more Pikmin there and here. And I think that's really all of it. I don't see too many other treasures. If we pause the game, it really does seem like that's the last of it. So maybe we've done a good job here finishing everything up. We're gonna find out soon enough. I will call the Pikmin over here instead. I'll hop on top of Ochi and see what else we can help with. Even if it is just tossing a couple of these things over or over this way, we are definitely getting better than we did before. I mean, obviously with our upgrades, that certainly helped out a bunch, but we'll see those two zipped up. What are we really missing? Was that everything? That's it. So yeah, we didn't quite get platinum. And I think that's because some of the enemies, that one enemy we destroyed instead of actually bringing it back was a little bit of a mistake, but hey, I'm not trying for platinum, I'm just trying for gold. I could replay this and we have plenty of time. Oh no, I still get platinum. Okay, never mind. we're good. <laughs> awesome, so I wanna, no wait, I don't wanna retry. I wanted to leave. Uh, so I'll leave this one now, but that's one of our missions done now at, at gold. So if I could just end this the Endory Challenge and try the other ones in the same way, hopefully we'll be able to get those done just as well. So yeah, now we need to do Hefty Hallway, get this from bronze to at least gold. All right, so for this one, we'll wanna hop on top of Ochi and I wanna tackle this guy as fast as I can, just like this, boom! That was pretty nice. Everybody at a snail, beat you up as much as we can, get a good chomp on that. And then five there. I do remember this one being a bit of a struggle though, so we will have to be careful. Ochi's pretty fast at digging, so while that is happening, we wanna fight this over here. Oh yeah, I remember this one being so, so challenging. So I can only hope that it'll be a little bit easier this time, but there is that done. Um, over here I have this banana. I think I'll worry about that later actually. And I'll focus on this for a bit for now. So something like this might be a good idea. We'll call over whatever Pikmin are left over. I will definitely get some of them balloons however we can, and then get them to work on this gold pile. Okay, lots of Pikmin very, very busy at the moment, but I will hop on top of Ochi. I will grab whatever Pikmin are available and we'll rush back over this way. I see this little group over here too. So let's see what we can do. I think for right now I will just toss a couple of them over here, hop off of Ochi, have Ochi deal with the banana. These guys are all bloomed and they can work on this. Very cool. Plenty more Pikmin to get to though, so let's just call them over in this direction, just like that. And was there anything else in that other part of the map? Not really at the moment. So we're just rushing over this way. We don't wanna get those guys out just yet, but what I think might be good is dealing with this over here. If I can do this, that should pop the ice. Whoa, they might have a bit of an issue with that, but eventually we get it figured out. Okay, very cool. So a couple more Pikmin over there. I know that there's another spot where the ship can land in this one, right? I think over there. Okay, so. A lot to do here, a whole lot to do, but I think for right now what we wanna figure out is just getting over this way and breaking that open. While that's happening, I want to, well, all the, the ice pigment. 
have to be working on that one. So, in the meantime, maybe a bunch of those guys over there. And that's sort of doing his thing. I'm throwing in a couple of punches too, which is great. Gathering Pikmin. Gonna charge at you over here, boom. And that seems like it's sort of kind of working, but I need to do a couple more chomps like this. Come on, ice wall is demolished. So once again, I'm just gonna call whatever idle Pikmin we can. Yep, so definitely all of you guys. I think this might be a good opportunity to free those <laughs> little yellow Pikmin. I wanna send Ochi and, actually, hold on, sorry. Uh, Ochi and then all of the yellow Pikmin that I have just to do that. They're gonna start bringing it over soon enough, but it's a big melon, it needs 100, so I think that's where Ochi works on that one. We send these seven over here. Oh, we actually, ooh, not quite what I needed there. I'm sorry, I'm making everything a, a mistake here. There, there. No, I don't want the ice Pikmin. Oh my gosh, it keeps doing that to me, and I really don't like it. Um, it was just kept switching it, like that. Not very courtesy, courteous of you. Okay, because I need the ice Pikmin here. Just like that, break these two. We are definitely losing some time here, but we'll move the base over onto this side, get whatever free Pikmin we have to work on this step. And then two more over that way, a little cluster of them over here should be able to get the job done. One, two more, one more on this side as well. Once again, calling over any free Pikmin that we have to work on all of this stuff. Okay, very, very nice. And then of course I see this whole group over here. I think I'm gonna mostly have yellow Pikmin and maybe Ochi work on that for now. We'll see if that's a good idea or not. What do I need for this side? I need 50 Pikmin, which I only have 35 in our arsenal at the moment. We could do more soon, but to do that, I just wanna focus on some other stuff first. So do that there, do that here. Once they carry that stuff out of there, we should be in a good spot. One, two, three, one, two. One, two, three. Okay. A lot still going on here for sure, but if I could just toss all that stuff over there, should be good. Okay, so a lot is going on there, and while they're digging this up, I don't think I really want them to bring it over from here. I'm just waiting for them to do all of this. So, yeah, we'll just grab whoever we can from who we called over. And then I think now with all that stuff cleared out, now is the best time to march over this way. That ice is gonna break soon, but we have quite a lot of Pikmin at our disposal. I might just want to yeah, not dilly dally too much, get all these guys to swim over. I'm a little bit worried about our yellow Pikmin. It looks like they stayed over there, that's good. I'm so happy that the, the blue Pikmin, or the ice Pikmin can, can swim. Okay, we have a lot of Pikmin here, and I just gotta throw them like crazy. We don't have any purple Pikmin with us, so this is really our best way to do this. And we're down to two minutes, which certainly has me a bit concerned, but if I pause the game again, I mean, we have a lot going on. The gold was cleared out over there. Go, go, go. So, definitely get as many as I can just to deal with this. And that should break it super quick. Excellent. What do we got going on around here then? Of course, I wanna have as many ice picked in as possible to deal with you. Um, yeah, Ochi can. Can I stop focusing on that? There we go. Ochi should be able to help out with this. So, maybe worth doing for now. I will send 20 ice Pikmin over this way. There we go. And oh, now we can get the purple Pikmin. I totally forgot about that. I guess there are purple Pikmin around here. With a minute and a half left, is it really worth focusing on too much? I don't know. Um, I'm just trying to beat this guy up, just like that. A bunch of ice Pikmin over here to get this job done. And then maybe just get those five there, get Ochi to help out with this. Really try to just break this up because we're almost done with it with a minute and 13 seconds left. I mean, we're getting there, we're definitely getting there. Ochi can deal with this one. I'll call any extra Pikmin over and then definitely Ice Pikmin can get to work with this. Very cool. And um, obviously there's still more on that side too. There's a lot everywhere. Um, one minute remaining. I just don't know if we'll quite be able to get everything done in time, but that's where I'm just really trying. Um, 10 Ice Pikmin. I might not even worry about the the purple Pikmin too much. We got the gold though, so anything we can do more than this is great, but not necessary. So I'll do that. Oh no, this thing's gonna unfree you soon. This thing's gonna unfree you soon. Um, no, 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 wait, come on, come on. Freeze the back up, freeze the back up. Uh, I don't think it's gonna work that way, is it? I don't know. Um, there we go, 30 seconds remaining. We'll see what we can do. Right now it's just gonna be calling everybody over here to see if they can't help with this. Come on, go, 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 go. Yep, Ochi included. 
17 seconds remaining. I just don't think it's in the cards to get this last thing. I'm certainly trying though, certainly trying. Okay, um, O2 would be the best bet, but ooh, not quite gonna happen. We did everything but that. That was definitely a lot better than my first attempt through this for sure. So with two seconds remaining, we got 331 points. That'll give us our gold medal and we can head out of here. All right, so at the hallway, going a little bit better than it has previously. We just didn't get that potato. Not too big of a deal. All right, great stuff overall for sure. Besting our previous high score by 110 points. That's another one. We can go to overtime? What is overtime? The results will not be saved, by, but you can continue practicing. Interesting, I like that idea, but for right now, we'll just head out. So what is our next thing to do? Um, it looks like down here we just have cliffhangers hold, then we'll have at least gold medals in everything for the Dandori challenges. Okay, so for this one, um, I guess I probably wanna get Ochi to help wherever I can for these kind of things. But in the meantime, there's a lot of these little enemies that the rock picking can get to. So let's keep the rock picking busy. There we go. Um, so yeah, I'll do a little bit of that here, there, and everywhere. It looks like the yellow Pikmin have gotten their job done with Ochi. And then really the only reason to do that would be just like a slightly faster traveling time here. So I'll definitely want to, boom, do a bit of that. And then chew away at these guys as much as we can. But before we get too carried away with that, let's just call over a bunch more Pikmin. Boom, tackle you again. And that should be the job finished. Send Ochi over here if possible. Come on, Pikmin. Um, there we go. Send them all over. Once again, just call whatever idol Pikmin, which is mostly a bunch of rocks. And definitely get five of them here, I suppose. I don't even know what we got from the other thing, but I guess maybe we should reorder this a little bit. I definitely want all my rock Pikmin over there. One, two. That is not where I want to send the yellow Pikmin. I want to send a couple of them over here. Couple them over here, and same thing with Ochi. Really get them to work on all of that. So maybe now with that, we can get the gold a little bit. I don't have too many other Pikmin around, or any Pikmin around, so might be a good time to get Ochi's attention, if not anything else. Yeah, a couple of Pikmin are gonna be working on that, a couple of them aren't, so I think it'll be a fair enough combo that we can start doing some other stuff. I do see this big guy, and he doesn't seem to be noticing us. He's taking a nap, so boom, hit him with everything we got and really just try to chomp him down. Uh, okay, could've been better, could've been worse. And there's a couple more Pikmin in there, don't he, my Pikmin? Get out of here with that. Okay, really, he got one there? This guy's not fun to deal with, so definitely just do what I can. A couple more chomps should do the trick, but I don't know if we'll actually get there. Come on, Ochi, help. Okay, toss over everything I can. This is getting a little silly, but there we go. We got it. How do I wanna do this? Ochi goes over there. I do need quite a lot of Pikmin for this, so I'll just send everything that I do have. And then just whoever I have idle, which really isn't any of them right now, so they're all gonna work on that. I have two Pikmin over there, and I'll be taking a look around to see if there's any other Pikmin to grab. It looks like we do have a little um, group of them right over here. We definitely need to get our points up as high as possible, so there's a lot to do in that regard. And ooh, we get the bomb over there. Interesting, do I get any other bombs? Um, pack, no, okay, so it's just that little group of them, which is fine. Ochi can once again get busy with some other stuff. I'll call some Pikmin over, and then I will at least, you know, defeat these guys. It might wake up the mama. Mama's not gonna be so happy about that one. So we run, run, run over this way, and I just do whatever I can to ooh, fight you, even if it means I throw some of these bomb rocks over. Wakey, wakey. Come on, come on, he's gonna be like, what? <laughs> there we go, and that's gonna be a quick, quick way to defeat them. That's fantastic, so I will pop out of here. And I guess I'll send Ochi through this way. I'll do one, two, three here, and then of course, actually, now that I'm thinking about this, let's do that all over. Go like that, one, two, three there, one, two, three here, and then we need a 10 for that. So instead, let's keep them busy with something like this. Switch over to Ochi while that is happening and see what we can do. It looks like for right now, I should probably bring some rock Pikmin up here. I do remember this being a whole mess. What is down this way? Is there a button to press or anything like that? Okay, yeah, I do remember now. So, ooh, maybe not the most synchronized way to deal with this, but if I could just, boom, go through like that, get back through this pipe for the time being, because I need to bring a couple of those Pikmin over. That's gonna be the best possible thing for us. So, electric gate demolished. I would like to call a few of them over. Everybody but you, I suppose. Are they gonna be able to go through? 
I mean, they're, okay. You know what, I am doing this wrong. So if I wanna do this the way I want to, instead of doing it like that, I need to throw them up here for OG. I totally forgot that's how it worked. Okay, come on, come on, switch back over while OG is recovering from all that. Of course, I do have a couple more Pikmin still working on that, but hopefully this is enough to you know get the job done. I'll call over whatever idle Pikmin there are, which there might not be too many more, and then go over here. And then call them over again soon. But hopefully that is enough just to get Ochi busy up. No, wait, not what I wanted. Whoops, okay, I see the issue of my ways here. Uh, do a bit of that, sure, why not? A few more might do the trick, and then maybe one, two, three, four there. Now I'll switch back over to Ochi. Now my Dandori skills aren't the best here, but maybe I can at least get a couple of things. I think that for right now, the most important thing to do is get this. Yeah, get five of them there, rush over this way, and then... Okay, why did you guys... <laughs> you guys just decided your own thing there. Whatever, I'll chomp a couple of times too. Not really what I wanted, but... Sometimes it's not always about that. There we go, so. What I want is Rock Pikmin over there. And then I guess if Ochi could just deal with this, that'd be great, but I don't know if it's quite gonna work that way. Okay, it will, cool. Um, the problem is, is that really what I should be up to right now or should I just wait for this? Let's switch back over to you here. Definitely grab this, ooh, that spicy nectar might be useful. Um, whatever idol Pikmin I can, need to go here, but We'll switch back over to Ochi. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, everybody. Get you two, and we'll do one, two, three, four, five, and then Ochi can just deal with, with this. While that's happening then, we switch back to our character, and we climb up this rope. Just up here like this, it seems like the plan for now, and then if I could get five of them there, and Couple more on this side. This is a lot more of a combination for success. I'm trying my best not to leave Pikmin standing idle. Easier said than done a lot of the time. But while that's happening, I'll switch over to Ochi, who has gotten that over there. That is fantastic. And now can maybe pick up this next enemy. There we go. Switch back to um, our friends here. And while a lot more of these Pikmin are climbing up, there really just aren't a lot of Pikmin to choose from, and we're still in the bronze. So like that's where I'm, I'm a little concerned about how this is going. It just doesn't seem like it's enough, but I mean, they're doing what they can. I guess some of the enemies are the Pikmin who are trying to bring it through that one way, which is a little questionable. Um, where did Ochi go? Ochi's just chilling out. I'd really prefer Ochi helping. Um, 30 seconds remaining now. The harmonica is almost here too. I don't think we can defeat this enemy in time, but if we're crafty enough about this, maybe I could just do something like that, switch over to my pack, and throw a bomb at you. There you go, hope you enjoy that. Please don't jump over here. Please, 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 oh my goodness, okay. None of that really did anything, but for a few seconds remaining, what more can we do? It looks like this is not gonna be a gold. How frustrating. After all that work, I'm still getting a bronze, so you know what, yeah, let's go ahead and restart this one <laughs> and see if I can't do a little bit better. So I'm really trying my best to Dandori my way through this. We got the rope down this way. I used the nectar, maybe not at the best time, but I can get that little bell over there. There's a lot more Pikmin heading over, and this is where I can tell Ochi to pick this one on. I think that's a good idea, or is it that one? What does this one require? That one requires seven as well, so sort of uh, the same each way. I will call a lot of those Pikmin over because they're just sort of chilling out on that side. They have a lot more work to do. There are a couple more Pikmin working on that gold pile too, but the farther off one, probably worth really delegating most of our effort into. So we have all these Pikmin over here. We're gonna do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, or no, no, seven, okay. And then a couple more Pikmin over there to work on that. It's not super crazy amazing, but with a minute and a half left over, maybe we can do something with it. Um, okay, and in the meantime, I don't know if there's really too much more for me to do. Um, definitely go hop on Ochi. Then I think these Pikmin are free, right? No, they're working on the gold. Um, here, whatever Pikmin, okay, I guess they're all super busy. Then I definitely just wanna send Ochi over this way to pick up the whistle. I don't think this monster's gonna notice us. Is there, oh, there's extra Pikmin over here, I didn't know that. Okay, that's good to know. You have good Dandori, that's great, but we're still only at bronze and we're trying to make it way to silver. Oh, there's so much, there's so much, but there's another gold pile over this way that I just really haven't touched on too much. 
pathing on that. It's very weird. They go sort of like the wide way over. Um, not much time left. I know, I know. Um, but we still have so much more left to do, it feels. I guess I really should try to fight this other enemy. But don't have too much backup for that one. So we need 240 to get to gold. Ooh, we'll just see if we can't do it with Ochi. Me and you against the world, buddy. I got a silver medal with 28 seconds remaining. I feel like even if we defeated this guy in time, it wouldn't be enough. That's just, man, it's so crazy difficult. Um, okay, they're still working on the gold piles. It seems at least some of them. Um, a pile of nuggets transported. I'll just go ahead and get, Ochi, wait, get over here. <laughs> Poor guy. Okay, yeah, get all these guys. Go like this with 12 seconds remaining. I don't think we're gonna be able to do it in time, unfortunately. I'm really, really trying now. Come on, come on. Ooh, run, don't get squished. Uh, it's still not enough. I don't know, I feel like my Tandori was actually not so bad in this one, and it was still just 13 short. How frustrating. Okay, so if they can just get those final two gold pieces over, there we go, we're able to do it. Oh man, even then, I still couldn't get around the defeating the big frog. I don't know, I just, I don't have those Dandori skills. And uh, you know, I'm not interested in obtaining them. I just wanna make it through the side missions. All right, there we go. So I was able to do it one way or another, but that should be the one side mission completed for getting gold medal for every single Dandori challenge. I guess we'll have to wait and see if that's the case or not. Man, super challenging. But yeah, as far as I can know, that's either a gold or platinum for every single Dandori challenge. If I back out now, we can go talk to that one person and maybe I'll get a side quest done. Marmori. We'll just meditate together again. All right, so if I talk to you now, your skill is improving. Well done. So get gold in all challenges. This is the result of all your effort and training. You should be proud of yourself. So now it says to get platinum. I think that's where I'm going to leave it though. I think gold is enough for me to feel accomplished. Yes, I could go and get platinum, but I don't feel like sacrificing hours of my life. Sorry. <laughs> Dandori battles are truly fascinating. After watching a few, I got totally hooked. Um, let's train for a battle then. Let's see what I still have to do here. I'm pretty sure there's only a few. One, two. Okay, see, so yeah, let's try trial run. This is my first ever Dandori battle. I'm pretty sure I can do better than bronze now that we know how to play the game a bit better. All right, so let's go for it. Since I know a little bit more how to do these than I did the first time I played, it should be better. Um, on top of that, of course, we still have um, an upgraded Ochi too. So there's a lot going for us here. I should be able to do that. And also our upgraded ability just to call the Pikmin straight away. There's a lot going for us here. So I think we'll be able to beat Olimar or I guess Leafling Olimar <laughs> very easily. Okay, calling over some more friends. It looks like they still need one more over there. Whoops. Uh, call over who we can. Help them out like that. One, two, three. And then I guess help you out a little bit. Hey buddy, what do you think you're doing? Call my Pikmin back, that's okay. Look at all these Pikmin. I know, quite a lot of them, isn't it? Okay, definitely get all those guys. Help them out with this big orange. It looks like we don't have any kind of double situation and it's such a small little area, it's crazy. Uh, grab all of that and then we'll definitely have to have Ochi help out soon, but I guess we'll just do this for the time being. And I don't know if I can, yeah, I don't have any spicy nectar at the moment. Where did Ochi go? There you are. So I definitely want to charge up and hit this wall for the big lime right there. Okay, and then I will get Ochi to just grab that one. Um, I have quite the battle happening over here. I think I could definitely do that. And then just take some more Pikmin, because why not? Oh, it looks like they want to work on that wall, which honestly, I'll let them. <laughs> let them do the heavy lifting with breaking the wall while I collect a bunch of other stuff. Feels like a fun plan. So also see a couple more over there. Things are only getting started. We'll see about that. A few more Pikmin and uh, let's see. Yeah, they're not really doing too much over here, that's just the enemies. So uh, I might as well do that, steal some of these golden ones. And just whatever idle Pikmin are over there. I don't think we even had that ability to call them over before. Now we do. So that makes an obvious big difference. And then whatever gold pieces you guys have, I'm just gonna try to take it from, they only have 11 points, we have almost 70 now, so we're doing quite a lot for sure. Okay, Ochi, let's go ahead and charge. Boom, get you like that, come on. Everybody beat up Moss. So sorry to do it to you, friend, but what we gotta do it is doing a lot of damage real quick. There we go, come on, just a little bit more. Maybe just one more chomp from Mochi, or not. Okay, cool, uh, it's fine. We just charge up, I hit you like that. And we'll do what we can, even if it's just Ochi doing that. One, two, three over there. 
A few more, but this way we still have a minute and a half to go. Whoa, I did not realize we had that much time available here. Well, okay, a lot of it's being respawned too, which is really, really useful. So I hop back on Ochi, we charge up our attack and get that big apple in just a moment. Um, Ochi over to that, a bunch of Pikmin over here, should be no problem. And don't forget all of these guys over this way. Yeah, if we could put a stop to it. Come on, come on, come on. There we go, there you go. I don't know if that'll actually get zipped up in time. I wanna get rid of Moss if we can. It'll buy us a lot of time, a lot of flexibility here, so. Okay, charge it up, charge it up. Boom, knock that over. I thought like that was still pretty good. Ochi can deal with that. We'll get a couple of you over here. Call more Pikmin over. We still haven't even gotten this golden thing, this golden pile, so definitely work on that with all of our extra Pikmin around here. Um, There we go, really excellent stuff to see. There we go. Everybody, just go, go, go. Awesome, I don't know if we can get any more than 50 Pikmin, if that's our maximum at the moment. I'm just trying to do everything I can with everything, really. There we go. I don't know if you, we don't have enough to quite fight off Moss there. Oh my goodness, we have so many Pikmin, so many Pikmin. Yeah, it looks like we can't do much more than five, or 50, so. There we go, so many points, over 150 more than Leafling Alamar, that's great. So it's definitely gonna be a platinum for us, not too surprising, you won! Very cool. So, you dominated by at least 100 points, giving us the platinum, and we're not gonna play again, instead we'll go back to the other Dandori challenge that we were still trying to do. Um, this one, the Leafy Showdown. All right, so with the Leafy Showdown, looks like we have a lot of the Rock Pikmin. I will do everything I can to just sort of up our Pikmin numbers. I will not be holding back me neither. So we just need the gold here to be sort of in the clear. Obviously if we can do beyond that, that would be a big deal too, but I don't know if that's quite what's gonna happen. Okay, over here then, I will send a whole batch of Pikmin over that way. A couple more of them are being bloomed at the moment, so that's some really good stuff. And I see that strawberry and stuff over that way. So what happened to Ochi? Oh, she's behind me. Um, I will have Ochi just go and grab this strawberry for now. Might be our best idea, and it looks like they're doing the same thing. Okay, and then, nice, they got this all figured out. So here's my chance to maybe go over here and try to fight you a little bit. Just like that, have them all attack the back of it. And that was actually really quick work, faster than I was expecting. So maybe I could do this, and actually, besides doing this, get them to do this instead. Okay. Come on, go, go, go. Our new bonus find is about to pop up. What is it gonna be? It looks like it's gonna be those enemies we just defeated one of. And, okay, yeah, right over here. So, if we could just do something like this, get Ochi to pick this up. Come on, Ochi, spit that out for a second. I don't even know what they spat out there. But we'll do that. I'll call the idle Pikmin over. I want to definitely get this, though. If it's just 10 of them, will it be 10? And then I'll rush over here, grab all these guys and fight you over in this direction because it looks like it's focused on something else at the moment. There we go, come on everybody, great work. All right, so once again, Ochi, you can grab it. Get a couple of rock Pikmin to work on that and I guess we'll get them to do the golden stuff. Come on, Ochi, why didn't you get it? <laughs> I'm a little confused. There you go, just gobble the whole thing. And once again, whatever idle Pikmin we have, it looks like a lot of rock Pikmin over here. And Boom, right over this way. Okay, go, go, go. Make whatever Pikmin we can out of all of that. We're doing great. Okay, here's a great time to hop on top of Ochi, I believe, so that we can charge you with everything I got. Boom! Come on, keep attacking. Chomp it up a little bit too. And I might just wanna leave it there for the time being. Here, we'll do something like that. And then definitely one there, one here, because I'm sure there's gonna be an extra amount soon. Okay, we can get an item over this way, so I might wanna sneak over and try that. Got it, what do we get, what do we get? We get um, a mine, which I will just toss over there, I suppose, and we can get another item. What's it gonna be? Boom, right there, that was pretty nice. Okay, this is where things get a little bit scary, but if I could just, I didn't really mean to do that, but it looks like we're getting buffed up here a little bit. Call some more Pikmin friends over wherever we can. It looks like, you know what, we need to help out with all this, huh? <laughs> Not 40 on one pellet, that's a little bit too much. Help out with that. 
Um, get one over there. This monster, oh no. Come on, get up, get up, get up, get up. The bonus find is changing to be an apple, which I think we just saw one before. I don't know what happened to Ochi. Ochi's over here. Hey, buddy. Um, Come on over. Let's do this weird little cloud. Three over there. If I could just hop on top of Ochi and then hop off and then have Ochi focus on this one. There we go, that might be our best bet. Get back over this way because we do have this thing we can focus on too. Got it. Um, Come on, everybody. Let's do what you can over here. They're really gonna get working on it. And of course they all walk directly in the water because why wouldn't they just walk off the other side? Who knows, it's a mystery. Um, so at least that's something I can grab you too. And what do you guys think you're doing over here, huh? Causing me problems. I don't appreciate it. All right, a sneak bomb has appeared, but where? Way up that way. No, that's the strawberries, okay. Um, I mean, I'll do what I can about strawberries, but where is the sneak bomb? It looks like um, Alomar is trying to grab it at the, the moment. I still don't know where it is. Sneak bomb approaching. Okay, it's over here. Come on, come on, come on. Ready? Hit it with everything I got. Boom. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm just gonna send Ochi and everybody else over to help it, and that should be enough, I would imagine. Um, while that's happening, there's still more friends I can grab here. You're pretty good at this thing. I'm trying my best. I'm glad you're recognizing that. Um, okay, let's just throw this then and see what that does for us. Did it work? No, okay, now it's working. Um, get a load of this. Ooh, nice, okay. Sneak bomb's approaching for you guys now, right? What are you gonna do about that? Don't think much. Okay, that sneak bomb is approaching over there, which will lower their score dramatically. Dramatically lower their score. And if we could steal some of those, that'd be great. But even now, we're just gonna be increasing our lead more and more and more. Okay, so I see this item over here. I'm gonna snag super duper quick. This whoever's over here too might be good. Even if it's just doing this for the time being. We'll spice everybody up as much as possible. I'm seeing more items hanging out everywhere. I need one more over this way. Spicing everybody up again. No, 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 come on guys. Over here, over here. Um, and now we got rocks we can throw at everybody. Definitely try to beat up these enemies. I don't know. Losing some Pikmin over there, not what I like to see. It is getting pretty messy pretty fast. There we go, there we go. I need Ochi just to grab one of these soon. I don't know which one, just any of them really. Okay, get up here, come on guys, go, go, go. I just need some more rock Pikmin to do their job up that way. And then um, one more there, should do the trick. Call over more of a rock Pikmin because we have so many more than what it seems here. And then, I don't know how much time we have left over, it looks like just a minute, so if I could do that, call these guys over. No, 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 OJ, you were doing great there, just keep that up. Ma seems to be having a moment of introspection. I'll leave them to it. What can we do around this way then? I see, one, two, three, I can grab another item. I can send this whole group over this way, I can throw that little bomb thing, that should get rid of the enemy straight away. There's just so much here and I'm trying to do it all. Whoa, all the, ex the extra Pikmin over here. I don't know if that's actually worth doing if we have 50 Pikmin. Um, or 258 points, so we could really, we're set up for a Platinum here. That's gonna be bonus. Whoa, the big golden pair sounds like a dream come true. I don't know if I have enough. It doesn't seem like I do. Sort of a shame. Um, okay, those are not my Pikmin, but I can grab this over here. And then, with only a few seconds remaining, unfortunately I won't be able to get it in time, but that's okay. I at least gave them a hard time with it all, and that's really, really cool. So, we definitely got another Platinum here, because we won by over 100 and almost 60 points there, 159, I think. Awesome, we win, and that'll be another Platinum ready for us. That's great. So you dominated by at least 100 points. We are not gonna play again. So that'll be at least a gold medal challenge completed. Yeah, we'd have to get three more Platinums if we wanted to do all that. Not interested right now, maybe one day, but don't get your hopes up. <laughs> I just don't feel like grinding for hours to improve my Dandori enough to get Platinum perfect and everything. Uh, that just, at some point, that sort of ruins the fun for me. I just sort of want to experience everything. But I think the gold is enough to be able to say that we did some major accomplishments. So, we'll be able to head back with that. Hey, you, I was impressed with your Dandori powers. I'm glad you were. So we can talk to you again? Interesting, interesting. Your Dandori skills are becoming second nature. So there we go, Dandori battle training number three. We get gold in all battles. 
But for the sake of it, I did check online, and as far as I can tell, for getting platinum and everything, all you get is more materials, which clearly I don't really need. So that's fine with me that we're not getting those done. Um, if we take a look at the side missions, at this point it's just those and then the repeatable missions that we can do over and over again forever. So you know what, I think we're pretty much good with that, which means we still have a few more things to do, but they are a lot more relaxed. The things I wanna do now, of course, is just gonna be going through the Picklepedia entries as well as the treasure catalog. So this part might be either really interesting or not so interesting depending on what you're interested in, but with the Picklepedia, there are entries by both Alamar and Louis for basically every single enemy we've run into. And a lot of you said you wanted me to read through them, so I figure now's the chance to do that. We have a completed Picklepedia entry, which like I said before, includes every single enemy we've run into in the adventure, as well as our friends too, different Pikmin and such. So yeah, we'll be reading through this. So hopefully you, you, you brought a snack. Uh, so we'll just start with the first one here, number one out of 125, the Dwarf Bulborb. With this one, the science name, it's interesting that we also get like all these fancy little like notes like that. And we can see some deeper things, but I mostly just want to, whoa, look at this. You can even go into like a fancy little examining mode. And you can see, <laughs> you can beat them up. You can throw stuff at them. <laughs> this is so silly. Whoa, and they could pause it the moment before disaster. <laughs> I love that. Um, so that's how you engage with them. But there are also notes by, okay, Dalmo, Alamar, and Louis. So three notes for every single creature. Let's start with the dwarf bulborb. A miniature reflection of a mature bulborb. When you see this little mimic stomping around on its stubby legs, you'll fall in love with the remarkably clever beastie. Such a skilled tiny trickster can mislead anyone. It's born to be adored. Then Alamar says, although I initially identified as a juvenile bulborb, groundbreaking new research indicates that this creature is in fact a member of the breadbug family. A close relative of breadbug, it escapes predation through mimicry. And then Louis, for a blissful bisque, mince the entire beast finely and stir it with heavy cream, artichoke hearts, and a pinch of black pepper. <laughs> Heat slowly until piping hot. Mm, rich and creamy. So is Louie just going to tell us how to cook each enemy? Oh my gosh. So next up, of course, we have the albino dwarf bulborb. And the same thing, we can see the different details for it, but I guess I'll mostly stay in the notes section um, and start with Thalmo again. So this is the, like you can see the scientific name here. The family is Grub Dog, which is interesting. Uh, active during the night. Among all the naturally charming dwarf bulborbs, this one might be the most attractive and well-balanced confirmation. When night falls, the eyes of these fascinating creatures emit an intense glow. Whether to mesmerize prey or help it spot others of its kind, it's an intriguing adaptation. I could stare into those shining eyes forever. Oh my. And then what does uh, Alamar say? A bulborb lar larva after its first molt. Due to its pale coloration, it was assumed to be a mimic when it was first discovered. It was later confirmed to be a true dwarf bulborb. To avoid predation from adult bulborbs, it spends the majority of its, the daytime hours hiding in the ground. It becomes more active at night when its paler coloration is more difficult to see. And then finally, Louis. Peel off the skin starting at the tail end, then slice thinly, and boil in a spot of heavy salted water. Serve immediately. Oh my gosh. And then the full grown bulborb. It has wide googly eyes and on protruding stalks, a mouth meant to swallow prey in one large gulp, and powerful red and white polka dotted hindquarters. It's fierce, and yet it's somehow quite endearing. Be wary of getting lured in by its disarming mane. A lar this large organism has the familiar mandibles and cranial morphology of the grub dog family, as well as the characteristic bul bulging eyes. As with most grub dogs, this creature's cranium comprises half of its total length and girth. Interesting. Showing a scarlet abdomen, the white spots this creature primarily is nocturnal, choosing to prey upon smaller creatures returning to their nests. Originally classified as the spotty bulborb, further research has reclassified the species as the basic bulborb. So subspecies of varied colors have recently been discovered, but Academics are divided into two rival camps over how to handle their classification. <laughs> so much detail from Alamar. Plump specimens are best spit roasted whole, stuffed with a lime and a slab of bacon, based basque frequently to ensure a magnificently moist haunch. <laughs> and now the jumbo bulborb. 
Jumbo, that word sets an image in your mind. Being larger than the others of its species means its heart is proportionally bigger too, so its devotion to its family grows. When it savagely bites, it's only doing so to protect those it cares about. The most loving critters can sometimes also be the fiercest. It's a large creature, but the meat is tender and flavorful. It's impossible to eat in one sitting, so store some portions for later. Coat the fattier meat in cooking oil and freeze. Leaner cut should be smoked. Gotcha. Okay, so what do we have next over here? The dwarf orange bulborb, wrong button. Uh, dwarf orange bulborb, an imposter posing as the offspring for an orange bulborb. It resembles the orange, orange bulborb in every way, not just in the obvious shape, but even to its sharp senses, alert to each sound and movement in its vicinity. What a lovable little impersonator. Just as dwarf red bulborbs mimic the appearance of the bulborb, it was theorized that a variant mimicking the orange bulborb must also exist. Recent fieldwork has confirmed this theory. Although difficult to prepare, this exquisite creature is more than worth the effort. Great in fajitas. <laughs> All right, the orange bulborb, the full size. If you approach it whilst it's sleeping, it will immediately wake up, leap to its feet, and peer around nervously. With such finely tuned senses, it's no wonder this bulborb can get a bit sleep deprived, though its big bloodshot eyes look surprisingly cute. This bulborb species beasts a garish color pattern with a deep orange body and black spots. The orange bulborb's yellow bloodshot eyes make it clear that this bulborb is excessively edgy and high strung, making it much easier to wake from deep sleep than other species of, in the grub dog family. This bulborb's meaty flanks make for deliciously savory steaks that shouldn't be missed. All right, now the dwarf bull bear, a little bit different. This little darling is always with its beloved mother, but when it grows up, she'll drive it away. Though it may seem cruel, she helps it develop the confidence to survive on its own by forcing it to fend for itself. Such practical creatures could teach us a lot about learning to get by in the world. A spotty bull bear larva in its third stage of development this creature's body structure is nearing maturation. However, unlike mature bull bears, it has yet to claim its own patrol route, and thus it is dependent upon its parent for gu guarding direction. Removing, remove innards, stuff with sage, and finally age prosciutto, and broil it until golden brown, the ultimate crowd pleaser. <laughs> All right, we got this spotty, the full grown spotty bull bear. One glance and you'll never forget them as long as you live. Those unmistakable bold lifts, a most distinctive feature that the likes of which I've seen nowhere else in the universe. When I gaze upon them, I wonder if the lifts serve duty, uh, so double duty as a way to fee feel the world around it. Since this cute little cuddler has no fingers, I suppose so. A mid-sized subspecies within the grub dog family, the spotty bull bear's unique feeding habits set it apart from other grub dogs. It patrols a set path, searching for prey instead of passively feeding on creatures that wander into a limited territorial range. When entering spotty bull bear habitat, it is wise to proceed with extreme caution until bull bear's patrol path can be clearly identified. For an unrivaled green curry, peel away the spotty bull bear's skin, pulverize juicy innards, and stew into cu until curiously fragrant. And then the dwarf frosty bull borb. The ice crystals on its back are finely detailed and delightfully iridescent. As a juvenile of the species, it sometimes overproduces that sparkling layer of crystals. One of its parents will then snap, will, will then snap and crack away at the ice so it doesn't weigh a little, the little one down. My heart melts when I see such loving family dynamics out in the wild. Much like more mature specimens, the juvenile frosty bulborb is able to create a carry ice on and carry ice on an epidermis that promotes extracellular freezing. However, they take an entire night to regenerate their ice, which is why they're often accompanied by adults. Juveniles display a smaller number, number of spots than the adults, causing some to believe that this was actually a species of mimicking breadbug. However, the results of further analysis proved this was not the case. A sweet and savory meat that pairs well with a simple green salad. <laughs> I love how little Louis has to say at times. And then the Frosty Bulborb, a creature that thrives in the coldest climates, its ice-coated haunches shimmer like a living jewel in the frigid air. You can admire the way it sparkles to your heart's content, but don't get too close. You'll get frosty frozen on the spot if you touch it. A Bulborb with large amounts of ice and frost covering its midsection. 
It's unusual to find ice such as this attached to a living organism, as it's cold enough to freeze small animals and regenerates any ice mass that gets broken off. This bulb orb species' is in intercellular stores of sugars, amino acids, and organic acids prove it uh, provide it with a plant-like resistance to freezing, making it possible for the bulb orbs to touch the ice without freezing itself. Sear the rich and fatty meat on both sides in a dab of butter, then sprinkle generously with fresh thyme. For those who prefer leaner cuts, I recommend the tip of the nose. So intense. Fiery bowl, bowl blacks, a little bit different, sort of the opposite. When I see this blazing BC, I get a rush of excitement. It's easy to lose track of time while staring fixated at that flame and shrouded form of the bo fiery bowl blacks. Its appearance brings mind ancient molten landscapes from an era before our earliest ancestors. Bodily excretions of a highly flammable waxy substance interact with the cell structure of this grub dog skin, causing a chemical reaction that produces extremely high temperatures. And then Louis, no stove, no problem. This sizzling beast practically cooks itself. Remember to thoroughly extinguish the steaks, the steaks prior to eating. And then the whip tongue bulb orb. Its narrow snout houses an amazing prehensile tongue. It sets its sights and slurps its target right up. The sweet little bean uses this marvel of evolution with great skill. Any creature with a dexterous tongue like that is unlikely to ever go hungry. Instead of the gnashing jaw jaws usually found in related species, it uses its extensible, vicious tongue to capture prey. Even before it opens its mouth, it's recognizable by its tapered snout and black spots against its white back. Some of the theorized that some theorize that it evolved its long tongue to snatch prey drawn to high blooming flowers. But a recent finding confirmed that until its second molt, this creature feeds with its teeth much like other grub dog species. It will begin to use its tongue once it reaches adulthood. Pat the tongue dry, then coat all sides with a spicy dry rub of your choice. Grill over high heat until the outside is perfectly crisped. Okay, Bulborb la larva, a toddling infant that anyone would love. With the body and delicate skin of a newborn, this cute little button is sensitive to all stimuli. Whatever you do around it must be done slowly, gently, and quietly. As adorable as this baby is, you might be tempted to embrace it, but don't. You could squish the fragile darling. <laughs> As its name implies, this creature is a bulb orb and in an early stage of development. Its distinct bulb orb coloration has yet to appear, but it already exhibits other uniquely bulb orb characteristics. It is capable of hunting nourishment independently without the help of its parents. This meager creature offers little meat, but its eyeballs are a local delicacy. Try them with okra and a dollop of sour cream. <laughs> I just love how we have sort of the very warm descriptions of Dama, the very cold and analytical of Alamar, and the very just hungry observations of Louis. Uh, we got the Empress Bull Blacks here. Whoa! The striking polka dots along that expansive hide provide the very image of royal splendor. While that regal presence essential for queenly quality might throw you off your guard, here her grand, lumpy figure has more than just visual impact. When provoked, this charmer will roly poly over and squash any threats. Approach with the utmost caution. Initial observations place doubt on the capability of the grub dog family to support a strong ant or bee-like social structure, but recent studies show that the family is capable of such complexity for brief periods when certain external parameters are met. The egg sac of the largest female grub dog within a given range swells to dramatic proportions in response to environmental changes, such as the sudden depletion of prey species. These females temporarily take on the role of pack matriarch. Also, in pack formation, it has been observed that nearly all males not involved in species reproduction undergo natural changes. The characteristics of such specimens are quite intrigued indeed. Or intriguing. Interesting. For a sophisticated delicacy, make a pâté de foie gras, I think I said that right, from this massively obese creature's liver and spread it over a sesame cracker. Interesting. All right, well, we're still, you know, pretty pretty far into this. We still have so much more to read. Oh my goodness. Okay, let's keep going then. We have the Emperor Bull Blacks here. Uh, read the notes. It has broad moss-covered flanks and a, and a head like a desert, complete with big drooping jowls and small googly eyes. This creature appears to be quite moody, but it does have a cooperative streak. The way this temperamental bulbous giant cohabitates with others of its kind is quite surprising. 
The largest member of the grub dog family is normally found burrowed underground. This camouflage allows the predator to surprise smaller creatures and use its long adhesive tongue to capture prey. The thick hide and angular hump give this orga the organism a distinctive rock-like quality. During the rainy season, moss grows freely on its hump, making it nearly impossible to distinguish this lethal pre predator from a stone. To prep the tongue for cooking, marinate in olive oil and chop into cubes. Stir in a pot with carrots, potatoes, and chives. Cover and simmer over low heat for several hours, accompanying this mouth-watering rustic stew with a hearty roll. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, going for this next one then, the so Sovereign Bull Blacks. That, okay, well, I don't want to fight it right now. What did I do? <laughs> Whoops. Uh, I didn't know that we could actually fight it. That's pretty crazy. Um... So yeah, I guess we could refight any of these if we wanted to. Not interested right now. The value a living creature has within its ecosystem has no relation at all to how big or small it is. That being said, this massive mountain of a critter is truly majestic. Not only does it have a, the courage and means to lay waste to any opponent, it also has a roar that can make the boldest traveler start to tremble in their spacesuit. Number bull blacks of extremely advanced age. It will no longer display the pack behavior commonly exhibited by younger members of its species. Instead, as an individual ages, it leaves the herd and exhibits more solitary behaviors. It feeds by using its strongly developed legs to leap upon and crush its prey with speed disproportionate to its massive body. To determine the age of any given specimen, you can count the rings of, of hide calcified in the form of a carapace. One ring forms roughly every year the creature lives. Individuals with, with over a hundred age rings have been discovered so far. The Sovereign Bull Blacks' back is often covered in moss and pteridophytes? pteridophytes? On a few occasions, specimens have been found with a rare species of mushroom, called the Bulbarel, growing on its back. Interesting. For a light appetizer, pluck the ferns off the back of and lightly cook to remove an any astringent flavor. The tongue, eyes, lips, meat, and fat are all very tasty and can be prepared in a variety of ways. Mature specimens have more a more highly developed umami flavor. I feel like Louis can make a lot of money just writing a uh, a recipe book. We got the fiery blowhog. You'll recognize it by its plump, bottle-shaped torso and round, bright red mouth. Have you ever seen such an adorable creature? But no matter how cute it seems, when observing the species, you had best remain behind it. Otherwise, you could end up in its path when it spits out, uh, spits a gout of flame and get cooked right up. This creature expels a volatile phosphorus compound from its snout that can bust upon contact with air. This fire-breathing ability is dependent upon the air-to-fuel ratio at its mouth, catalyst, reaction with the expelled compound, and purification of the compound. Thus, it is highly unlikely as such a complex process could cause the spontaneous explosion of a fallen blowhog. This process is also perhaps to avoid risk of spontaneous combustion in the belly of a live specimen. However, one should still treat a fiery blowhog with great care during transfer. Roast this flavorful beast for several hours, letting it stew in its own succulent juices. Don't worry about overcooking this beast, it's scorch proof. <laughs> Alright, the watery blowhog. Though it looks a lot like its flame spewing counterpart, remember that blue around the, the mouth is for water and red is for fire. Keep that in mind and you can avoid being unpleasantly surprised. A watery blowhog shower to wash away all your dirt and woes at the end of the day doesn't sound so bad. A variant subspecies of the fiery blowhog, the watery blowhog lacks several of the genes necessary for the production of fire-producing catalysts and thus expels jets of the non-flammable liquid. This subspecies appears to have only recently evolved. However, the hereditary traits of this variant are dominant and highly robust, so its population is rapidly increasing. This beast's unrivaled moistness gives it an, 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 a melt-in-the-mouth quality that's incomparable. And now the newest one, the snowy blowhog. What's that? You think the different types of blowhog all look the same? You need to look a bit closer. For example, this little fellow has light yellow eyes and an aquamarine body with turquoise lips and blue nails. It all comes together to create a unique appearance designed to give anyone the chills. This species has the ability to condense atmospheric carbon dioxide within an organ called a cold sac. The cold sac creates dry ice, and its vapors are then expelled as icy breath. 
A close relative to this species, the fiery blowhawk, it can keep its internal body temperature from rising because of the phosphoric compounds it expels only ignite when they make contact with the air. In contrast, the snowy blowhog maintains internal body conditions below freezing, and its other internal organs are protected by thick layers of fat and the extracellular freezing that occurs within its cold sac. Sprinkle lightly with salt and eat while the ice bag is still fresh and crunchy. Just one bite will give you the most satisfying brain freeze. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard anyone describe a brain freeze as satisfying. The Titan Blowhog, whoa. I don't even remember this one too much. Massive gouts of flame blow out from that gigantic body with astonishing force, enough to make you think of a volcanic eruption. This critter exhibits the power of nature's fury. One can be truly overwhelmed by the sight of the Titan Blowhog's raging torrents of fire. Due to a hormone ab abnormality, this fiery blowhog specimen has grown to an irregular giant, irregularly giant size. As a result, its mouth and the organs that regulate its fire-breathing abilities are significantly larger, so the firepower of this specimen greatly exceeds that of its normal counterpart. The fire it produces is actually so strong that the stress it places on the creature's internal organs is magnified, thus reducing its overall lifespan. This specimen is also unable to reproduce creature too large to easily carve. Bigger is not better in this case. <laughs> Interesting, is this the only thing that, that Louie cannot eat? <laughs> I don't know. Blizzarding Blowhog. This creature blows out an unending gale of freezing blizzard-like winds. Talk about lung capacity. With this hulking darling around, we could cool down those hot summer days in an instant. Although it does exhale, exhale carbonic acid. Maybe that's not such a good idea after all. This specimen is actually a snowy blowhog, that lethal expeller of icy air. However, it's grown to a gigantic size thanks to an endocrine abnormality. Unlike the Titan blowhog, this condition does not sentence the blizzarding blowhog with a shorter lifespan. In fact, its lifespan is actually much longer than that of the average snowy blowhog. The organs that produce the dry ice are also enlarged in this specimen, perhaps in order to make the production more efficient. Scrape the interior of its elongated nose with a spoon for a quick dessert and of meaty shaved ice. Add a drizzle of sashimi grade soy sauce to take it up a notch. <laughs> now we have the Tusked Blowhog. Setting its unwavering sights on its target, it makes a ferocious mad dash at full speed. Even if you hit it really hard, you won't slow down this bold beastie. It single-mindedly carries through its actions with an unwavering focus that inspires me to improve my focus on my own tasks. Similar to an ancestor species of the fiery blowhog, this creature has a pair of sharp tusks that it uses to charge enemies with vigorous violence. It demonstrates its aggressive nature when it pursues its prey and when it's attacked by a predator of its own. In the case of the latter, the tusked blowhog will attack its attacker, causing them to balk while it can dash away to safety. This species also has an extremely sharp sense of smell, which it uses to detect the pheromone-like scent of its favorite food, underground mushrooms. Stew it with root veggies, wild greens, and a bit of miso for a mouth-watering and rustic flavor. Drain all the blood beforehand to avoid that gamey smell. Or gami? I think gami smell? Not quite sure. All right, armored cannon larva. Uh, oh, there it is. This little creature will spew a giant stone ball with w what some call an Adama when it feels threatened. A reliable cultural document assures me similar items have used were used as weapons in ancient wars. Maybe this creature is using it in the same way to fight the war for its survival. This specimen is a lithopod larva. Lithopods, like flint beetles, use internal metabacteria to aid chemical digestion. These metabacteria can only survive in certain environments, such as within the body of a certain insects. So, lithopod larvae do not contain any metabacteria immediately after hatching. Larvae feed on partially digested ore regurgitated by mature lithopods, ensuring the larvae obtain metabacteria they would not normally have acquired. Carefully remove every grain of sand, peel back the exoskeleton, and slurp heartily. Deep or deep fry it too. Gotcha. Horn Cannon Beetle, whoa. Its giant shiny black carapace is one of the precious stones of the natural world. When it lifts its ebony wings, the briefly visible flesh beneath creates a striking color contrast. This is a living work of art that transcends the imagination. Males of the species are known for their horn-like blowholes. When females reach maturity, their blowhole closes and they lose the ability to launch rocks. 
At the start of the breeding season, the females lay eggs on rocks launched by a male. The rocks then become food for the growing larva. Though once mistaken for adult armored cannon beetles, this species is actually a naturalized non-native species that migrated here from another continent. The horned cannon beetle can breed with adult armored cannon beetles, but only about half of the eggs will actually hatch. This hybrid species has the potential to seriously pollute the gene pool. Furthermore, it exhibits aggressive territorial behavior, sometimes launching boulders at young armored cannon beetles, which has driven the latter species to the verge of extinction. A lot of drama with this one. Drop into boiling water and let it cook until the shell turns red. Remove from the pot and peel, sprinkle the drained meat with rock salt. All right, well, this is the Arctic cannon larva. Whether or not there is snow on the ground, when this surprising sweetie comes around, you can have snowball fight anytime. But don't expect it to go easy on you. You're in for a one-sided defensive battle, and you might end up looking like a snowman by the end. Like other members of the lithopod family, its internal bacteria are specialized to form ice compounds from ambient moisture, which it then expels as projectiles. It technically doesn't rely on cold temperatures to create this ice, which is formed by pressurized internal fluids that act as a coolant. When the projectiles rapidly expand, they absorb ambient meat, lowering their air temperature enough for the moisture in the air to freeze. Peel back the shell and sprinkle the tender meat with a dish or a dash of salt before slurping it up raw. For a refreshing dessert, pour fruit juice over the snowballs. <laughs> Interesting. Next up, the Arctic Cannon Beetle. Whoa, I barely remember this enemy too. A beautiful armored bug that sparkles like a diamond. The sight of it's busily tromping along, the way it sucks in air and spews out snowballs, everything about it is remarkable. While standing transfixed by its stunning appearance, you'll end up covered in snow for sure. Upon reaching maturity, the blowhole on its head closes, leaving in its space the pointed crest of the Arctic cannon beetle's shell. In order to get enough food in, in nutrient-deficient environments, adult specimens start breathing through their mouths. Some experts have put, posited that this adaptation caused the species to lose territorial competitions with the armored cannon larva, driving it into colder environments. Though this beetle has increased suction strength, it must ventilate via a spiracle on its abdomen and open its shell to avoid rapid body inflation. Boil the meaty eggs until fully cooked, then drizzle with a generous amount of lemon juice. Once the juice has seeped its way into the muscle fibers, suck the meat out of the shell with one big slurp. All right, I might stop doing the voices as much because it is getting a little tiresome to do them, just because it's a little bit more strain, I guess, on my voice. But uh, we got the female shear grub. This little one's primary food, food source is secretions from am, ambulo, ambulo rad, radices. Radices? I've definitely not heard this word. Interesting. Ambulo radices like pigment. To fill the bellies of so many shear grubs, there must be a healthy population of ambulo, ambulo creatures in this world. It's through shear grubs like this that we get a glimpse of the hidden secrets of the planet. Very interesting, I've never heard that word before. The males of this species are purple and black creatures with tapered mouths, while the females are lighter in color and lack an armored exoskeleton. As with most mandiblards, these creatures have regressed to the point where they have lost both legs and wings. They can be seen crawling around on the ground and are believed to feed on the vegetable extracts from the congealed fluids of expired pigment. Whoa. For an unforgettable quiche, slice this creature up and mix with four eggs, two vine-ripened tomatoes and di diced zucchini and generous handfuls of feta and Swiss. Bake until crusty and golden, this beast is most flavorful if caught and cooked after laying its eggs. Now we have the male shear grub, which these guys don't even pop up for very long before they just dig back in and then this doesn't show anything. With its powerful jaws, the male shear grub can secure more food than the female, but it doesn't keep it all for itself. Right now, in the ground under our feet, mated shear grub pairs are shearing with food or sharing food with each other. What a generous snuggly grub. This specimen is a male shear grub. Having lost both legs and wings, the male burrows into the soil and waits to ambush small creatures that pass by. This beast's mandibles can be dangerous, making creatures such as Pikmin easy prey. Spread several specimens in the bottom of a casserole dish, layer with sliced avocado, and top with cheese. Bake until the meat is cooked through and the cheese is lusciously browned. 
Now we got the Mama Sheargrub, which we've seen a couple times. It's huge. Since it's exceptionally large, when it squirms to move or wriggles minutely side to side to dig its whole body into the ground like a drill, you can observe it in all its exceptional detail. The way it moves is quite enchanting to watch. If only we could super duper size all creatures like this. The Mama Shear Grub will typically molt when it reaches maturity, then dig itself into the ground to prepare for egg laying. However, certain types like this specimen exhibit neoteny and retain the appearance of a juvenile of the species. If this species locates an abundant food source, they won't leave it. Sometimes they will stay at that spot for years, steadily growing to gigantic proportions, like this one. Though this specimen has the look of a juvenile, it has fully developed reproductive, reproductive abilities and can achieve um, impressively high birth rates. Its offspring, however, are the same size as a typical shear grub. Best enjoyed when, when big and round and full of eggs. Salt lightly, then grill. The squishy, sticky mouthfeel will have you coming back for more, if you say so. Now we have the Shearwig. It may be small, but it's full of vim and vigor. It hovers in midair, then zips straight to its target. And once it is prey in its jaws, it locks on tight and won't let go. The Shearwig, a cunning and fierce survivor, has a death grip on my heart and soul. Unusual for their ge genus, flying mandibles have retained their wings. However, only adult the adult male species can fly. Females of this species spend most of their lifespan underground. They do emerge for a period after maturation to spawn, but they never metamorphose. Create this beast into a zest and whisk with sugar, cream, and chopped dark chocolate for a lusciously indulgent mousse that's a true culinary coup de gras. <laughs> we got the sheer flea. If you find any of these busy little bouncers happily hopping around, try jumping in with them. If you do, they may just come to you for cuddles. They're such sweet little love bugs. I don't know if that's really the case. The sensory hairs growing on this creature's orange body segments can detect body temperatures, movement, and carbon dioxide levels. It clings to its prey with its claw-like front legs and sucks their blood through its pointed pro proboscis. Research has found that the shear flea can store energy created while contracting its bellows like body in the elastic proteins located at the roots of its hind legs, allowing it to repeatedly jump very high. Its reproductive rates are rather explosive. A small group of egg-laying females can boom into a population of over a hundred in a month's time. Salty, sour, and sometimes sweet, the flavor changes depending on which living creature it's fed from most recently. Now the joust mite. The eyeball-like pattern on its shell reminds me of my father's eyes, staring at me we bur after we buried him in sand at the beach. Oh my gosh. We dug him out immediately when he gave us that look. Makes it easy to imagine what an effective deterrent those staring eyes must be to natural predators like birds. Others within the family wear their shells on their bellies. But this one's shell, this one's shell functions more like a helmet. Its wings have atrophied into uselessness, so instead it burrows beneath the ground and pops to out to only to pierce prey with its needle like proboscis and drain their bodily fluids. Larval joust mites remain underground for many years or even decades in some cases. Boil the shell with a pinch of salt until bright red, then serve piping hot with tartar sauce. Flighty joust mite. With a countenance like a little helmet wearing soldier, it zips up to set its sights from the sky, then strikes its target. This captivating creature is truly a pro. It's unfortunate that when it flies up in the air, you can't see the clever false eyes on its shell or its charming face anymore. It's a close relative to the original Baronet species, but this variety of joust mite still has the use of its wings. Oddly, it still makes its habitat below ground and employs the same tactic of lying in wait before emerging the strike. The helmet protecting its head is functionally as hard as steel due to the waxy secretions in its pores that absorb and redirect any shocks it sustains. Remove shell, roast over a low flame, then grind meat. Whisk a paste into olive oil until emulsified. An extra dash of cumin lends some earthiness to this spicy salad dressing. Now we have the swooping snitch bug. If you were swept up and then tossed away by those long dangling arms, I think you'd better understand what it feels like to be a Pikmin. A little courage is all you need to give it a try. Consider it a learning experience. The Sacropanids originally lived on the ground, sporting poorly developed vestigial wings. 
This species developed in large antenna that can be used as makeshift wings. Oh, I see that now. I never even really noticed that. Scar pannons are attracted by the sight of large groups of Pikmin in cavalry formation that will swoop down and seize them. However, scar pannons do not eat Pikmin, and they will drop any seized Pikmin off after a short time. The reason for this behavior is unknown, but I look forward to the future research in the area. Remove the wings, marinate a well-marbled steak for, a, for several hours in a chipotle marinade, then charbroil to perfection. Okay, next up we have the skitter leaf. Uh, in both its vibrant spring color and the precise shape, this cunning crawler looks just like a leaf. It's the perfect camouflage. It only becomes an issue when the sometimes careless critter forgets to look for a hiding place with an abundance of other green leaves lying around. Then it becomes quite easy to spot. The skitter leaf is a relative of the pond skitter that shed its wings and adapted to life on the ground. With no residual traits of its airborne past, the skitter leaf can neither fly nor skid across the surface of the water. The wings have since evolved into a leaf-like structure on its back, which serves to hide the skitter leaf through mimicry. It appears quite effective as few predators can see through this clever disguise. The superb amalgamation of juicy meat and leafy greens ensures that the skitter leaf will be the new spinach. Wow, pretty lofty claim. Des desiccated, or yeah, desiccated uh, skitter leaf. This one is a master disguise, provided the season is right. As a as a fun little game, try collecting a bunch of dried leaves, then shuffle Mr. Desiccated Skitter Leaf in with them. If you pick the, out the normal leaf, you lose, but if you pick out the clever critter, you win big. Feeling lucky? Not quite. Uh, the skitterling variant that resembles dead leaves, its legs have developed in specific ways. The front claws capture prey, while the hind legs are suited for running and swimming. Its highly tuned senses keep it still for any creature but Pikmin. Once it gets its claws on its prey, it doesn't easily let go. Recent research, research has revealed that its camouflage has a second purpose beyond hunting. Scavengers are fooled by its disguise into carrying its eggs, thereby expanding the population. No preparation needed to enjoy this flavorful beast. Its natural crunch gives way to an intriguing mouthfeel. <laughs> gotcha. Now we have the fiery dweevil. That perfectly polished crimson color like something had finished by a true master craftsman is a feast for the eyes. This brilliant color is actually made, of, made through layer upon layer of very fine fibers being stacked together. Nah, nature is the most skilled crafter. Members of the Dweevil family are known for carrying objects of astounding size on their backs, then mimicking them. The fiery Dweevil is one species in this family. Generally, this is a very gentle insect that feeds on grass nectars, but when faced with danger, the fiery Dweevil ignites flammable internal gases, just out its jaw and spews scorching or juts out its jaw and spews scorching flames. As this clearly makes it a rather dangerous insect, it is best not to linger directly in front of it. The search for a gourmet high protein salad topping alternative to bacon bits is over. Grind this spicy dweevil into tasty micro chunks, then toss them generously over your salad to add instant flair and flavor. Amazing. Anode dweevil, we don't wake up Every day feeling as good as we want to, but the bright fruity color of this little charmer sure makes me feel like I got my vitamins for the day. You might be able to loosen up your stiff muscles with this Dweevil's therapeutic electric shocks too. Members of the Dweevil family are known for carrying objects of astounding size on their backs and mimicking them. The Anno Dweevil is one species in this family. They may seem to have no particular preference for which objects they carry on their backs as they will carry anything they can lift. They boast an internal organ that generates electrical charges, which the Anno Dweevil releases when it senses danger. Raw Anno Dweevil makes for an unforgettable sushi treat, but if it is not prepared by an expert hand with exacting precision, consumption could result in a jolting electrical explosion of apocalyptic proportion. I guess that means that Louise may be quite the expert chef. Hydro Dweevil. It's bewitching to behold the way it skitter skitters around on those long, slender, lapis lazuli blue legs while carrying treasure on its back. If, in an excess of excitement, you reach out and hand a hand to touch it, a startling splash should deter you. Be calm and quiet around this beastie. 
The hydrodweevil is one member of an insect family known for mimicking objects by carrying them on their backs. Several points of differentiation with other members of the species have been confirmed, such as body color and behavioral patterns, but none of these suggest major deviations in the creature's genetic structure. This makes it clear that it is a relative of the family. When attacked by enemies, the hydrodweevil spits out bodily fluids in response. Spacesuits corrode and oxidize when they come in contact with this liquid. Inedible. Effects of consumption include uncontrollable arm flailing and enthusiastic dishwashing. <laughs> Actually running into something inedible is so surprising for Louis. Now we have the ice blend weevil. Achoo! It's always important to keep your cool, but my proximity to this frosty darling may be making me a bit too cold. Just one blow from this critter as it skitters about on its icy long legs is quite chilling indeed. Weevils have varying body colors in response to their feeding habits. Each species feeds on different types of plants and small animals, so the symbiotic bacteria that creates their pigmentation differ as well. The ice blend weevil lives in cold habitats and spews frigid gas, so the workings of its symbi symbi symbiotic bacteria are dulled and it retains its natural color, which is white. It's been confirmed that in more temperature climates where food that the fire dweevil eats is readily available, the ice blend dweevil's coloration is much peachier. Interesting. Soak the legs in fruit juice and freeze. Serve as a refreshing ice pop. And then finally, we get, well not finally, but next up we have the venom dweevil. Is this just another different color of the dweevil? Not at all. You see here a fashion leader of a critter of the critter world. There was once a purple one as well, but this year's trendy color is green. Be sure to bring protective gear to see it through. This skittering sweetie can produce a toxic gas if threatened. Venom Dweevil is one member of the Dweevil family, which is known for mimicking objects by carrying them on their backs. These insects often carry the carcasses of the other life forms on their backs. Apparently, this is not for the purpose of transporting them as food, but instead is another example of their mimic behavior. The Venom Dweevil produces two different chemical compounds within its body, which form poisonous gas when mixed and expelled. This gas used only is used only for self-defense. Exposure to even extreme heat doesn't seem to rid this creature of the deposits of potent gas. It's probably best for everyone if you avoid eating this hazardous fare. It's so interesting to see things that Louis cannot devour. We got the arachnid. It has an agreeable personality and as long as as a meal doesn't get caught on its web, it will sit there curled up into a cuddly ball and waiting. You'll have to throw some food or even use yourself as bait if you wish to see it moving. What a leisurely method of hunting. This spider-like creature has distinctive yellow stripes on its back carapace. It spins webs in high traffic areas and waits for prey to blunder into them. Unlike its relatives in the arachnorb and dweevil families, it's ambisexual and has eight legs. Some theorize that it is genantry and is meant to aid in reproduction, though of course it cannot reproduce on its own. There's another theory that this species is in fact two organisms of opposing gender stuck together, but since no one has ever found a four-legged single-sexed specimen, this remains speculative. Pluck off the legs, cracked open, and savor the meat inside. Dip them in soy sauce for first for a nice mix of sweet and salty. Cool, now we have the body long legs over here. Where is it? Oh yeah, this one. If you lie down and look up while this hulking critter is walking over, you'll be treated to an impressive view of its giant round body soaring past like in an orbiting planet. Of course, you may get squished flat by its massive feet and become a, the star, a star yourself. A shaggy long legs that has lost its hair. It has similarities to the beady long legs, but it doesn't secrete wax from its exoskeleton and thus lacks its cousin's unique pattern, patterning. The absence of wax also allows small insects to climb its legs without slipping. Its central orb splits horizontally, but researchers have yet to determine the significance of this difference. Not as tasty as it looks, completely inedible. Yikes. Ooh, next up we have the man at legs. This was such a crazy fight. Having a body made up of living cells, a metabolism, and the ability to produce offspring might be considered necessary traits to determine if something is truly alive. But this rapid fire cannon blows away conventional definitions. Is it a machine and a creature? What a fascinating possibility. This species of the arachnor family fuses with machinery at a crucial point in the maturation process, giving it the ability to fire energy bursts from the launcher beneath its orbicular torso. However, the mammoth legs itself is not in control of this weapon. 
It, in, instead, the mechanical portions of its structure appear to automatically acquire and attack targets. The Analyx has a gentle disposition, and as a member of the Arachnorm family, it has no natural enemies. It is particularly difficult to understand why this species would develop such awesome offensive capabilities, leading to rumors among the scientific community that was it, it was the machinery that approached the Arachnorb and proposed the symbiotic relationship. Whoa. Interesting implications there. Although the meat is a bit on the metallic side, the oil makes a mouth-watering gravy or lubricative vinaigrette. Wow, okay. And the groovy long legs, probably my favorite enemy in the entire game. I love this thing. Uh, with mesmerizing lights that pierce through the darkness and a glow groove that stirs your soul, how can you not get your dance on? Is it a creature or a machine? Who cares? Everyone can join this party. A word of caution though, be careful you don't dance right under one of its feet. This species has some remaining organic internal organs, but its carapace and eyes are made up of an inorganic material. All 19 of its eyes are actually photoelectric sensors that the species uses to precisely locate its prey. The gas emitted from the posterior of its first leg joints include a chemical substance that, after making contact with another organism's brain, temporarily controls that organism's actions. The groovy long legs uses this natural phenomenon, called the endless dance, to make its prey jump between its legs while it moves around in while it moves around in bizarre rhythms. The entire interaction is seemingly odd for a living organism, but the line between organic and inorganic on this planet is not always clear. This creature is mostly tendon, so it often gets stuck in your teeth. It smells like burnt plastic or possibly metal. <laughs> yeah, not a good meal. This is the anode beetle. With this little darling around, outer space's power problems are solved. These generate enough electricity to light up the, the night and help people live comfortably on the next ragingly hot or frigidly cold planets. It'll cost or it'll cost to feed them, but that's a minor detail. I don't really even remember this enemy too much. This specimen is representative of an insect hybrid that uses electricity in addition to glycogen. Glycogen? Glycogen for its energy. Although difficult to confirm due to it, their microscopic size, tiny hairs on the creature's legs cause the friction that generates the electrical charge. The electrical charge is, charge is processed by the creature's internal battery structure and then stored as an electrical field. As this field reaches critical levels, a surplus electricity is emitted, resulting in a low voltage current that is transmitted between specimens. It can shock other creatures in the immediate vicinity. Considering this process, it can be surmised that the largest impetus to pack behavior is not so much for the synergetic effect of producing as a pack as it is to take advantage of this most effective means of group preservation. Quite the, quite the sort of story going on with this one. Drain the electrical charge before boiling. Although it is possible to eat an anode beetle while discharged, doing so may result in an unpleasant tingling sensation. Iridescent flint beetle is our next one. This guttling little one is a good luck talisman you'd be happy to encounter. If you're fortunate enough to come upon one, make a wish before it leaves. The way its iridescent carapace changes color depending on the angle you view it from is so distracting that I often forget to wish for something. Flint beetle are known to hide in the grass until approached, at which point they jump out and scurry around. These creatures keep undigested food pellets in their stomachs to sustain them through the winter. But given the right stimulus, they will spit them out. Re recent research has revealed that these pellets are enveloped in a membrane that seals and preserves them in a serial airtight environment. If kept in room temperature, it seems that this pellet membrane will keep its contents fresh for up to six months. The membrane may be made from the same substance that gives the exoskeleton of the flint beetle its beautiful sheen. An essential flavor accentuating ingredient in the gumbo and jambalaya. Also in soups, broths, and marinades. And then the doodle bug. Whoa, that reeks! It reeks so bad! These uncouth little stinkers are always passing gas whenever and wherever. But that also means they're easy to track down. Of course, nobody can stand to get close if they do find one. It's a brilliant defense mechanism. While life forms that excrete foul musks to warn of danger are not rare, the doodle bug is the only species known to release flatulence when active under, above ground. Interestingly enough, since it is merely releasing the gas created by the decay of the contents of the creature's intestines, it does not have a special musk-producing organ. 
this means the creature is in fact merely flatulating. Species spectral analysis of the rank gas indicates it contains not only methane but hydrogen sulfide as well, making the flatulence a grade eight biohazard. Or no, actually grade 13 biohazard. Looking for a flavor that will surprise and delight your guests? This piece aroma may surprise your guests, but it won't be delightful. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't think so. This thing just farts around everywhere. The iridescent glint beetle is next as once the golden one. The golden shine on its gleaming carapace really is gold. It's in this little darling's nature to collect gold from the soil. As you might expect, it's extremely rare to see one in person. I'd never heard it, so I hope to have one appear before me someday. This variety of beetle consumes subterranean minerals. Due to the fact that it is real, that it rarely emerges from the ground, sightings of this particular species are extremely rare. While minerals are this beast's primary source of food, the beetle itself does not have the ability to digest these minerals. Instead, metabacteria living inside the beetle's stomach chemically break down the minerals. The resulting purified metal is discharged, but rare metals such as gold and platinum crystallize onto the iridescent glint beetle's shell, resulting in the beautiful laminated shimmer. This precious th treat is exceptionally rare. I could sell it back home for a fortune. Then I could use that cash to upgrade my kitchen, buy galactic class ingredients, and even star on my own cooking show, The Insect Gourmet. <laughs> Interesting, so it really is quite the chef. The mitite, oh gosh, these things. The cheeky mitite lay its eggs inside the eggs of other creatures to providing its off offspring with an easy first meal. When they come wriggling and squiggling out, it's spine chilling. But you can't blame the newly hatched larva. After all, you might enjoy an egg or two yourself now and then. <laughs> These parasitic insects feed on the eggs. Upon reaching maturity, they excrete a special pheromone that attracts females of particular species, enticing these females to swallow the metites whole. Pikmin, however, seem to dislike the scent. After entering the host female's body, the metites lay their own eggs inside the host eggs just prior to the host spawning. <laughs> Terrifying. Flash fry with garlic and red chil chilies in a hot pan, then sprinkle with grated gorgonzola. Some dinner guests may find the legs unappealing, so it's best to remove them before serving. And then next up we have the scutter shock. Watching it move around on the very tips of its tippy toes is like watching a ballet. If you offer to be a dance partner for this little spiky toed sweetie, it will leap high in the sky. I bet this agile creature will have no trouble sticking the landing. Its main offensive strategy is to launch the crystal it carries on its back. Otherwise, it's completely defenseless. In most circumstances, it is a peaceful herbivore whose diet consists of primarily of moss. When in danger, however, it wastes no time defending its territory by breaking small rocks and hurling them at the threat. In order to ensure it has a steady supply of rocks which, with which to defend itself, it shares its habitat with calcified crash, crush blat larva so it can make use of the shells they cast off. An acquired taste, but it's really quite addictive once you get used to it. No special preparation necessary. Next up we have the Skeeter Skates. <laughs> Clean water is a necessity for this water walking sweetheart, and a lot of it at that. In water soiled with oils, detergent, or other pollutants, it could lose the surface tension that supports its specifically or specially evolved feet and drown. This is an extraordinarily extraordinary creature that could only exist on such a water-rich planet. It skates on water at high speeds thanks to tiny hairs on the tips of its feet. These hairs are coated in an ultra-hydrophobic substance to minimize friction against the water surface. Its long proboscis functions as a straw to take in water, which is stored in a reservoir in its head, as well as to spout it as a weapon against a small insects. While taking in water, it also takes in microscopic plankton, meaning that its prime means of defense is also a feeding mechanism. The extremities cannot be used for food, but you can drink the liquid inside for a zesty beverage. <laughs> This is the mucker skate. This cautious critter moves and fits and starts. When it does, the muddy liquid in its transparent orb sloshes around. Splish, splash, sploosh. If I could observe this unique anatomy up close, I'd have no regrets, even if I got splattered with mud. A subspecies of the Skeeter Skate that's adapted to life in muddy wetlands. It uses its straw-like proboscis, the inside of which is packed with densely grown hair, to capture any plankton living in the mucky water to filter out everything else. When an enemy approaches, it will threaten them by shooting out a murky substance. This combination of muddy water and gastric juices has a higher viscosity, so it can essentially bury Pikmin and a lot of other stuff in dirt. 
Even after draining the mud, its texture remains gritty. Chew it for long enough and your teeth will get a good scrubbing. <laughs> Interesting. And then we have the white spectralids. In the same way it stops on the petal when flitting around a garden full of flowers and bloom, it will alight without hesitation on things like a sleeping bulb orb. What an audacious little daredevil. It's remarkably similar to its unmarked brethren, but the telltale wing patterns and a lone pair of hind legs give it away. It sticks to its own habitat for the most part. Thought, it, though it may fly away to reach a flower or escape a bull blacks, it will soon return to its home. The white variety gathers no nectar, but sometimes may be found carrying raw material. Remove the wings and drop straight into a deep fryer. Cook until golden or until the ticing aroma starts to sting your eyes. Serve immediately. The yellow spectralids. After flitting around all over the place, the wing beats of the, the little spectralid can cause a tornado on the other side of the world. Or so, so some have said. What I wonder is how much influence did these charmers have on our being on this planet right now? I don't know. Uh, the primary morphological difference from other spectralids is the eye-like spot on its hind wings. When crossbred with red spectralids, the offspring has a 25% chance of inheriting these spots on orange colored wings. Would this count as a new subspecies? I suppose so. For a tasty appetizer, tip wings into a batter and fry. Can also be used to season stews and soups. Remember the first, first remove the bitter innards. Red spectralids? Spectralid wings have a lot of fine powder on them. By building up many different layers, it gives them a sparkle with complexity and depth. This little fellow's powder has also has some ultra spicy essence in it for a zestier effect. Its red wings have several spots, unlike the lone spot on each wing of the yellow variety. Its scales contain trace amounts of ultra spicy flakes, which are mixed into its saliva as it sucks up the nectar from flowers. The combined flakes, saliva, and nectar are refined into ultra spicy nectar inside the creature, which it uses as a growth supplement for its eggs. Despite this, its reproductive capabilities are quite low. It is for this reason that the red variant fetches astronomical prices among collectors. Spread larva on a slice of toast for a spicy and protein-packed breakfast, or fry up the wings at any time of day for a sweet and crunchy snack. And then the snowflake flutter tail. Whoa, I remember this. Please don't call it a flying snowman. The sight of it flying around with its magnificent wings, scattering ice like diamonds, evokes thoughts of a snow sprite. Witness this beauty of nature and let it soothe away all of your woes and anxiety. The cooling cycle in its body uses ammonia as a refrigerant that chill the moisture it absorbs from the air until it reaches a super cooled state. By then spraying it out of the several vents in its, on its belly, the snowflake flutter tail creates a delicate cocoon out of ice to both protect itself and freeze its prey. It's rolled up a spirally proboscis evolved from an upper jaw that can catch and tie up prey with the fine hairs on the surface. Though it mimics the type of swallowtail butterfly, this creature is actually more closely related to moths. One might extrapolate that its ancient ancestor was able to adapt to the cooling, surf, cooling climate and therefore went extinct. Dice finely or puree to make a meaty sorbet. Add a tiny drizzle of fruit sauce for some punch. Pluck the wings and antenna before to use a, as a garnish if you want to get fancy. Then we have the creeping chrysanthemum. Chrysanthemum or something. It's so hard for me to pronounce, but let's have a creeping chrysanthemum show. Why don't we? We'll gather hand raised creeping chrysanthemums and have a contest based on size, flower, things like that. They're half animal, so maybe a behavior category too. Of course, how could the judges ever choose a winner? Each specimen is so beautiful in its own way. Like Pikmin, the creeping chrysanthemum is a member of a group of creatures with ambulatory root structures. This creature is known as a mimic, but because it is actually a form of plant, this label is not entirely accurate. It uses its mimicry to lie in wait and ambush prey, unrecognized even by Pikmin, despite being members of the same class or of organisms. It relies on preying upon cre other creatures to provide sustenance, so it has no need of leaves for photosynthesis. Generally speaking, the role of plants within an ecosystem is as a producer species, and thus plants are generally found at the bottom of the food pyramid. However, on this strange planet, the line between producer plants and consumer plants is blurred. When thinly sliced, this predator sizable bulb makes a sumptuous pizza topping. <laughs> Interesting. 
The Startle Spore. These don't just mimic a growth mushroom for the fun of catching you by surprise, they also use the opportunity to spread poison around quite indiscriminately. But that's just the little darling's idiosyncratic method of for catching prey. We can learn from the way the way nature embraces such unique and varied creatures. The defining characteristics of the fungi that grow from its head differ from that of the chrysanthemum family's creeping chrysanthemum. But the makeup of the body out of which they grow is mostly the same. If you can successfully remove the tongue's poison glands, you'll enjoy a, a rare opportunity to appreciate the umami synergy of the mushroom and meat combo. The bread bug. Oh, this is so cute. It looks like your breakfast table's longtime staple, a loaf of bread with perfect bo body color and buttery shine. Just from looking at it, I swear the aroma of baking wafts passed my nose, but you've never seen your bread loafing about like this. If you observe them for a while, you might catch them dragging things around with their mouths. It's heart-meltingly adorable. It definitely is. The adult bread bug competes for many of the same food sources as Pikmin, but its thick skinned hide allows it to withstand most Pikmin group attacks. However, some researchers claim to have observed bread bugs being overwhelmed by massive numbers of Pikmin and reduced to food. Bread bugs are hardy and nutritious, but also bland and unimaginative. They may be pal palatable in a pinch, but they hold no true culinary promise. Interesting. Giant bread bug. Perfectly cooked, golden brown, and fluffy. It must be a fresh baked loaf of bread. Oh, my mistake. This is the widely unique giant bread bug. With the texture and vibrancy only a living creature can possess, don't let your eyes and gut deceive you. This lumbering muffin might just take offense if you mistake it for a loaf of fresh bread. This gargantuan species of the greater bread bug family has a torso so perfectly square that it almost seems like it was formed in a mold. For a brief period after birth, the giant bread bug competes for food with smaller bread bugs, but upon reaching maturity, it seeks out much larger prey. This is the primary reason that the two species with similar feeding habits can coexist in the same habitat. Hordes of Pikmin appear to pose the only plausible threat to this massive creature's life. Although cooking this colossal beast yields a mountain of meat, every ounce of it is flavorless, only suitable for intergalactic all-you-can-eat buffets. I'm so surprised that Louie's not into the bread bugs. Usually, you know, bread is one of the most common staples and cooking. We got the Gilda Mandui. With one little gold colored stone on its back, it toddles about lantern flickering cheerfully. It doesn't intentionally deceive Pikmin or our sensors. They just respond to that gold colored stone. Only the adults tend to be intentionally deceptive in this world or any other. Immediately after hatching, this species presents itself in a Gilda tadpole like form and grows its legs after about a week. This juvenile Gildamander spe specimen is estimated to be about one month old due to the presence of an ore like growth on its back and the fact that it has already emerged onto land. The living ore has substances similar to treasure within it, a peculiar scent, and has an effect on both sensors and Pikmin. However, the lantern organ on its head is still undeveloped and can only emit very faint electromagnetic waves. For this reason, juvenile Gildamanders often hide out of sight to avoid Pikmin attacks. Heat the golden crystals on its back until they melt into a caramel sauce. Flip the creature upside down and bake until the skin develops a crunchy candied crust. <laughs> gotcha. And now we got the full grown Gildamander. Notice the gold sparkles on its back. In order to survive, this delayed of a creature spends a mind boggling amount of time collecting those special gold stones. Though it isn't real gold, it can confuse the sensors. That's another marvel of the natural world for you. The ore like growth on its back is a coagulated bodily fluid that includes a substance similar to sparklium, which can make our mechanical sensors go berserk. The use, the use, to use a te the technical term. This living ore emits a scent that lures the creature's prey, so it's almost important for their feeding process. The lantern like organ atop its head emits electromagnetic waves that are known to affect Pikmin and onions, confusing them into thinking the Gildamander is their leader, allowing it to withdraw Pikmin directly from the onion. However, it cannot go as far as to command them as a squad, so the Pikmin will often hide under cover and are able to avoid ingestion. The meat gives off a faint aroma similar to a hot pepper. The flavor itself is subtle and elegant. Char grill the lantern until blackened and you've got a nutritional superfood. That's great. So now we have the miniature snooth whacker. The way it catches food, protects its belly, and gets up while working with the weight of its sizable trunk are all taught by its diligent parents. Instead of hand and foot, they attend to their offspring nose and foot. They prepare the child for the day it will leave the nest and eventually become a parent itself. 
Immediately after birth, this species skin starts to harden, and before long it will reach the same impenetrable toughness as that of an adult. Adult snooth whackers dexterously use their trunks to grab food from high tree branches, but juveniles consume fruits and nuts that have fallen to the ground, as well as other types of terrestrial flora. This specimen's like and torso muscles are under underdeveloped compared to the, the those in their nose, so they lack the strength to maintain their posture and easily lose their balance. Gently peel the skin back from the nose. Its meat has a greasy bitterness. Tastes like a cucumber. <laughs> Interesting. Mammoth Snooth Walker. If you get close, it will whip its trunk around and around, then smash it on the ground. It might be a chance for you for an excited jump rope workout. <laughs> if you try throwing a bomb at it, it will use that dexterous trunk to shoot it right back at you. Those are, those are some nose skills that could impress any athlete. The long nose on this specimen has neither bone nor cartilage, but is made up entirely of muscle and can be flexibly curved and extended. Its tough hide consists of densely layered collagen lattices that cover almost its entire body, leaving only the regular skin on the belly exposed. The fully developed trunk is large and quite heavy, so the mammoth snooth whacker usually rolls it in order to carry it closer to the center of gravity. But if its territory is invaded, it will extend the trunk and flail it around, even using it to strike a perceived enemy. Just like the juvenile snooth whacker, their nose comprises a disproportional amount of their body weight, resulting in poor balance. If attacked from behind or from the side, even the, an adult of the species is easily knocked over. The bitter flavor fades as they grow, replaced by a sweet mellow aroma. Stew the base of the trunk, grill the middle, or smoke the tip. The possibilities are endless. <laughs> The Sun Squish? Oh yeah, this egg thing. This peculiar little button has the perfect texture and coloration to pass as an egg fried sunny side up by a master chef. There's nothing about it that makes it seem threatening, and it looks so yummy. I can't help thinking of a delicious breakfast when I see it. A type of primitive, or primitive organism called a protochordate. In its juvenile state, it has a skeleton-like structure called a not notochord. Notochord? Something like that. It flips its finned tail to move and lives within other creatures' eggs as it grows. As its body develops, it starts to exhibit mollusk-like qualities, but its highly exposed external stomach can directly digest prey on contact and can also be used for locomotion. Season with salt and pepper. <laughs> so directed this one, I can see why. Next up we have the Foolix. If you take the microorganisms I used to peer at through my microscope as a child and blow them up much, much bigger, this is what you get. A huge single-celled sweetie, it's warbly slashes around in search of food. The, to this giant, were the microorganisms. Interesting. Uh, is this just not the nectar? I guess not. A member of the Gulix family, oh yeah, I sort of remember this now. A member of the Gulix family, this primitive life form is made up of a single cell, which is quite odd given its size. Its nucleus is shaped like a bulbous star. An individual move, an individual's move by using the fin at the end of its flagellum-like tail to quickly expand and contract its gelatinous body. If the nucleus is removed, its soft body loses all structure and splatters. But as long as the nucleus is still alive, the Fulix can return to its original form. Usually the Fulix will mimic nectar and wait for its prey. Its gel, which includes fire extinguishing fluids, will then expand it to capture and feed on uns unsuspecting organisms. Jelly remove the jelly parts, add fruit and a sweetener of your choice, then serve as a gel gelatin dessert. The Downy Snagret. The sight of this wee one boinging around and pecking at its food, all while skillfully balanced on one leg, is truly awe-inspiring. If you get too close, it might feel vulnerable and give you a warning poke with its beak, or it might just turn you turn to you for comfort. <laughs> Due to the to a common phenomenon known as imprinting, this baby will recognize anything that it sees or hears within a given length of time after it hatches as its parent and consequently follows it around. However, the downy snagrat has two specific conditions for imprinting. The first is that the target must be tall and blue, and the second is related to the sound of its cry. This means that it will never make a mistake with something as small as we are, and will instead recognize it, or us, as food. Since it's still a fledgling, the downy snagrat does not go underground and to feed. Instead, it stays on the surface where there's plenty of food. It looks harmless enough, but beware. Its parents may be hiding nearby until the baby is old enough to fend for itself. Grind up the meat and cartilage, then mold into meatballs. The tender texture of the meat contrasts nicely with the crunchy, chewy cartilage bits. 
All right, Burrow and Snagret, of course, a classic one we've seen quite a few times now. Instead of the sky, this scaly anomaly flies through the ground. When it pops its head to, uh, to the surface, the way its crown of feathers fluffs through intended to make though intended to make it more intimidating, is delightful to behold. But be wary of lingering to gaze up at it, as you lo you'll likely get the poking of a lifetime from that long, sharp beak. The majority of Snagret species lie in wait to ambush and capture prey. With a body type perfectly adapted to, to such sudden strikes, it violently attacks small, surface-dwelling insects. Distributed across a relatively wide range, subspecies of Snagret suited to the varying soil conditions have emerged, making the Snagret the most geographically represented species besides the Bulborb. Visually resemble, resembling the Burrowing Snagret is the Burrowing Snarrow, the range of which partially overlaps with the Snagret's range. While the two may appear similar when pulled from the ground, they can be distinguished by the presence or absence of tail and wings wing markings. Slice the serpentine torso into thin medallions, skewer on a metal rod with Hakate onions, and barbecue over an open flame. So now we have the Waddle Cloth. It possesses a bottomless stomach and will swallow down anything and everything unfortunate enough to end up in its path. It will consume things larger than its own body without missing a step. The best part is its goofy little head that looks just like a fuzz covered gourd. Its overdeveloped respiratory muscles allow it to suck in large volumes of air through its long, thick beak while feeding. If its feathers are too small to use for flying, the current theory is that it, this is due to the niche position in the ecosystem being quite secure thanks to a lack of natural predators and little competition for food in its habitat. However, with the expansion of Pikmin territory, recently its numbers have been gradually declining. Breasts, thighs, and wings can be baked, roasted, or fried. The rest of the car carcass is great for flavoring a rich soup stock. <laughs> Alright, next up is the Scorch Cake. In a way, it kind of looks kind of like a tasty treat, but in actuality, this burning bivalve relative is a fierce hunter, squashing its prey with a fiery flourish. The beauty of its popping, crackling flames and the dynamic cartwheels it can perform in battle is a spectacle to behold. Related to bivalves, it uses its internal muscles to dexterously manipulate its upper and lower shells. This ability allows it to squash eggs in small ambulorodices like Pikmin, this thus re returning nectar to the ground. It then feeds off the microorganisms and moss that benefit from the nectar. To further facilitate the growth of its food, the scorched cake will secrete oils from its body through its shell and onto the ground. It then sets that area on fire, perhaps as a way to improve soil fertility. Remove the internal meat and place directly on the shell while it's still smoldering to cook. It almost smells better than it tastes. Whoa. Ooh, the shock cake. Living creatures can sense your intent and emotions. So if you face them with love in your heart, they'll know it. When you love and are loved back, even the occasional electric shock isn't so bad. That's right, instead of play, play biting, this sweetie does play shocking. It can zap away shoulder stiffness and fatigue in a flash. This species has muscular organs that can create electricity by using ion gradients within densely layered rows of electricity generating cells, which are arranged in an asymmetrical series. It uses its plug-like protrusions to instantly shock its prey, and then squashes it. The squash prey acts as a fertilizer, improving the quality of the soil so that the microorganisms and moss that the shortcake feeds on, or shock cake feeds on, can thrive. Saute in butter and cover with a sauce made from the green liver paste. Anyone with a highly developed palate will enjoy this slightly bitter flavor profile. The Freeze Cake. The way its blue-white shell is woven through the cracks makes it look like a porcelain coaster. What's more, it's cold enough to keep your drink chilled. Of course, this remarkable critter is very much alive and would flip-flop your drink right over. By emitting frigid air from one side of its shell, it can freeze and squash any prey that approaches too closely. Food can be hard to find in extremely cold climates, so one theory is that this species has developed some kind of mechanism that allows it to store its prey for long periods of time. The meat under the icy shade or side of the shell is quite muscular, while the other side is nice and fatty. Two great tastes in one. And the puff stool. Come, let us ponder the puff stool. This devious little bean releases spores that have a hallucinogenic effect on Pikmin. At the first inhale, affection sprouts and they are drawn in closer. Then they breathe in more and more of the confusion inducing spores. Soon they think of nothing but the puff stool as they jump around. Boing, boing, boing. <laughs> I guess maybe he got caught up in it. 
a type of ambulofungus. This current working theory is that the puff stool evolved from a more common species of fungus that gained animal-like characteristics over time, including the ability to walk. When it senses danger, it will scatter spores from under its cap, releasing a hallucinogenic that confuses its attackers. The hallucinogenic compound in the spores is only effective against this species natu nature natural enemies, the Pikmin causing them to mistake it for their leader. Pikmin who fall into this trap are then used as workers to maintain nutrition or defenses for the puff stool. Flip upside down and cook cap over a charcoal grill, low and slow. Once it starts to sweat, it's ready to eat. All right, next up we have the tox stool. See how it toddles and bounces on its wee little footsies as it goes for a stroll, scattering extremely toxic spores along the way? This creature is a walking nuisance, but there's an odd kind of charm in that bothersome nature that makes it hard to leave alone. Much like the puff stool, the tox stool is neither animal nor fungus, but a mix of the two, or an ambula fungus. It doesn't serve as a, a serve a producer or consumer role in the ecosystem, but functions instead as a decomposer. It primarily parasitizes other living organisms by blanketing them with its spores. However, the tox stool can infect a deceased specimen as well. Its hyphae is able to move the muscles and control the body as if bringing it back from the dead. The way the fungal filaments grow differs based on the host organism. In some cases, they may cause the host to wander around in search of food to facilitate a more nutrient-rich fungal culture medium. They can also just use the host as a means to scatter more spores. Bury underground for about 40 days so the poison can leach out. Its smell will make you gag, but the flavor has notes of chocolate. I guess he really has been here for 40 days, hasn't he? Um, Moldy Dwarf Bulborb. Picture this scenario. Like this poor darling, you're conscious but no longer in control of your own body. Someone or something else has taken you over. A horrifying concept, isn't it? But what if the thing controlling you couldn't live if it didn't do that? Sometimes it's simply a matter of survival. This is an example of a young bulborb body that's been infected by fungal filaments. Now a host, it unconsciously continues to seek out and ingest food, all the while scattering large amounts of spores out of the spore sacs on its back until it can no longer move. After all host body activity ceases, the specimen mutates into a fungal culture that will eventually become a juvenile tox stool. Tastes best if eaten just before the meat spoils. Once all the mold has been removed, enjoy a unique flavor reminiscent of dry aged meat. And then we got the moldy slooch. Slugga slugga choo choo, here comes the fungal spore train. The miasma emitting from the fungus on its back has tox stool, tox stool spores on it. If you must observe it, do so from as far away as possible, or risk ending up as a fungal choo choo too. Both the nervous system and slime producing organs of this specimen have been invaded by fungal filaments, which is why it scatters spores as it moves. It will also shake spores onto other creatures, thus infecting new hosts and expanding the toxstool's habitat and range. Once the host body ceases to function, it can no longer serve as a fungal culture medium because its bodily fluids dry up and the corpus shrinks. At that point, the host body is abandoned. After removing the poison, the broth is fragrant and savory. Don't drink too much, or you'll find yourself with crippling tummy ache. That doesn't sound good. Pyroclasmic Slooch. The mucus of the pyroclasmic slooch acts as a natural fire starter, but it also seems to serve as insulation from heat. Gazing into those flickering flames at night would be a great way to relax, and the ripple pattern going from top to bottom is so mesmer mesmerizing. A species of terrestrial snail coated in flammable mucus instead of the traditional shell. The creature stays lubricated through constant secretion of mucus so that the fires never reach its skin. Remove tongue and discard the rest. Cook over a charcoal grill until medium rare. <laughs> all right, thank you. Uh, it's good to know all that, I guess. Bearded Amprat. This little cutie has a long beard that makes it look a bit curmudgeonly. But if you were to try brushing it, do so with caution. This dear one will, well, see for yourself. Moving close to get a good look and truly shocking experience awaits you. <laughs> the hair covering its face works as a capacitor. It charges electricity by rubbing the hair to build static, then discharges it at enemies intruding on its territory. It's more territorial than aggressive, attacking only th when threatened rather than to hunt prey. It has several qualities unique to this ecosystem, such as breastfeeding its young, which may someday give rise to a whole new taxonomy of fauna here. 
Pan roast the thighs with sprigs of rosemary and whole garlic cloves. Finish with a squeeze of fruit juice to highlight the subtle notes of the lingering electricity. Now we got the Mamuta. Whoa, yeah, this enemy, so weird. A gentle creature removed from the fierce competition of the strong eating the weak. It sits in gardens in a pool of sunlight, looking content as it gazes out its big round eyes at a plant it has raised that's just starting to sprout. Don't tease this mild-mannered beastie by messing with the delicate sprouts it's tending. Oh, I really sort of just directly attacked this thing, so never really knew what it did. The unbalanced asymmetrical arms of the Mamuta are among its most notable features. Feeding on seeds and fruit, the Mamuta is known to actually sow in grow plant species. While other species have exhibited seed burying behavior for the purpose of storage, the Mamuta is the only species so far known to actually cultivate fields of plants. Inedible, tastes like chicken. <laughs> I don't, that doesn't sound very right inedible. I guess Louie doesn't like chicken. Porkillion. When it cowers down to roll up, it looks like it's feeling lonely. If you get closer, the needles all over its body become projectiles that it will launch at you. I can't help thinking this is just a plea for attention. It's okay, Brickly Bean, I'll be your friend. Its needle-covered armor is soft and quite exposed. Furthermore, it has a cowardly disposition, so when it senses even the slightest danger, it shoots out its spikes. Regenerating new spikes require significant amounts of caloric energy, so this creature requires significant, um, significant amount of food. This likely explains why, when it scrounges through garbage, it sucks up not just the insects it finds, but also the trash itself. They have ingested a few of the Asus Dolphin's parts too, but those can never be mistaken for trash. Cut the meat into four even slices. Dip slices into a beaten egg, then dredge in bread crumbs. Fry over low heat. Honey Wisp. This cutie swims through the air with a heavy looking nectar egg dangling below its translucent body on its way back to its nest where it's offering a wheat lunch. Nectar is a vital source of nutrition that most life on this planet depends on. Whether it's in the form of an egg yolk, sap, or honey, I leave it up to your imagination. This floating life form drifts effortlessly on the winds. Upon death, its physical structure instantly collapses, and as the creature is particularly elusive and difficult to catch, no sample specimens have been acquired as of yet. If we could simply recover a live sample, research on this species would likely proceed more smoothly. Although the eggs are small, the yolk has a distinctly bold and tangy flavor. Try tossing a few in a pan along with your choice of meat and fresh vegetables. And cook up a country scramble. The puffy blowhog. See those prominent spikes upon its back? I like to imagine that if you looped ropes through them and hung a gondola from the ropes, you could create a living airship. How amazing would it be to travel the sky with one of those spiky sweetlings? We'd float along together wherever the wind chose to take us. This species of blowhog uses internally generated hydrogen to inflate a flotation bladder and move above the ground. The creature's electrified pulse creates a slash of, or sash of color that flows along the surface of its body, making it a particularly beautiful species of the blowhog family. Precisely how it is able to internally stabilize its highly explosive hydrogen and simultaneously generate electricity remains a mystery. The puffy blowhog blo blows leaves and grass around to eat the insects underneath. It maintains midair buoyancy by using its fins and releasing air through blowholes. This enables it to float effortlessly even in the breeze. Slice this creature's feather light skin into triangles, deep fry until crispy and salt generously. Make makes the perfect scooping chip to accompany fresh mango salsa. Icy Blowhog. This frosty flyer may exhale frigid breath, but you can touch it without having to worry about freezing. Its face remains quite cool, but it expels warm air from the little holes on the sides. If you're feeling chilled, you could sidle up next to, to this little one. This creature possesses three lungs, an air sac used as its primary respiratory organ, a flotation bladder that gives it bo its buoyancy, and a cold sac that stores cold air. Like the puffy blowhog, its buoyancy is a result of the hydrogen produced by electro electrolysis. Its icy breath is condensed carbon dioxide, much like the snowy blowhog. Different species within the blowhog family have many features in common when you look closely at the structure and characteristics of their internal organs. Has the consistency of candy-coated chewing gum and leaves a refreshing mentholated aftertaste. Interesting. Withering blowhog. 
You can have a bit of fun with this one by giving it a good poke and watching it wobble and sway through the air like a balloon. Poke it too much though, and it may spew gas and fly off. It's a mysterious, mischievous little darling, and the way it scatters flowers and cackles is quite charming. The withering blowhog is a close relative of the puffy blowhog, but its breath is significantly weaker. However, its breath does contain a petal withering plant hormone that causes flowers to instantly lose their petals. Although its breath has not been studied in detail, analysis of the chemical compounds involved hold great promise for the biotechnology sector. Hang this creature on a rack and sun dry it on a hot afternoon. When suitably crisp, grind the sun dried beast into a powder. Makes a great substitute for cayenne curry powder. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, what do we have here? This is the lesser spotted jelly float. Notice the elegant way it floats, its delicate and its delicate transparency. The mystical sky blue color always catches my gaze and won't let go. Even when the drifting darling sucks up Pikmin, it doesn't eat them, but gently envelops them. What a sweetheart. This native jelly float is indigenous to the region. Unfortunately, it is currently endangered and it, as its habitat is being overwhelmed by hostile invasive species. Similar in taste and texture to gelatin, this jiggling mass of jelly can be sculpted into all kinds of creative shapes. As a bonus, it also doubles as a as professional grade hair gel. It's the perfect cool summer treat. <laughs> this might be the first time that Louis said more about a creature than Alamar did. Crater spotted jelly float. This lovely floating crater sucks up food by stretching and contracting its body. It's hard to imagine such a graceful creature could be of this world. It would be rather exciting to get sucked in with all the creatures and Pikmin to float on forever. But if that really happened, I wouldn't be of this world for long either. Oh no, wrong thing, there we go. Uh, vivid pink coloration is the most noticeable characteristic of this floating life form. This invasive species is not native to the region, having appeared to have recently arrived on wind currents. The luminescent organs atop its head attract prey, which it then sucks up and consumes with its lower orifice. Unlike jellyfish, the jelly floats tentacles do not have nematocysts, so there's no danger in touching them. Like a fine cheese, the aroma of this fluid floater can be oppressive, but its flavor must be a experience to be believed. Also makes an unforgettable non-dairy spread. We got the wool pole. While watching it swim to and fro, fatigue and time just melt away. I'm able to relax this much, even on an unknown planet at the ends of the universe, because observing this aquatic beastie takes me back to the waterfront in my hometown when I was a child. The yellow wally hop spawns in nearly in early spring, laying its eggs on low-hanging tree branches and shrubs growing or, or growing in or near lakes and ponds. Such unorthodox amphibious behavior is a defense mechanism protecting the eggs from predation by blue pigment and water dumples. The wally hop's wild hopping near the shoreline is in early spring is thought to be a method of driving predators away from the wool pole eggs. Wool poles can be eaten raw, but they're much more flavorful, flavorful when steamed or grilled. Also heavenly in risotto. <laughs> Feel free to experiment with this lush ingredient. The yellow wally hop, which I guess is what these guys sort of grow into. Uh, don't think of it as a unexciting. This crater's simplicity is quite refreshing. Should you raise one from a wool pole, you would certainly learn to adore it. The adults of the species can be a bit standoffish though. This magnificent specimen has remarkably bright coloration compared to the rest of its amph amphituber family, as well as three lateral spots. This species seems to have lost some swimming proficiency with the evolutionary adaptation that granted its greater jumping ability. The yellow wally hop inhabits aquatic shallows and shows an, an instinctive dive or drive to jump upon and squash smaller creatures. Coat it in a thick batter and deep fry for a down home flavor you won't soon forget. <laughs> and the wally hop. With a distinct pallor, almost like it was painted with white face paint, it gives off an air of a performing mime. This cutie can jump with quite refinement, never moving its plump jowls at all. It's grateful and ex expressive in the most unexpected ways. It is believed that the juvenile wally hops were once carried by underground currents into caverns, where they thrived in the dark habitat. The trogla Tro troglodytic species of wally hops coloration results from generations of cave dwelling and lack of sunlight. Comparative differences between the size and shape of this wally hop and the other species are thought to be the result of natural selection at work, choosing traits better suited to life in a subterranean environment. 
Lolly hops are the best ground up, are best ground up shaped into a patty and flame broiled on a grill. Slap on tomato slices, lettuce, onions, and ketchup, then slide the patty between a sesame seed bun for the ultimate beast burger experience. And um, chili hop. Slick and bulbous with a refreshingly frank face, that's one classy hopper. When it ha lands after jumping, it spills out cold air all around it. Mischievous and cool? This little fella needs to leave some personality for the rest of us. When squashing prey with its mighty leap, the chili hop secretes a bodily fluid made of ammonium nitrate, urea, and water. This causes an endothermic reaction that rapidly freezes its prey, making its attacks all the more lethal. After squashing the prey, it gets sucked up through the chili hop's belly. Since the species can store its food in a slightly chilled slate with, or state without eating it for a time, it easily adapts to environments where prey is scarce. Remove the tender meat surrounding the eyes and stew it with soy sauce. The collagen fibers are simply melt in your mouth delicious. The Master Hop. This is this, the big one. Wiggly elastic skin is the proper fit for this bouncing beauty. Slippery smooth and shiny sleek, its skin is soft as a baby's cheeks. Though you might want to be wary of getting close enough to touch it. Just watching it move will make your, you yearn for skin that is more radiantly lustrous too. It's widely believed that yellow wally hops and other related species can continue to grow until they start breeding, but after that their growth rate plummets. However, in safe environments, ones that lock natural predators for example, some individuals of the species may forgo reproduction altogether and continue growing until they reach gigantic proportions. The yellow wally hops telomerase enzymes are particularly active, which prevents their bodies from body cells from aging. Under the right conditions, it's not unusual for some individuals to reach over 50 years in age. Meat can be consumed if, if first dehydrated with a lot of salt, but the eyeballs and the legs are the best parts. Water Dumple This odd critter lost its vision, but it evolved a very sharp sense of smell to compensate. Even if you sneak up behind it very quietly, it will still detect you, but with a mouth that opens up a big and wide, approaching from the front isn't advisable either. A resident of freshwater pools and marshes, this aquatic creature regularly feeds on insects that land on the surface of the water. It shares a nearly identical skeletal structure with its close relative and terrestrial cousin, the bulborb. This may offer clues to its evolutionary origin and suggest that it only recently emigrated to an aquatic habitat. Deep fried dumples without batter for all of the flavor with half the fat. The puckering blinna. These form a group and then swim gracefully along as though, join, as though joined in an underwater dance. Are they a family or traveling as a school? It might be enlightening to watch them with a sub submersible camera and very quietly so they don't notice. Many assume it's undeveloped due to its large eyes and lack of fins, but this is simply its normal fully grown form. Though its dorsal and ventral fins have atrophied, the long caud caudal fin helps to compensate for this. It can leap high enough out of the water to catch low flying prey. The scales compromising the round patches along the sides are known to turn light pink during breeding season. Slice raw and serve as sashimi. The marbled fat gives this dish a deep umami flavor. And now we got the prickle puff. Ah, this enemy, my least favorite one. To watch it swimming dreamily along, then spot it again walking plip plop in tidal flats. The contrast is so great, I can only admire its adaptability. But don't be drawn in by its cute round little peepers. Much like a rose, the prickle puff has very sharp thorns. Its hidden spikes evolved from scales that were once on its forehead. The prickle puff uses them to charge and chase off unknown creatures that enter its territory. Its liver and ovaries contain powerful nerve toxins accumulated from ingesting shellfish and algae that trace amounts of poison. These toxins not only function as alternative pheromones, but also seem to keep predators at bay. However, once it's dead, the Pikmin have no issues carrying this creature back to the onion, where the poison is broken down into valuable nutrients. Remove the poisonous internal organs, then slice thinly and serve as sashimi. The, the firm meat is brimming with umami flavor, pairs well with a light, refreshing citrus vinaigrette. With a waddlepuss, this accomplished napper can snore away a whole day, but just watching the peaceful look on its snoozing face conveys a feeling of contentment. Also, if you get up close enough, it can blow bubbles that will envelop you. Have a fun float, it's like dreaming. Its eyes and stubby feet make it look like an octopus, hence the name, but it's closer in anatomy to a starfish. 
It sleeps during the day, but will stay alert for approaching predators, which it drives off by puffing itself up and releasing bubbles. Closer research suggests that the true purpose for the bubbles is to protect its eggs during spawning season. Perfect for make-ahead meals. Marinate the boiled meat in balsamic vinegar and chill for a few hours. The longer you let it sit, the richer the flavor. Aristocrab Offspring. It pokes its little eyes just a bit out of the sand and stays very still, waiting patiently for us to come by. Even if we know they're hiding there, it's best to act surprised and give them a good shout of alarm. That's the best way to help them feel successful in their endeavors. <laughs> I love Dalmo, so cute. All right, uh, a juvenile peckish aristocrab, small in size, its right pincer is only half grown. Because of this, it often hunts by hiding underground and lying in wait to ambush its prey. Generally, crabs pass through the larval stages Zoea and Megalopa as they approach juvenile crabhood. Instead, the peckish aristocrab is born with a body shaped like an onion, absorbing its nutrition through the ground and sprouting legs as it grows. Perhaps it's a close relative of species of the Ambulocratuses class. Maybe. <laughs> Throw a mountain of aristocrab offspring into a pot for a yummy and simple miso soup broth. And then the peckish aristocrab. Click, click, click goes the crab's pincer as it tries to impress other crabs. The crab with the biggest claw will be the most popular. Being popular means a lot, it means not having to work as hard to claw their way to the top of the crustacean hierarchy. The natural world is a lot like our world in that way. It's unnaturally large claw is used for catching prey for self-defense and most surprisingly for its mating claw. Most aspects of the aristocrat's life revolve around it, which may explain why they become fearful and docile when the claw is damaged. It would also account for the claw's remarkable regenerative capabilities, which can restore completely in a single night. It is also known to blow bubbles when under attack, but this is a result of it venting from the wrong discharge valve when under extreme stress. Great for a hot pot. Remove the shell and cook legs in the hot broth. When they turn nice and red, pull them out in slathered liver paste before eating. And then the grub chucker. The mouth on top of its head is somehow chic and ostentatious at the same time. Combined with the way it carries its claws like it's ready to give you a trim, this cutie looks like the charismatic beautician of the creature world. Though, the way to t it tosses its food in the air shows rather poor etiquette. This bipedal creature walks upright, so its motion is noticeably slow, but the long reach of its pinchers is useful for catching prey and tossing it into the wide mouth on top of its head. When young, this mouth stays closed, and the grub chucker lives on things like shellfish, nuts, and fruits, eating using the small trophy located behind the feelers below its eyes. As it grows, its syncitable mouth opens and it can start eating larger quantities of food. It has few natural enemies, primarily due to its height. However, it's often found in dimmer wetlands or underground to protect the soft top of its shell from the sun's rays. Pluck off the lips and serve with lemon and salt as an appetizer. Coat the arms and legs with plenty of miso for a full course dinner in a shell. Hermit Crawmad. Here we have one of the cleverest of creatures. It has many different nest holes that all connect below ground. Using this network, it can move from hole to hole to sneak up on prey or evade predators. A smart little darling indeed. Looking at the eyes and sickle-shaped leg, ca legs characteristic of squillas, one would think that this is a squilla alternative. In fact, it is a relative of the hermit crab. This species, however, has migrated from a seaside life in a shell and instead inhabits burrows in the ground. While its legs appear sickle-like, they are pincers that have evolved into a fin shape. This beast feeds on small creatures that pass by its lair, dragging them inside to eat them. Shuck from the shell, bake on high heat until crispy, then dip in a pot of melted cho milk chocolate. Lip smacking sweet. The bug-eyed crawmad. Its peepers aren't just big, they're capable of seeing things our eyes can't. This bug-eyed darling could identify all sorts of unknown objects for us if we showed it what to look at. How useful could that be? Like its cousin, the Kermit Crom Hermat Crawmad, it makes its home in a burrow rather than a shell. It has abnormally overdeveloped eyes with which to detect prey in cloudy water and or low visibility mud. These enormous eyes can perceive circular polarized light as well as the ultraviolet and infrared spectrum. It is well protected from predators, allowing it to live for upward of 50 years and grow to immense size by repeated ecdysis. 
bun grilled serves as an excellent filling for an offbeat po' boy. If you have any left over, add it to a liver paste and deepen the flavor. Crested rum pup, whoa. <laughs> With a red carapace curved like a jaunty sun hat and a tail sporting a vivid yellow tufts, this critter is a natural illustration of good fashion, but its face and personality exhibit only true ferocity. It will open its mouth wide and charge you with an alarming speed. The juxtaposition of artistic exterior coupled with an aggressive attitude is intriguing. Its body is covered in a hard carapace, and it has an extremely ferocious personality. It spreads its sharp fangled jaws to catch its prey. The crested rum pup suffers from poor vision, but it uses the fine hairs on its lower part of its tail and the ball-shaped sensory organ at its tip to detect faint quasi-electrostatic fields emitted by other organisms. In short, it has other ways to sense its predators and prey. The tip of the tail tastes almost fruity, with notes of sweet and sour. Pairs well with soft, ripened cheeses. The pearly clam clamp. On sand, hills, or in the sea, wherever it may be, it never moves far from its spot. It will sit and wait for someone to wander past, someone being prey preferably, though it could also be someone who knows the value of the beautiful shell or pearl it holds nestled inside. Using the pearl that takes shape inside its body as bait, this creature lures prey into its interior and traps it within the, its shell of feed, or to feed. It's also worth noting that this pearl may just be an amalgamation of outside materials wrapped in a viscous gel gelatin exterior. On the frequent occasions when it cannot gather food for itself, this creature can also obtain nutrients when the symbiotic algae within its body photosynthesizes. For this reason, it can often be found with its mouth open on shoals or sandy beaches that get a lot of sunshine. Heat in the shell over a strong fire to bring out the umami-rich juices. Finally, mince the mantle and toss it with noodles. Top with sesame seeds. Cute little marble-like eyes, a smooth, undulating body, a big curvy mouth, a tongue that extends and separates into six parts, gills like fruit from a plant. Sit a moment and take it all in. Sometimes it's fun to simply appreciate how a creature can do so much damage and, and can still be an adorable addition to our universe. This species of creature has yet to complete its evolution from bloom cap bloister to the more advanced ranging bloister. Compared to the latter, this creature is substantially smaller. The fact that, it man that its mandibles do not protrude as significantly as the ranging bloisters is due, to, due in part to the fact that, like most mollusks, its vital organs are located deep within the creature's carapace. The flower-like appendage on its back is actually a gill. It prefers a watery habitat from which it can capture unsuspecting small prey with its sticky tendrils. Pan sear with herbs and oil until lightly crusted on the outside and rosy on the inside. Complement the savory flavors with a light and buttery cream sauce. And then we got the balloon cap bloister. With a peaked carapace and undulating mouth, it goes around cleaning up everything in its path. It's the organic vacuum cleaner of the natural world. If you startle it, it opens its top like an umbrella, which can be quite a surprise to whoever is watching. The origin species from which rain, the ranging and toady bloister evolved, it still carries a larger shell on its back. The exposed head and legs are covered by a layer of tough muscle, so it barely moves even when attacked. On the other hand, it has extremely sensitive flower-like gills that are characteristic of the molluscine family. When the gills are touched, the bloister cannot breathe and must open its shell, exposing its soft body. Amphibious with a gentle demeanor, it simply swallows up anything that happens to enter its field of vision, kind of like a living vacuum cleaner. The fatty muscle that controls those undulating motions must be eaten fresh. All that quick movement means the meat toughens quickly. And then we got the bog swallow. It pops up out of the mud, often with no warning, to say hello. With a body like a hose and a big round mouth, it tastes, it sates its appetite by feeding on the mud itself. Its six bright eyes mean it's sure to see the fondness we have for it six times better. I hope it eats up all that unending affection. This species prefers to inhabit cloudy, stagnant water like that in swamps, and it spends most of its life buried in the mud and hiding. Using the, the six eye-like sensory organs, it can detect minute movements in the water and vibrations on nearby land. It will then forcibly, forcefully leap out of the water and suck up its prey to feed. With its entire, entirely cartilage, cartilaginous skeleton and somewhat primitive features, like its round, chinless mouth, it appears to be some sort of primeval creature. 
Leave it out overnight and drain the mud from the carcass. When ready to eat, cut into rings and then grill over high heat. The more you chew it, the more flavorful it becomes. Then we have the water wraith. Oh no, oh no, the water wraith. A living thing is a living thing, even if it transcends our understanding. This unnerving creature is a translucent and has no actual physical body to speak of. Yet, somehow, it clutches its rollers with zealous devotion. It's both eerie and fascinating. Don't you agree? I do, but it's also just flat out terrifying. All that is known about this creature stems from a few sightings deep underground. All reported sightings feature the same core set of details. A giant, viscous form with a clear, hazy sheen, not unlike her hard candy. One theory holds that it may be the ectoplasmic incarnation of a kind of psychic phenomenon, but as is usually the case with such theories, it is very difficult to prove. All witnesses report being suddenly overcome with fear upon sighting the creature, appro approaching the, a state of panic and near insanity. In fact, every report contains an inordinate amount of extreme, vague details, which has led to suspicions that exhaustion and fear have caused some simple natural phenomenon to be viewed as a living creature. Wow, I know that they've mentioned like you know it may be just being from like a different like universe or reality. Inedible, known to cause mass hysteria, followed by leg spasms and internal thunderings. <laughs> this one I can totally understand how it's inedible. The Smoky Prog, also another terrifying one. In the night above ground or the dark passages below, you'll suddenly notice an egg. If you leave the egg alone, a being of terror is born out of it. A mysterious fiend dragging itself along, but I feel like this misunderstood deer may be trying to communicate with us. Perhaps its tail is a sad one. The smoky prog's body is constantly deteriorating, so collecting a living sample has proven difficult, and research into the species has progressed at a glacial state or glacial rate. However, by examining the genes adhered to the smoky prog's eggs, it has been confirmed that they are in fact mamuta eggs. This discovery allows for the possibility that mamuta do, that do not develop properly and hatch become smoky progs. If, hypothetically, a mamuta were to remain above ground at night and absorb glow sap, that might impact the nutrients le nutrient levels in it within its egg's yolk. That change could lead to the embryo's in inviability or break down its enzymes. Then, maybe. Egg tastes best when smoked. The flavor of the belly and the head is pleasantly alarm oh, pleasantly warming. <laughs> okay, the ancient sire hound. Whoa, here we go. This, is, of course, is sort of the final boss of the game. <laughs> I mean, it's definitely the final boss. A coat that's dense and rough like a primeval forest. A stench like a wet canine and a shockingly toasting body temperature. Clearly a dog in every sense. The long history of dogs being companions we can rely on triggers the, an instinctive reaction through our entire bodies. If I were left on this planet with this massive cutie, I'd be content. If we harvest mesenchymal stem cells from this gigantic canine creature and cultivate them with glow sap, the generated serum could, should return Ochi's leafified tail to normal once administered. These results would indicate that 99.9% .9 of the canine creature's DNA matches Ochi's, and that the only difference between Ochi and Moss may be the natural presence of or absence of a leaf tail. If these two theories prove to be true, it would suggest the possibility that this ancient creature is a common ancestor to two canine species from vastly remote star systems, and that, perhaps, per there are even more hidden secrets out there that could hint at a fascinating yet inconceivable truth the universe has yet to reveal. Whoa, what could that be implying? I don't know, now I want to know more. When's Pikmin 5 coming out? <laughs> The ultimate ride, plush and comfortable. I wish I could bring it home with me. Oh, Louie doesn't want to eat this one. That's actually so cute. All right then, so um, next up we have Moss. So it looks like we're getting close to the end of this final. It's taken me several hours. Here's um, Moss, but uh, read it. Ochi and Moss are two peas in a pod. It's quite unprecedented that a space dog should meet such a similar creature on a far off unknown planet. You could even call it miraculous. Could they be siblings separated at birth? No, j that's just not possible. As far as I can tell, Moss has been a leafling pup since birth, and some of her DNA resembles that of the Pikmin. This is the one point in which she differs from Ochi. When Ochi transformed from a standard space dog into a leafling pup, it started. To, I started to theorize that the Pikmin are, in some capacity, propagating their DNA in other organisms. The ph phenomenon in which all these castaways, including myself, became leaflings was very likely caused by it being absorbed into the onion. Perhaps that process was also some sort of Pikminification of the body. 
pigmentified organisms can't leave this planet, so the Pikmin may have been motivated to carry out this process in an effort to secure a permanent leader. Of course, this is all a theory. A very scary theory, actually. <laughs> Convenient for producing and procuring ingredients, compact with a tight turning radius. Once again, another creature Lulu actually is too attached to to eat. Red Pikmin. These peppy little darlings are a vivid scarlet red. As you can tell by their appearance, these critters are very passionate. In fact, they're such hot heads that they're immune to fire. Even their displays of affection are, in, are ardent. They'll beat their tiny fists on, on you in an abundance of enthusiasm. Pikmin are a part of the Ambulodysis class, which consists of, a, of creatures that exhibit both plant and animal characteristics. A Pikmin will instinctively follow whoever plucks it from the ground, so it is quite common for them to form symbiotic relationships with another species or accept the leader of a different species, as it serves the goal of propagating their own species as a whole. The red Pikmin is the most common Pikmin species. It can be identified by the nose-like protuberance on its head and its highly aggressive behavior. It also has a few surprising and unique qualities. For example, its immunity to extreme heat and fire. Despite the fact that it's a living organism, this can be explained by looking closely at its skin and muscle fibers, which are made up of a flame-resistant cellulose. Looks like a Pikpik carrot. I bet it tastes good, but I'm practicing self-restraint. <laughs> Yellow Pikmin. Look at the extraordinarily big pointy ears on the adorable yellow Pikmin. I doubt you can whisper a secret they won't hear. Try throwing one, and they can easily retrieve objects for you from places you can't reach. Also, electricity doesn't face them at all. They're shockingly useful little guys. It's generally believed that the Pikmin body was originally the root of a plant that has evolved over centuries, if not millennia, developing structures analogous to muscles, neural network networks similar to those of a brain, and more. However, yellow Pikmin possess a perfect resistance to electricity, a force which actually poses extreme danger to other organisms. Oddly enough, this species of Pikmin actually seems to enjoy electricity. Their flowers even bloom when they are exposed to an electric current. This fact would lead one to believe that their neural transmission methods are quite different than our own. This species often uses the ear-like lamella on its head to soar to great heights and dig holes. When I look at it, all I see is ears. Blue Pikmin. It wouldn't be overstating to say that the watching these Pikmin navigate the water with the grace of a fish is one of the most lovely things to behold on this whole planet. But if you really want to see them swimming, you'll need to offer them some live bait. The accepted theory is that Pikmin evolved from terrestrial root vegetables, and so would be unable to breathe underwater and subsequently drown. Yet the blue Pikmin possess a gill resembling a mouth on their head, which enables them to be active underwater. While on land, they leaf and flower like other Pikmin species, and they breathe through the stomata on their skin, indicating that they must be naturally amphibious. Pigment proteins on the surface of their body essentially perform the same photosynthetic process as cyanobacteria, or cyanobacteria, for example, which is what gives them their striking color. I look at that mouth and want to put it, put my hand in it, just to see what would happen. <laughs> Louis is so silly. Rock Pikmin. Rock Pikmin may be rugged and craggy in appearance, but their well-polished skin is cool and smooth to the touch. Those dark, shiny stone bodies are built for defense, and they're capable attackers too. And did you notice those stubby little legs? Aren't they the cutest? This species is definitely a member of the Pikmin genus, but its body does not share any of the plant-like traits that Pikmin are known for. Instead, it's composed primarily of stone. The stone is actually the chosen host for a parasitic subset of Pikmin, species nicknamed Hermikmin. <laughs> That's cute. Similar to how a seed can sprout and push through the cracks of a rock, the Pikmin's roots stretch deep into the stone, storing its vital organs in an exterior cavity that resembles a crystal geode. Because the species displays characteristics common in parasitism, one can hypoth hypothesize that the rock onion and rock candy pop bud stockpile stone that will eventually host the rock Pikmin. I think I broke a tooth on one of these. <laughs> Poor Louie. Winged Pikmin. These peculiar little flyers look like they're wearing goggles. Don't be put off by their odd appearance, though. Places that seem like dead ends, such as treacherous roads, lakes, swamps, and sheer cliffs, are nothing to them with when they're not carrying anything. With a few flaps of their tiny wings, they flit over the air like fierce fairies. 
The wings on the back of this flying Pikmin species closely, closely resemble the wings you would find on a flying creature. It's possible that an ancient winged on onion somehow absorbed a flying creature's DNA, and which then resulted in the precursor to the winged Pikmin transforming into the species we recognize today. If this theory is correct, the onions might also be serving the role of the messenger, transmitting new traits and characteristics to their Pikmin. I once had a dream that I was abducted by a winged specimen. <laughs> oh no. Ice Pikmin. With the frigid air swelling up endlessly from inside their icy bodies, they can freeze anything at all. If you throw enough of them in a pond, they'll freeze the surface so solidly that you can walk right across it. They're just like little ice wizards. Pikmin supposedly evolved from plants, yet there's also Pikmin species with bodies made of ice, no, known as Ice Pikmin. How is this possible? The answer to this question lies in the fact that the Ice Pikmin are parasitic by nature, and the ice serves as their host. The composition of the, this type of ice is, predictably, mostly water, but it resembles saline solution with faint concentrations of trace sodium ions, potassium ions, and calcium ions that function as neural transmitters. Interestingly, the ice exhibits no visual signs of melting or dripping when exposed to sunlight. This is due to its low temperature core, which continuously creates more ice in order to maintain a consistent size. A kitchen essential used for freezing ingredients and storing leftovers. And then the white Pikmin. These tiny white Pikmin can dart about quite swiftly. Their bold red eyes are charming as though uh, as they are startling. Like a flower that has sharp thorns, these cute little ones possess a potent poison. Such small critters need to be tough to survive. White Pikmin are born through a color changing process within white candy pop buds, which only grow underground. The poison within its body is a type of diterpene alkaloid similar to a toxin often found in certain plant roots. If ingested, it can lead to vomiting, respiratory distress, and com complete organ failure, ultimately resulting in death due to cardiac arrest. Though strong, this poison also has medicinal uses, sometimes going by the name asinite, or aconite, something like that. Uh, the Pikmin are ambulorodices and evolved from plants, but it seems some species retain more of their plant-based evolutionary heritage than others. Not meant to be ingested, best used as bait. <laughs> Purple Pikmin. It's a profoundly heavy feeling holding a living thing in your arms. It can be overwhelming to realize that this thing is really alive. That said, these little ones have a density to them that makes them extremely heavy. To hold them all is difficult, but don't worry, they're strong enough that they can hold you. <laughs> Slightly larger in size, purple Pikmin can weigh up to 10 times as much as the other Pikmin species, and when thrown to the ground, their impact creates gravitational waves that can actually warp space-time. It's astonishing. The density of their muscle fibers is also much higher than that of other Pikmin, allowing them to transport 10 times as much weight as their average size counterparts. Their rich purple color is derived from strong polyphenol antioxidants. Like white Pikmin, they are born from underground candy pop buds, and no related onions have been discovered so far, but I think somewhere underground, deep among the relics of the past, a purple onion is waiting to be discovered, and we have discovered it! Very heavy. Tenderizing the meat would be way too difficult. Onions, the majesty of nature, the mystery of life. I feel that these stale cliches can't fully express the extraordinary symbiotic relationship between Pikmin and onions. Is there a connection here of an affectionate nature, perhaps? There's so much we still don't know. Sometimes it lies dormant, much like a bulb, but dig it up from the ground and and provide it with the right stimulus, for example, a good hard shake, and it will activate sprouting three root-like legs. It serves a similar similar a role similar to a nest or an incubator for the Pikmin, absorbing pellets or the bodies of dead creatures for their nutritional value, and then propagating Pikmin the same color as itself. Onions also seem to be greedily seem to greedily attempt to replicate certain characteristics of the matter that they absorb by combining with or absorbing other onions, sometimes of the same type. It's been confirmed that just like Pikmin, an onion has muscle fibers in its body, and though it is un unable to walk, it is capable of a small range of motion. However, when one breaks down the biological matter it has absorbed, a fuel similar to bioethanol is crea created. Onions spray this fuel out of the mouths on their underbellies and are able to fly using flower-like propellers for stabilization. If you look closely, you'll see the legs are sprouting a dense layer of hair. And the floor lick. Dice finally. Great, great. Sauteed oil. I can barely stand the grumbling in my tummy right now. 
But when you see one of these shiver or twitch, you'll realize that this is a living thing, and we must treat it with consideration as such. I thought I was reading Louis there for a moment. While it doesn't sprout or create Pikmin, this specimen is still a type of onion. A bulb like this can be divided into seven segments. It's highly nutrient dense and contains strong energizing and allolepidic effects. The compounds responsible for its characteristic smell resemble onion growth hormones when absorbed by an onion. It fulfills a critical role in Pikmin prolifer pro proliferation by increasing the total number of Pikmin that can be withdrawn from the onion at any given time. Just like onions, it contains muscle fibers, but floralic has no animalistic qualities to speak of. However, if you place one near an onion, it may start to move a bit, as though it's trying to roll over so it can be absorbed. Saute in oil and add a fragrant spice to your dish, but eat too much and you'll smell, smell like it for days. <laughs> okay, so um, now we have candy pop bud. The longer I look at it, the more I feel a strange urge to throw something into it. So coming to the intrusive thought, I once threw a bomb into one. When I did, Tui, it spit the bomb right back out. I can't help seeing some sort of lifelike response in that. Well, it looks like the interior of a flower is actually a insectivorous leaf that developed into an organ. This organ releases a sweet scent from its central pistil, luring small insects into its interior and trapping them. The DNA of those captured organisms is directly absorbed by the plant's cells which might indicate that this species is attempting to evolve at an astounding speed. But in most cases, the cells essentially self-destruct. The bud then releases pigment seeds of the same color, and the plant withers. Muscle fibers extremely similar to those of an onion were also found in this species, so one could hypothesize that a candy pop bud is under or undeveloped onion. However, there aren't enough details to confirm this theory either way. Okay, let's see. Uh, Louis, way too spicy for a salad, no matter what color, but you use. Pellet Posy. The pellet cradled in its petals changes colors like some form of chameleon, aligning to match the color of nearby Pikmin. It's almost as though it's inviting us to come harvest it to make more. Even though it appears to be helping out, it's really just using us to spread its seeds. Seeds. Um. In the stem of the pellet posy, one can observe a muscle fiber unique to half plant, half animal species, such as the pigment and candy pop bud flowers. So the pellet posy is a species that can be considered a close relative. Although the capability to crystallize nectar is unique to a small group of the pellet weed family, the fact that these plants reach maturity so quickly and that their pellets contain such high concentrations of the natural nutrients in the soil explains why the Pikmin and so many of the other native species are so reliant on these pellets for sustenance. On a quest for the perfect hors d'oeuvre, slow cook this plant in a wood fire oven, but be careful to only serve the tender pellet. And we have the burgeoning spiderwort. This fruit, unlike the pellet, is juicy and pulpy. What's more, that's not just any juice inside it. There's a super spicy spice in there. <laughs> Eating spicy things can be a fun way to jumpstart our taste buds. Perhaps this, the Pikmin in this world like to spice things up as well. Like the pellet posy, while nectar is its primary source of nutrients, this burgeoning spiderwort produces fruit with high amounts of a super spicy compound. Both this plant and the pellet posy are part of the pellet weed family, but the spiderwort does not crystallized nectar because of the different fungi that, that parasitize its roots. Instead, it produces alkaloids that contain those extra piquant compounds. The alkaloids are then extracted and collected by way of the plant's fruit. Whether or not a plant produces super spicy or super sweet compounds seems to depend on the type of fungus with which it interacts. Dry out the fruit and grind into a fine consistency, perfect for adding a touch of spice. We got the glow Pikmin up next, my favorite type of Pikmin. <laughs> Here you are, far from home, stranded on a strange planet with a night even more dangerous than the unforgiving day. But in that night, the faint, gentle light given off by these gloriously glowing little beans brings hope to our adventures. That shine is a beacon of life that we recognize in our hearts. Although they have been named glow Pikmin, it's not entirely clear whether or not this species is actually a type of Pikmin. These creatures possess the same fundamental behaviors of Pikmin, like carrying things, propagating, and fighting. They also share special characteristics, such as the leaf atop their head, yet they do not spawn from the onion, but a luminal, and that they are only active at night or underground. During the day, they revert into seeds and enter a resting state. 
What's even more surprising is that they exhibit no signs of life. When a gold Pikmin dies, if that word can even be used, it does not expire in the typical sense. Instead, it just becomes a form of light, or perhaps a photon, and returns to the luminal. Putting aside my scientist hat for a moment, it seems to me that this creature or entity may not be a living organism at all, but some manner of spiritual substance. Whoa, does not, doesn't smell alive. I like Louie's way of putting it. And then we got the Luminol. Nature is a high risk, high reward type of environment. The Luminol braves the danger, risking self-destruction to emit a light that lures creatures so it can propagate more glow Pikmin and glow pellets. But is that all? Could the glow sap also be luring us? Besides the fact that they serve as incubators and nests for glow Pikmin, we know very little about the Luminol's ecology. When nocturnal cre creatures die, a Luminol can break them down into glow pellets through its strong dissolving enzymes. This matter, when condensed, becomes glow sap. One might assume glow sap is then extremely dangerous substance, but it is ha has hardly any negative effects. In fact, it has administered to me personally as a curative medicine to break down growing leaves. Luminals will only appear in places where an onion was located earlier in the day, and since they propagate glow pikmin, one could surmise that they are are rhizomes from those onions. Perhaps using it, its dissolving powers, it returns the nectar that supports the ecosystem back to the soil. Smells a lot like an onion. The green juice is particularly delicious. Dwarf Bulborb. Oh wait, so that's all of them. Okay, we did it. 125 entries all read through. It only took me like, what, three hours? <laughs> I don't know. It took forever. Oh my goodness. How could you possibly pull yourself away from these charming creatures? Come see me when you're ready to take another look. I think I've had my fill, but we're technically not done. That was everything in the Piclopedia. Of course, we can go in there and we can battle creatures again at any point in time and do stuff like that, but I don't really feel like I need to do that. Instead, I want to take a look at the treasure catalog, which should definitely be shorter. I miss looking at new treasures, really. I'm absolutely itching to evaluate fresh finds of great value. All right, so let's see what treasures we have. I don't know if these will have any descriptions like the, the enemies or the creatures had, but I guess I'll take a quick look to see. You, of course, can get a deeper look at everything here. But um, there are notes by each of them. <laughs> so yes, oh my goodness, and there's 239 of them. So we are definitely not done. There's so much more to read. Do they really all have descriptions? Oh my gosh. Okay, so let's start reading through all the treasure catalog. This is gonna take me a while. So I figure we'll just get started with it. First with the notes of the Universal Rubber Cutie. Have you ever laid eyes on something more adorable? I, for one, have not. Gazing upon its features fills me with, is it admiration, awe? Well, whatever it is, I recommend everyone open their eyes and their hearts to the sublime and squeaky being. The first time I laid eyes on this treasure, I thought it was a giant aquatic monster. It took me a few paralyzing seconds to realize that it's just a statue. What a relief. If such an attractive creature were to attack me, I'd be too entranced to run away. And then this thing is huge. It'll take a whole day to eat it in its entirety. I feel like it wouldn't taste good. All right, next up we have the planetary rubber cutie. Look at those adorable features and darling proportions. This creature may be rather medium in size, but that does not mean it is a medium amount of cuteness. No, I'm quite certain it possesses enough cuteness to charm an entire planet. Has well-proportioned facial features and a smooth exterior. Its hollow interior allows it to float on water. I, th I thought long, long and hard about what creature inspired this treasure, and before I knew it, I was petting its beak. I'm powerless in the face of cuteness. Still not sure if it's edible. Also not sure if something can taste as handsome as it looks. And then the stately rubber cutie. Ah, fret not stately rubber cutie. Yes, you may be smallish in size, but that does not matter. Cute is cute. In fact, it's quite possible you're even more cute because of your smallness. Yes, I do believe you are. Compared to the tre other treasures found, uh, this sculpture is tiny, yet with its beak turned courageously upwards and uh, its round eyes brimming with the spirit of adventure, I can't help but admire its gallant image. Beauty really can be found around any corner. These seems like the right portion size for me. And then the dapper rubber cutie. Just look at this fellow, dressed to impress in all black, and impressed I most certainly am. So impressed I can't stop staring. I do hope it'll forgive me. It's just hard to act normal around someone so dapper. It truly is. 
When I was a kid, I coveted a black leather jacket that hung in a shop window. It was so cool. I begged my parents to buy it for me, but they just scoffed in my face. So I saved up my pocket change for months and finally bought it myself. It turns out wearing a leather jacket during the peak of a Hakatate summer is a shortcut to getting a heat, the heat stroke. That was the last time I ever tried to be cool. Oh, poor Olive Art. I like this color. Gives off a chill aura. And then finally, the sweet nimble not. Oh, do we not get like a description for the rubber cutie series? I guess not. Interesting. So we could observe those if we want to. But we're just gonna move on to the sweet tooth series now. Uh, the sweet stumble knot. What a sweet stick this is. Quite literally, this stick here is made of candy from top to bottom. This unexpected combination makes it quite the handy thing to have around. You can use it as a walking stick to prevent yourself from stumbling while hiking or exploring unfamiliar terrain. When all that exertion makes you hungry, you'll find sustenance right there in your hand. A useful invention to be sure. A gigantic, brightly colored stick of candy adorned with a ribbon. My guess is that it was meant to be a gift for a child and would be a great souvenir to bring him back to my own kids. I'll need to keep a close eye on the spaceship's temperature to prevent it from melting during transport. Looking at it is fun, but it tastes much better if you bite right into it. <laughs> Louis seems to be very into the texture of foods. Sweet Torrent. Be warned, if you take a bite of this do doughy raft, you will quickly find yourself awash in a torrential river of sweet cream. Your only choice is to eat, eat, eat as quickly as you can. If you can't keep up, ask someone to throw you a life preserver before it's too late. <laughs> I hear this item was discovered in a bright and open area, unlike caves I've encountered. What's more, it was presented on a large silver plate. I wonder why it was there. Was it a form of entertainment for visiting guests? Or maybe we are the guests. It's near impossible to eat this without losing a drop of cream in the process. I ch challenge I gladly accept. A deceptive snack. This treasure takes a sophisticated palate to appreciate. First, a salty sweet sauce is put atop some kind of white food stuff. It's then fried and topped with a thin black layer of paper? It sounds awful, but it tastes wonderful, surprising in the best way. It's sweet, but not too sweet. Salty, but not overly so. It tastes like something a more refined palate would appreciate, perhaps belonging to someone whose tastes were developed over the course of many years. A crunchy and uncomplicated treat. I guess Louie is one of those people. Cookie of nibbled circles. Someone went to great lengths to first nibble this cookie into a perfect circle, and then to nibble a perfect circle out of the middle of the cookie. The cookie craftsmanship exhibited here, it's mind boggling, really. Stealing a bite of food before it's been served is quite rude, but I understand the impulse. My son and I are always waiting outside the kitchen, itching to try whatever my wife's been cooking. Thankfully, she's she finds it charming, or we'd have to curtail the habit. <laughs> if the missing part is out there somewhere, I will find it, and then I will eat it too. <laughs> cookie of Prosperity. It is said the two colors in this cookie bring good luck to one's family and to one's business. In fact, it was a tradition here for families to gather around the cookie and eat it together. There's even a saying about it, the family that eats a cookie together gets rich together. This pattern always reminds me of our family game nights. We like to play board games, but it would be even more enjoyable if we could eat the boards after. I was curious to know if the flavor was as playful as the design, so I took a bite. Tastes normal. It's like an optical illusion. If I keep alternating by its color, I would never make it to the, to the last morsel. I guess not. Uh, the vanishing cookie. Is it possible for a cookie to be too delicious? It seems it is. This very cookie is so incredibly tasty that it vanishes almost as soon as it, it, it appears. Where it goes, nobody knows. But if you ever want to taste it, you'll have to move fast. Sweets don't simply disappear of their own accord. There has to be some scientific explanation. To test my theory, I've laid out the cookies and I'm waiting. Normally, I'd have to have given in to my urge to eat them, but I must stay strong. There's something about this flavor that makes it impossible to stop eating. Not that I've tried very hard. Love's fortune cookie. Do they love me? Do they not? These are the questions we have all asked ourselves at one time or another. And this cookie has the answer. Simply eat its each tasty petal as you ask your question. What would the answer be? The final bite will tell. Before we got married, my wife took a compatibility test to assess our relationship. It was all for a laugh, but we got 120%, indicating we would be eternally happy together. I don't really believe in all that fortune-telling stuff, but that test got it right. <laughs> That's so adorable. There's only one way to eat this. First, lick up the jam, then eat the buttery petals until it all other remains are crumbs. Then, eat the crumbs. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. 
Hardy Container. The shape of this treasure represents perhaps the most important things there are in the universe, life and love. If you pour your heart into this cookie and give it to someone you care about, it's sure to have a powerful effect on them. My line of work, encountering tough situations and feeling like your life is in danger is all part of the job. But something about this cookie makes me feel like I have the strength to make it through. Like I have an extra heart if my first one runs out. That's so sweet. If you break it in half first, it's much easier to eat. Oh no, Louis a heartbreaker. The jiggle jiggle. Even a, a slight touch will make this treasure jiggle and wiggle in the most wonderful way. Yet for all the seismic stresses, it never collapses. Still, what's even more entr entrancing that the jiggle jiggle's wiggle is, is its taste. The sweetness will make you tremble. Children are fascinated by jiggling objects like this. I know my kids would lose their minds if they encountered this gelatinous tower. I consider myself a mature adult, and even I'm fighting the urge to climb to the top of this jiggling hill. The creamy base is delectable, but alternate, alternate each bite with the brown topping for a more savory experience. Interesting. The SS Berry. This spaceship was clearly styled to look like a cake with a fruit atop it. I suspect it was specially designed for couples heading to space on their honeymoon. Goodness, I hope no one tries to eat it. This ship might crash in some strange locale. Hardly the ideal like vacation newly let's dream of. At our wedding, our friends gave my wife and me a spaceship shaped cake that looked a lot like this one. It wasn't as big, but it resonated with my dreams of exploring space. Of course, my dreams are slightly different now, but I'm happy to still have my wife by my side. Very filling. <laughs> so Louie did end up eating them. We got the SS Peppermint. What a refreshing aroma, and what charming decorations, and, and that gorgeous color too. Popular with the young crowd, this spaceship wakes you up as it whisks you away on a minty fresh journey to another planet. Just don't take a bite out of it, or you'll never make it back. It was weird that they think these are spaceships. One whiff of this brings me back to the long days of summer, eating ice cream with my kids. This fragrance smells like their favorite flavor, bright and refreshing. At first, I didn't want to try it, but my children insisted. Now it's my favorite ice cream flavor too. Aw, a strange way to serve toothpaste. <laughs> it is sort of minty. Um, SS Chocolate. It was th this adorable ship's yummy smell that lured me in. Then, suddenly, I was taking a bite. Lo and behold, I found the ship to be edible. In fact, it's chocolate flavored. I'm still not quite sure how what to make of this discovery. All I know is that it's a delicious one. My wife and I have been together for a long while, but our relationships have never been as perfectly poised as this cake. Maybe it's because I'm always flying around space and she's at home, trying to keep things together. Hmm, we really are due for a date night. You definitely are. The touch of bitterness makes that much easier it, that much easier to eat. Now we got the Unbreakable Promise. Okay, so that was the end of the uh, Sweet Tooth series. Now we have the Dazzle series. The Unbreakable Promise. A hoop topped by a stone made of the hardest substance in the universe. A perfect gift to give when making an unbreakable promise. Though, I am told this stone can in fact be broken. Perhaps then, it's meant to, as a reminder that no promise is truly unbreakable? Very introspective. It's a common practice to present an expensive gift to your intended when you propose. I didn't have the means to do so when my wife and I became engaged. I've always regretted that fact, but at least I still love her as much as I did then. I slipped myself right under the metal archway and took a nice cozy nap. Ah, yeah, I guess there, it is sort of like a soft material that holds the ring there. Golden vaulting table. This shiny table is used in a ceremony meant to bring good luck with money. It works like this. Jump over the table once and make a profit. Jump over it twice and make a fortune. Jump over it thrice and the sky opens and money rains down on you. Or one, or so one hopes anyway. Apparently, if you can jump over this, you'll be blessed with great wealth. I'm not the superstitious type, but I'm tempted to give it a try. I could use the extra cash. The only things standing in my way are poor middle-aged hip joints. Oh no! I bet this would bring in the big bucks. It definitely would. This was the last item we got and it was so difficult to get. The olfactory sculpture. You can't see the, the artistry at work here with your eyes, but take a deep breath and your nose will behold the power of, and beauty at once. One whiff and your heart will light, will light up. Surely this gorgeous olfactory sculpture belongs in an art gallery. It's a multi-century art experience. You've got the flicker of the flame, the texture of the body, and that glorious scent that just melts into your surroundings. It's so soothing and calming. I'm getting a bit sleepy here. Is it a sleep div- <laughs> That he falls asleep. I set it on fire and, melt it, and it melted. It smells yummy, but unfortunately, it's inedible. 
Princess Pearl. It said a king gave this orb to his beloved daughter and that it contains all the wisdoms the princess would need as the next ruler of the land. No, it is not especially flashy. One can presume that's because good leadership is not about flash, but about substance. My daughters loved shiny jewels and trinkets for as long as I can remember. She used to be happy enough with pretty stones and pieces of sea glass, but now all she wants are the more illustrious items like this. That doesn't bode well for my wallet's future. <laughs> this would be a great gift for Nana. She could use something shiny. Always thinking about his Nana, that's so cute. The Sticky Jewel. Not only is this glimmering gem quite beautiful, but the mineral it's composed of is notable for being highly sticky. Often given as a present to a loved one, it represents a bond that is equally adhesive. This gemstone is large, is large, but looks kind of cheap. I've only just started to accept that one day someone might propose to my own daughter with a gift like this. I know I should probably give that person a warm welcome, but I already don't like them. Oh no. I'm pretty sure this jewel is a fake. I think it's actually candy. Hoop of healing. Step through this glowing blue hoop and you will be and you will feel its healing effects almost at once. Exhaustion is gone. Elements of the heart and body are banished. You have but to make the choice to step right through it. I read somewhere that some colors can have certain effects on your body. This color seems to calm my mind and help me recover my composure when I'm feeling frazzled in the field. It is an almost healing effect. I stepped inside the circle and spun it all around me. <laughs> Alright, next up we have the uh, Hoop of Passion. Is your relationship missing the spark it once had? Are you stuck in a rut with the one you love? This hoop can help. Step through the glowing pink light and feel the passion return. The warmth that shines upon you is sure to remind you of the day you met. The science of colors intrigues me. For example, I can feel my instincts sharpen and my zest for life intensify when I gaze upon this hue. What would happen if I were to walk through this ring with my wife? Perhaps its powers could reignite the spark between us. Seems viable for a ring toss. A uh, hoop of fortune. Do you ever wish you had good luck? With this hoop, you need not wish. Step through its glowing yellow center and good fortune is sure to follow. Of course, for this to work, it helps if you believed it was going to work in the first place. People tend to gather with those who are like-minded and eventually they become friends and partners. If you want to build a circle of good friends, you must be the kind of person who's a company you enjoy. Then you find companionship with yourself as well. Maybe walking through it brings you good luck. Um, and now we have, I guess this is another series. Yep, this is the Recreation Recollection series, starting with the, uh, the Tandem Trainer. Exercise is good for many things. It not only makes us stronger, it also helps us live healthier lives. So grab each of this exercise machine's handles and squeeze as every muscle trains at the effort. Take comfort knowing you're adding good things to your life. I am no longer trying to catch anyone's eye, but as the sole breadwinner, I need to prioritize my health so I can support my family for years to come. The problem is, I'm so busy supporting them, there's not a lot of time left for push-ups. We'll see how it all turns out. Apparently, I should be able to lift this pretty easily, but I gave up after my first try. <laughs> Interesting. Sphere of Fuzzy Feelings. Put your hands on the surface of this sphere and don't be surprised if you find yourself awash in waves of fuzzy Im imagery. The surface texture recalls the warmth of a fall sweater, the feel of grass on a summer day, and the prickly thrill of a hard fall victory. Growing up, I wasn't one for chasing balls or shredding tears or shedding tears over a win or a loss, but my passions were equally absorbing. I wonder why this giant fuzzy sphere has me thinking of more youthful days and what they were like for the inhabitants of this planet. I like to imagine I'm petting a soft little green creature. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, the orbital communication sphere. This communication sphere has fallen from its place orbiting the planet. Note how the bumpy surface was designed to maximize transmissions. A pity that it is no longer functioning. Hmm, perhaps a blow with a charge, with a large stick could launch it back into orbit. Its hard outer shell could withstand severe environments, but the inside appears to be unexpectedly soft. The geological layers are breathtaking. If I had to guess, I'd say this is a scale model of a celestial body. I just can't explain why I want to hit it with a stick. Hold it tightly between your arms and roll. Feels amazing. Interesting. So I always love their different interpretations of these objects that obviously aren't quite what they think they are. 
Orb of Destruction. There is something about this orb that makes one want to hit it with a stick in a moment of joyful abandon. Of course, such behavior is sure to spell trouble. I can see it now. The orb's in flying through the air only to crash through the window of a neighboring home. Then the neighbor, failing to appreciate the gleeful inno innocence of the moment, unleashes a good old fashioned tirade. No, no, or no, no matter how fun it may seem, do not send this orb sailing through the air. I can verify that there are indeed 108 stitches on this ball. I counted them myself. The process took me all night to complete. As an explorer, it's important to question things in order to survive, but I should be careful not to overdo it. I can smell the salty remnants of sweat and tears on this thing from a mile away. And then, that was it for the Recreation Recollection series. Now we have the Gimme Gimme series. So the Gimme Gimme series starts with the uh, greed inducement device. The spine tingling snap created by this object stimulates feelings of greed within anyone in earshot. The reasons behind this are unknown. Perhaps it reawakens a primal sensation hidden in the depths of our hearts. But this is mere conjecture. When I hear the sound this makes, the word paycheck immediately comes to mind. It's followed quickly by the image of my wife's face and her voice reciting our monthly household budget in full. Food, tuition, medical bills. The list goes on and on and... Oh no. What a pleasant rattling sound. I could listen to it all day. We got the Disc of Joyous Wisdom. Do not be fooled by its silence. You're in the presence of the most intelligent life form in the known universe. Based on its appearance, it's clear that this creature can exude feelings of joy and delight. It was likely at the center of many social gatherings long ago. Whenever I hear a joyful song, I'm transported back to my family celebrations with live music and dancing. I see my family, all dressed to the nines, looking at me with silly expressions on their faces. I hope to witness that again one day soon. I cannot but wonder why this isn't a rice cracker. Disc of Angry Wisdom. Better keep an eye out when eye out when in close proximity to this sentient disc. Apparently, it has a bit of an anger management problem. Further details about its tendency to lash out have been lost to time, which makes it all the more intimidating, doesn't it? A few years ago, my wife suspected I had betrayed her in some way and or another, and was furious at me. She was so enraged she could have turned the whole world upside down. It was terrifying and comforting to know I still ignited such passion within her. Getting angry is a good way to spur your appetite. <laughs> Disc of Sorrowful Wisdom. In moments of sorrow, sorrow, it may be helpful to consult with this unusually intelligent life form. Empathy is one of the highest forms of intelligence, so this disc surely has more than enough to share with you. You may not be able to hear its wisdom, but you will feel it. What is the purpose of emotions? They give our lives meaning and balance. One cannot survive a life of pure sorrow, so we must find delight in things. A life of pleasure would become monotonous, so we should appreciate the bad as much as the good. <laughs> that is some very good advice. Suddenly, I miss Nana, and I'm overcome by all these sad feelings. Aw. <laughs> Disc of Amusing Wisdom. Sometimes you wake up and decide that today will be unlike every other standard issue today. Today, you tell yourself, will be filled with fun and amusement. And what could be more amusing than dancing? Why, nothing. On days like this, simply grab this disc and get your groove on. Swing it around with abandon. Yes, soon enough, you will have to return to life as usual, but I promise it's okay to let your inner rhythm take you away on occasion. I may not be the most graceful dancer, but who really cares? I like to let the music take over and allow my body to go with the flow. Sometimes my wife and I will be freestyling, and it looks like so much fun the kids forget to be embarrassed and can't help but join in. Riding dogs is fun. That was such a cute entry by all three of them. Disc of Surprising Wisdom. Should you ever find yourself stunned beyond words, though this wise creature will be a true friend to you. Let its waves of knowledge wash over you and bring about a deep inner calm. Indeed, there's something soothing about simply being in its presence. My son is a known prankster and likes to catch my wife and me by surprise. One time, he leapt out from behind a garden gnome, and my wife jumped so high in surprise that she threw out her back. Since then, we've established strict household no surprises policy. The first time I was licked by a dog, I thought it was going to eat me. And then uh, that was the end for the Gimme Gimme series. Now we have the Modern Amenity series. Oh, wrong button. Okay. Uh, store your valu valuables in this bag for guaranteed peace of mind. Of course, that's easier said than done. Its defenses make it impregnable and virtually impossible to break. But that's only a problem if you want to see your possessions ever again. How many times have I heard my family complain about a jar that won't open, or a door that won't open? And there I'm saying, just run it under some hot water, or 
push, don't pull. However, I've tried both in this bag and, I, and it literally cannot be opened. If I had to guess, there's something really valuable hidden inside. It's interesting that they think it's a bag and not something that would lock a bag. <laughs> Floral instigator. Feeling down, then simply shake this stick at a dormant tree and its flowers will immediately come to life. You may ask how this is possible, but mysterious and ancient technology is beyond our comprehension. Simply put, it's magic. Let's just leave it at that, shall we? When a flower blooms on a dead tree, it is nothing short of, an, of a ph phenomenon. I've also witnessed flowers bloom on a Pikmin's head after they drink nectar. I suspect this stick shares the same rejuvenating property exhibited by other life forms on this planet. Proved very useful when I stuck it in the ground to mark a spot I wished to return to. Fastening item. This item would have been placed between two objects and used to connect them. It's not clear what these objects might have been, but something such as this would have done the job jilly and aptly. At least, that's my best guess. This one time, when I was a kid, my parents had a big fight and refused to speak to each other. I went back and forth, mediating until the argument was resolved. I'd like to say it was for the sake of their love, but I was just tired of waiting for dinner. <laughs> Could be useful for plating food. The holes might be a problem, but otherwise it's perfect. Trap lid. What you see here is a cover used to disguise a pit or trap. Probably has a way to catch small animals. The, prob the, the people of this planet hunted in groups and used their cunning to develop this system. Another proud example of civilization and its infinite wisdom. I've found that this planet is riddled with underground caverns and passageways. I love to explore this place, but it feels like I'm in constant danger of falling into a hole. This lid must have been used to warn previous inhabitants of nearby pitfalls. I think this might be money. Hopefully, I'll be able to click some more. See, it's interesting because they always approach all these objects as if the previous inhabitants were the same size they were, when we know that's not really the case. A round raft meant for a single occupant. It floats using the water's surface tension. Those holes in the middle allow the passenger a delightful glimpse of the water below. Then again, one might consider plugging those holes if one is worried about the raft taking on water. It is the perforated raft. I'd equipped the underside of this raft with float so that it hovers above the water surface, making it possible to sail without it sinking. Uh, then I'd plug the holes with magnifying lenses so I could peer underwater safe safely. That'd be cool. The more I look at, the tastier it gets. Interesting. A uh, gift of friendship. Whoa, is this a part of the same thing it is? Okay, this is the last one. And this is of course what we got for defeating the final boss. Uh, gift of friendship. Dogs have been our dear and most faithful companions since the dawn of civilization. This necklace represents that ancient and honorable bond, both physically and spiritually. A well-worn necklace such as this is the mark of a friendship like no other. The lovely patina on this piece uh, is evidence of a deep bond between this dog and its companion. A dog never truly forgets their owner, and an owner will remember the dog for life. Eternal truths such as this transcend all times and galaxies. The spikes give it the extra little something. I bet this dog was a comfy form of transport. I mean, you would know you've ridden that dog. All right, next up we have the Memory Fragment series, which I can't entirely tell what it makes. It looks like a picture of some kind of dog. Very cute, very cute. Uh, I don't know if there's a way to put them all together, but uh, Memory Fragment top left. This is where the mystery begins. See, it's a fragment of something bigger. Yes, a massive photo panel broken into pieces. But why? The only way to find out is to put the pieces together again. The clues here tell me this belongs in the top left corner. The vastness of space and the unknown it contains is an unsolvable puzzle. At the start of each voyage, I set out to unravel every mystery and discover great truths. But I always find myself returning with more questions than answers. Nana always told me you should build something from the outside in. That's a good idea. Memory Fragment Topish. This is merely one part of a much larger picture. As for why this image was broken into pieces, well, I suspect it's because it needed to be safely transported, perhaps to an art gallery even. Once assembled, it won't, I won't be surprised to find a masterpiece. At Hakatate Freight, we often divide up our cargo in order to use the ship's space more efficiently. Big companies have huge transporters to fill up, but that also means a lot less flexibility. They're still filling up their gigantic ships while we're out making deliveries. Reminds me of a meal I had once. Now I'm drooling. <laughs> Interesting. Memory fragment, top, probably? 
Surely there's a reason this image was broken into fragments. Could it be a treasure map? Did someone split the map into pieces and hide the bits? Is today the day I strike it rich? Ah, perhaps I shouldn't count my fortune before it's found. As a boy, I would spend days drawing elaborate treasure maps. The buried treasure may have been junked most, but to me it was precious. Is this the fragment of a treasure map? I doubt it, but the subject of this drawing was probably a treasure to the artist. Mmm, soup. At least, it looks like soup. It sort of does. Memory fragment top right. This mysterious fragment appears to be the top right part of a giant photo. Could it be a picture of a precious moment in time? But why would such a thing be broken into pieces? Was someone trying to hide something? I must see all the pieces, I must know. I understand the instinct to hide something precious to you, though the word protect is probably more apt. I feel similarly about my family. I do everything in my power to give them a safe, happy life. It's a simple desire, but it motivates me to carry on. Wouldn't want to hit your head on that edge as sharp as this is. That's for sure. Memory fragment left edge. Do I see a face in this picture fragment? Is that part of a smile I see? No, it couldn't be. Or could it? Oh my. I feel like I'm going to see whatever it is in my dreams. I don't really see what they're mentioning. I mean, I see the little part in the bottom right, but it doesn't look like a smile. This looks just like the kind of pictures you get when you left a kid, w let a kid play with, with a camera. Blur blurry and too close up to see anything. I deleted all those pictures my kids took to free up memory space, but now I wish I hadn't. Imperfect memories could be the most precious. I'm getting strong chocolate vibes. Memory fragment center left, and here's a better picture of the dog. Such a wise eye staring out at me. Yes, this certainly looks like the face of a deeply intelligent creature. And it's the strangest feeling. I feel like I know this animal well, and even though I've never seen it before. I hope I get some answers once all the pieces are found. This makes me think of my dog, Bulby, back at home. I'm away for work quite a bit, so we've gone long periods without seeing each other. Yet, every time I come home, he treats me as if I never left. He may be the wisest and most loving member of the family. Aw, reminds me of a dog. I'd like to take it for a ride. We've got the memory fragment center right. That dark pupil staring out at me. It's as if I can see right through me. Through anything and anyone. Truly, it has the power to know my deepest secrets. Eh, good thing I don't have anything to hide. No, really, I don't. Okay, stop looking at me like that. This unknown organism bears a strong resemblance to the dogs on my planet. I'm amazed that such a similar species could exist in the far reaches of outer space. I've heard that organic components can travel through space on meteorites and comets. Could there be a connection between my planet and this one? It looks a lot like a dog. I'm not sure how comfortable it would be to ride. Uh, memory fragment right edge. What do I see here? Is it nothing? Is it everything? I feel like it could be anything. Maybe this fragment is part of the ceremony in which the participants break up a photo of a beloved deity so that they can better share it with one another. Yes, that must be it. As a young boy, I collected rocks and shiny objects that I held quite dear. My parents always wanted me to get rid of them, but I refused. I can't even remember where I found them all. I probably picked up most of them right in our backyard. I'm still not sure why I was so attached to a bunch of gravel, but they shone like diamonds to me. No idea what this is. It definitely, it, it is definitely inedible. <laughs> Memory fragment bottom left. Two flat sides and a corner. Could this fragment belong in the bottom left position or does it go up above in the top right spot? No, my gut instincts say bottom left. Sometimes your gut is all you have to go on and go you must. As a child, there were many times I'd come across something unknown to me and intuitively investigate without hesitation. It worked out well for me, I believe. As an adult, I often overthink matters, so maybe I need to rec recapture that daring spirit of my youth. Licked it, but it didn't get, get a lot of flavor. Guess it's not a cracker. <laughs> and the memory fragment, bottomish. We can ask ourselves why this photo was broken into small, indiscernible fragments, but perhaps the answer is that there is no answer. It pains me to say that, for those of us who try to make sense of the world, this sort of thing keeps us up at night. Why are there? Why are things the way they are? The answer can be surprisingly simple. For example, my kids will often dismantle a clock or a chair, or tear up a piece of bread just because they can. Maybe there's no significant reason that this picture is in pieces either. I fit my, my head into one of those little openings. Felt better than expected. <laughs> And then finally, I think maybe there might be one more after this. Memory fragment bottom, probably? Take a look at this strange treasure. 
notice the gaps and protrusions, I'm certainly, I'm certain they'd mesh well together with something similar, yet different. Maybe this is some sort of key that opens something if you find the piece that makes it whole. Exciting. That little bump at the end makes this look like it has a nose. Noses make me think of my son when he was a baby. He'd often forget my face after I'd been gone for long stints out of work and cry when I got home. But once he knew the distinctive shape of my nose, he recognized me right away. <laughs> I fit my head into one of the little openings. It was underwhelming. <laughs> and then memory, memory fragment bottom right. I'm almost certain one could use these knobs and curves to connect this fragment with other fragments, but why? What would one accomplish with doing such a thing? Quite puzzling, no? Hmm, perhaps the partial picture seen here would become more clear with more fragments. Yes, that must be it. How clever. And though the big picture here remains unclear, the activity itself is clearly quite fun. Did I dream of becoming a glorified delivery man? Or was adventure always my true goal? Given my current circumstances? Who knows? I'm proud to say I've achieved both, but the president might see it differently. Hmm. I'm worried about my annual bonus. Oh no. Hold on to one of the nubs and swing the, the, to create a gentle breeze. Great, so that's all of the memory fragments. Now we have the extravagant breakfast series. This is condensed sunshine. The sweet flavor of the sunseed berry has been condensed and placed into this bottle for safekeeping. So clever, so delicious. But imagine the squabble that breaks out every time this jar is opened. Something this yummy would be the envy of everyone at the table. This scent is dangerously sweet and brings to mind concentrated memories of my wife's adorable smile. But one can't subsist on sweetness alone. You also need solid qualities like trust and patience. Having those is like a big hearty breakfast for the soul. Open the lid for a peek and fell straight in. I've never tasted better. <laughs> the flaky temptation. Flaky layer upon flaky layer of buttery mouth melting dough baked to golden perfection. Indeed, this is temptation in bread form. You'll try to eat a reasonable amount, but some strange force has, whole, has hold of your taste buds and thus reasonable has no meaning. Devastatingly delicious. This is an extremely dangerous food. It's late and airy appearance bellies a rich and indulgent interior. Before you finished one, you're already reaching for the next. Is it even possible to deny such a temptation? And do I even want to? Can be toasted, stuffed with all kinds of fillings and slathered in jam, but it tastes best as is. Cushion cake. Did you know this lumpy cake doubles as a cushion? What a clever idea, no? It's just the right amount of softness and firmness for sitting on. And when you grow hungry, you just take a bite. What a sweet treat it is too. Who knew a cushion could be so satisfying? I nap in the pilot's seat sometimes, but a cushion like this would be a great alternative. The only weird part is that it's edible. Does that mean something or someone could eat right, it right out of from under you? That's a major drawback. For eating, drinking, and napping, just set it on the ground and fill the pockets with juice. Lay down and enjoy. Next up is puzzle snack. Ooh, one of my favorite foods. This snack not only satisfies hunger, but intellectual curiosity too. How do the arms of this snack intertwine like that? Get some friends together and talk over while you nibble away on the problem, the problem itself. You're sure to arrive at the tasty answer eventually. Its shape is mesmerizing. I only wish I could understand how it was sculpted. The, the more I think about it, the hungrier I get. Thankfully, the salty, sweet, pillowy interior is as re-energizing as it is delicious. But then I start thinking again, and the cycle continues. Slightly salty, dip in something sweet to enhance the flavor. <laughs> Definitely. Sphere of desire. Okay, so we finished up there with the extravagant breakfast. Let's take a look at the sacred sphere. Or the sacred spheres, I guess, technically. Sphere of desire. It said this sacred sphere has the power to make the most deeply held desires come true, more so than any other orb in the sacred sphere series. Oh, what greedy wishes must have been wished upon it. Surely the maker of this orb wanted something near unattainable, but who among us hasn't felt such avarice? There's nothing in the universe more interesting than the universe itself. A curious and inquisitive mind will never be satisfied, no matter how much you explore. I hope I feel this way as long as I can. It's important to stay interested in your work. I'll say this to drop in a hole sometime. <laughs> I mean, I guess that is the purpose. The sphere of family. This sphere is, belie is believed to be a patron of families. Parent often, parents often explore it to help their children flourish. And who can blame them? Parents treasure their children, who then treasure their own children. And on and on it goes. Such endless love is a beautiful thing. 
It's often said that you don't realize how much your parents have done for you until it's too late to thank them. I try to show my gratitude and keep in touch as much as I can with video calls, but as soon as my kids pop on screen, my parents forget them there. I like how round and smooth it is. I can't stop touching it. Sphere of Heart. It said there's nothing more difficult to understand than the ways of the heart. It's also said this sphere gives the one who holds it the power to read the heart of the one they love. But is that a good idea? I'm not so sure it is. I know it's impossible to read minds, but I am particularly clueless when it comes to relationships. When we first started dating, my wife was gracious enough to explain how she felt in great detail. I'm still awkward, but any social skills I do have are thanks to her. That's so sweet. I like to have a whole collection of balls like this. They look so nice all lined up. Sphere of Beginnings. When I stare at this sacred sphere phrases like fresh start, new life, and clean slate float before my eyes. The Sphere of Beginnings is revered for its power to open doors and sprout fresh opportunities. It, it reminds us that a new chapter is always a page, just a page away. I've never minded having to start or pick up my life at the flip of a switch. My environment and those in my social circle might change, but as long as I have my family with me, I'll still be me. They always call me out when I'm acting totally weird. <laughs> Fun to roll. A Sphere of Vitality. Like those of us today, the ancient civilization here prized good health, but it was harder to come by in the olden times, and so this orb became a powerful charm for bringing vitality to the young and old alike. Even now, I feel more alive just looking at it. It's become painfully obvious to me that the mind and body are closely linked. Spending so much time away from my family is hard on my mental health, and it, is, and it visibly takes a toll on my body. Even when I eat healthy and exercise, I really miss them makes the most exhilarating and sound when it knocks into something. Sphere of Calm. This sphere was painstakingly polished and then hand-painted in the most calming color possible. The deep green here is meant to bring to mind a lush forest, and in doing so, shoo away the stresses of the day. Go on, gaze upon it. As the stress disappears, allow a sense of well-being to take its place. It just occurred to me that I haven't had a checkup in... I'm embarrassed to say how long. You're supposed to do it once a year, but I keep putting it off. Lately, my elbow's been making an odd clicking sound every time I move it. I should get it checked out eventually. <laughs> you definitely should. Uh, would make a nice gift for Nana. She likes pretty things like this. Sphere of Good Fortune. The symbol painted on the surface of, the, of this sphere is believed to bring good luck. The inhabitants here were known to rub the orb beginning in a journey or new undertaking. Did this ritual actually bring them good luck? We shall never know. But let us hope it at least brought them comfort. Getting lost in space is as good as a death sentence. The newest ships have technology that can locate the closest planet and initiate an emergency landing. Yet they still haven't built a navigation system that can detect and avoid incoming meteorites and space trash. Could I stand up and balance on the ball or would I just fall? I must find out. And then Sphere of Trust. The inhabitants used this treasure in ancient ceremonies as a way to foster trust in their deities as well as in their friends and family. Knowing that trust was so important to them as it is to us makes me think that perhaps we aren't so different after all. It's easy to lose someone's trust, despite the fact that it takes so long to build it in the first place. But once you have the trust and support, it's much easier to achieve your goals. I'd rather be able to count on someone I trust than leave it all up the chance. Just looks cool, but totally doesn't know it. And then uh, the sphere of support. This sphere is quite unique. That is, it represents the very core, the pillar, at the center of every loving being. And to keep our pillar strong, this orb bids us to do a simple thing, support one another. What a message. It's one for the ages and the whole universe. I never considered myself to be someone with a lot of inner strength or fortitude, but my wife seems to disagree. I must be playing it way too cool when we're together. Looks lonely, the kind of ball that some, that's at home in the middle of a crowd. And then the sphere of truth. Behold the sublime sphere, a shape this flawless doesn't exist in nature, and so, since ancient times, this orb and others like it have been treated as sacred by the civilization here. Each sphere has its own meaning, and this one represents truth of the deepest kind. This ball is meant to represent truth, but the truth is never truly black or white. It's both subjective and objective, and extremely tricky. I think the color gray would make a sense, of, uh, make, make more sense for this object, or maybe that hideous brown you get when you mix all the paint colors together. I should draw the boss's face on this and roll it far, far away. 
<laughs> and then, of course, that was it for the Treasure um, or the Sacred Sphere series. Now we have the Spring Crop series, starting, of course, with the Sunseed Berry, which we got in Pikmin 3 as well. No matter how down you may be, these tasty bursts of joy are almost sure to turn your mood around. That's because they're happiness in fruit form. As the name implies, they plant seeds of sunny warmth in the middle of your heart, and they grow like an invasive species of happiness. The scent of this fruit tickles my heart for some reason. It makes me think back on summer memories, my wife smiling at me in, sun in the sunlight. She'd probably have a good laugh if she ever read this, but that wouldn't be so bad. I happen to love that sound. Eat them as is or with a dollop of cream. The sweetest juice is concentrated at the tip. Cupid's Grenade. A fruit both powerful and delicate. Reminds me of something I once read. Fate's tapestry has unraveled. Tomorrow weeps. Romance has fallen. Love is madness. To mend the rift between two cross lovers, this is the ultimate weapon in Cupid's arsenal. What a perplexing plant. It appears to be carrying two different types of berries. They must be a rare species of fruit. Both have odd traits. One seems to be a suppressant, while the other is a stimulant. It's not easy to tell which is which. The balance between sweet and sour is almost addictive. I always want, to ju want just one more bite. A searing acid shock. Try eating this fruit when it's green and unripe, and you'll end up with a mouthful of acidic burning. But give it a time to ripen, and it will not only taste sweet on the tongue, but restore your energy and give you the endurance to realize great ambitions. In my youth, I used to power through long night shifts by sucking on sour fruit candy. It somehow energized me to keep and kept me wide awake. I couldn't do that now, even with the candy, but it's an example of how sometimes things turning sour can work out for the best. My face scrunches up into a little prune every time I eat this fruit, just like Nana's does. Might be genetic. Velvety Dream Drop. This fruit is a treat for the senses. Not only is its bright tear-shaped form pretty to look at, its soft surface is also slightly velvety to the touch. Yes, two senses delighted by one fruit, or as they say, two birds, one stone. Oh dear, speaking of sp stones, do not eat the seeds. They're quite poisonous. When my first child was born, my wife and I would sit outside in the warm spring weather and take turns rocking him in our arms. Those days were filled with endless joy. The sunlight bouncing off his downy hair looked just like this. Whenever I dig into one of these and it's full of big seeds, I feel like nature's pulling another classic bait and switch. Oh no. Astringent clump. It takes a refined palate to appreciate all this fruit all this fruit has to offer. It is at once sweet, sour, bitter, or even spicy. But those capable of pushing through the complex, slightly painful taste experience will find themselves greatly rewarded. The night after I ate this fruit, I had a dream which I saw lots of them growing, clustered together on a tree. If I were able to grow and harvest that many, we'd never run out of food. I suppose we won't have it won't know what's possible until I plant the first seed. Perfect for the moments when all that will satisfy you is a mouthful of bitterness. Wayward Moon. From its artistic cratered exterior to its delicately sweet interior, the Wayward Moon is elegant in fruit form. Mild and aromatic, it would make a wonderful gift for a friend or for someone who just needs a little pick-me-up. Picking the right get well soon gift is notoriously tricky. You're supposed to choose something you think the recipient would enjoy and ignore your own preferences. That's easier said than done. When I can't think of anything good, I usually default to some sort of food, like this fruit. I know I'm always hungry when I'm sick. Scoop out the fresh, uh, the flesh and pour syrup into the shell to make a pool. Add fruit back into the syrup and marinate for at least an hour. Then dive into the sticky juices and devour. It's both a snack and a workout. Whoa. And then the lesser mock bottom. It's true, the rounded surface of this fruit is smooth as a baby's bottom. Meanwhile, the pale yellow flesh inside offers a refreshing flavor profile that is at once sweet and also sour. Really, as fruits go, it has much to offer. One whiff of this fruit will have your mouth watering, but the, the taste itself is sour and slightly disappointing. However, you can't test results like, like this. You can't let results like this keep you from trying out new things. There's no greater quality than an adventurous spirit. Cut the fruit into smaller pieces and crush, squeezing out the juice. Add gelatin to the juice, pour into molds, and refrigerate for half a day. Remove jellies and for, from mold and devour. I like how we're getting back to Louis' uh, recipes. Mock Bottom. What's most impressive about this fruit is the way it's sweet in both flavor and aroma. Meanwhile, its pretty pinkish orange coloring is lovely to behold. Of course, one can't ignore the shapely curves, reminiscent of, uh, good manners dictate I, I, I say no more. 
Suffice to say, the mock bottom is quite a century experience. Extremely sweet, almost too sweet. The flavor makes you feel drowsy with joy, and you want to soak in those joyful juices forever and ever. I may need to limit my intake when it comes to this fruit. To enjoy this fruit, all you need to do is take a big bite and let its sweet juices flood your taste buds. And then the Dawn Pustules. It's difficult to say which aspect of this fruit is more charming, its pretty emerald color, or how easy it is to share with friends. Thankfully, you don't have to choose. Simply gaze upon this gorgeous green hue as you share, uh, share its many orbs at a party. This fruit comes in bunches, so you can keep eating them and never run out. A single berry satisfies my appetite, but I'm grateful to live in a universe with such natural abundance. Don't waste your time peeling these. The texture of the fruit is soft and plump, but the skin adds a nice crunch. Dusk Pustules. Stare at the deep, dark orbs of this fruit and you might fall into a hypnotic trance. But not to worry. The minute you take a bite, you'll be snapped from your reverie by a powerful blast of sweet juice. What a journey it takes you on. You may never want to return. I've noticed that the skin contains a substance with antioxidant properties. That's probably why I feel so fresh and invigorated after I eat one. I wonder how I'd feel after eating two. <laughs> if eating these raw, you'll want to remove the skin to avoid a bitter aftertaste. To make a juice, leave skin on and mash with fruit with your, your feet. Great for working out pent up aggression. The Crimson Banquet. This thing is enormous. It's the size of an asteroid with hard striped skin. It's not very inviting, so what a surprise it was to find it, that its insides are bursting with crimson juice, and seeds too. Plant these in the garden and maybe more tasty asteroids will grow. I look at this fruit and, and am instantly overcome by the urge to pl split it into a million pieces. I closed my eyes to avoid the thought, but the impulse just got stronger. I must be holding onto a deep desire to take on and defeat a giant spherical obstacle. Sprinkle with a hint of salt to enhance its sweetness. And the juicy gaggle. What a charming fruit this is. If it had a personality, I'd say it was cute and bubbly. Such a vibrant and passionate color too. There's just so much to love here, but like love itself, this fruit is delicate, so treat it with care. Numerous pockets of juice clustered around a hollow interior. Much like memories, both sweet and sour, that burst that burst with meaning, yet still cannot fill that empty place in one's heart. Gazing upon this fruit always fills me with regret. Aww. Pull off juice pockets one by one and sip their contents. M macerate the remaining fruit with sugar and enjoy on top of ice cream or yogurt. And that was it for the, uh, the summer fruit series. Let's try out the autumn harvest series. Our first thing in the Autumn Harvest series is the Zest Bomb. A number of fruits look quite similar to this one, but while it may be rather forgettable in appearance, its refreshing fragrance will live in your memory forever. Those with a mature palate should also sample its bitter taste, a zesty experience indeed. Seems to be a citrus lump, but younger and very green. An experience is usually perceived as weakness, but its power should not be underestimated. Many an organization has been improved by a newcomer's creative and untamed energy. Squeeze the juice over fish or meat if you want to diffuse their, their odor. <laughs> Delectable bouquet. Eat this fruit before it's ripe and you'll never do it a second time. Yuck and blech. But you mustn't get angry. Now, let this be a lesson in patience, for you see, those with the discipline to wait until the perfect time to eat the delectable bouquet, they will be greatly rewarded. While observing the plant bear fruit, I was unable to work out where and when the flowers bloomed. I was so frustrated that I couldn't figure out basic botany, but, but all those annoying feelings faded away as soon as I bit into the fruit's sweet flash. Not just a snack, but a cleansing opportunity for your whole body. Try them dried for a chewy treat. <laughs> Portable Sunset. This fruit gets its color by soaking up the rays of each sunset, and though it's quite bitter during its youth, it grows increasingly sweet with age until it's close to perfect as it falls off the branch. Let this remind us all to look forward to our sunset years. This fruit reminds me of a particular sunset I witnessed years ago. My son and I were walking home together one evening and the sun was setting right across our path. I remember it like it was yesterday. It wasn't spectacular in the least, but I'll never forget it. It takes forever to ripen and only a few seconds to eat. One of life's great tragedies, aw. Tremendous Sniffer. The flavor here is mellow and sweet, while the aroma is pure elegance. And speaking of aroma, please observe the, sh the shape. Does this fruit not resemble a nose? It's quite uncanny, I say. One wonders if it can smell its own deliciously aromatic self. 
There's an elegance about this fruit. Its gra graceful curves and subtle flavor bring to mind images of ornate ballrooms, overflowing with cultured guests and blossoming flowers. The simple act of eating it makes it feel a little fancier. Smells divine. Gently press the flesh near the stem to in determine the ripeness. If it's soft, then it's ready to eat. If it's still hard, then you'll have to wait, exercise some patience. And then the crunchy deluge. The amount of moisture contained inside this fruit is quite shocking. Underestimate it, and you might bite down only to find yourself awash in a sea of juice. Be sure to have a snorkel at the ready when eating one of these. This fruit has a high water content, and its skin is so thick that you can bite right through it. It'd be the most perfect snack to keep in your pack on a long hike through the desert, if only it didn't brew so easily. I consider this more of a drink than a fruit. <laughs> and then uh, the disguised delicacy. It's a miracle anyone tried to eat this unpleasant looking fruit the very first time. You'd think its hairy exterior would have scared them off, yet it, it, eat it they did. And we should all be grateful for what a tasty treat it is. Further proof that luck favors the bold. The fruit on this planet is astonishingly large. If we could cultivate these ample fruits on Hakate, nobody would ever go hungry again. Sadly, I don't know anything about agriculture. Maybe I should have listened to my wife when she told me to do yard work. The black seeds are a delight and have a satisfyingly grainy mouthfeel, but I don't recommend eating the fuzzy exterior. And the blonde imposter. Is the blonde imposter simply a disguised del delicacy in disguise? You might ask, not at all. It's, a, it's very much its own fruit. It's juicy and sweet, and it has even more of the beautifying vitamin Pictamin U than its green cousin. Imposter? Psh, it's as real as it gets. My wife went through a phase where she, all she would talk about was Pictamin and its nutritious value. She charted Pictamin U percentages, and then there was a A and P. I never really understood what she was talking about, but she was so passionate about it, I couldn't help but listen. I bet she'd really like to try this fruit. Interesting that they knew of Pikmin U, but Pikmin themselves were something they only just discovered on this planet. Very odd. It has fewer seeds and tasted tastes a hint sweeter than its green counterpart. And then this is the start of the Merce, or the Winter Reverie or Winter Reserve series. We have the Merciless Extractor. Okay, so squeeze, squeeze. Had enough? No. Well, let's squeeze one more. A ruthless, savage heart beats inside this machine. Indeed, no giant fruit can retain its juice in in the face of this device's relentless ringing. But if it's the very last drop you seek, the Merciless Extractor is for you. When I look at the company president, I can't see myself climbing the corporate ladder. To be a manager, it seems like you have also got to be an inhuman, heartless villain. These traits allow them to squeeze their dedicated workers without mercy and still sleep at night. I feel that same merciless cruelty radiating from this metallic altar. I wonder if it was once used for dark, unspeakable ceremonies. Or perhaps it was once the desk of a corporate boss. We'll never know. I totally understand, Alamar. Used for extracting fruit juices, but could serve as a cup if necessary. Citrus lump. It's worth no noting this tasty fruit is near perfect round shape, which is not unlike the face of a shrewd friend. Meanwhile, the thick skin suggests it's a survivor. It's seen things, it's been there. So let us look at it this way. As with the friend, that friend of ours, it might take us some effort to get the, to the good stuff, but oh, what a reward once we do. This fruit is so shiny and round, it reminds me of a peach ball whenever I see it, yet it is so yummy that I can't help but get cravings for it and end up eating it all the time. The only drawback is that I'm constantly disappointed that I'm not on vacation. <laughs> Don't throw away all that stringy white stuff. It's full of nutrients and adds excellent texture to a smoothie. Interesting. Face Wrinkler. The hard squeezing excitement one feels upon falling in love the first time is not so different from the jaw clenching salivation that occurs when one takes their first taste of this fruit. I dare say both experiences are thrilling if just a touch painful. The love between my wife and I has been captured in all sorts of romantic memories, as sweet and sour as this fruit. It's fun to return to those memories and feel that what I felt then. Sometimes I wonder how my kids will feel the first time they fall in love. Too sour to eat on its own, but squeeze the juice over fried chicken to add a refreshing hint of flavor. <laughs> Interesting. And the pocked airhead, 
Children love this fruit for its adorable shape. See how it looks for all the world like a jolly orange snowman? But the pocked airhead is more than just a cute character. Its taste is sweet and its strange lumpy skin is easy to peel. There's much to love about this citrus snowman. Some people may like to peel this fruit from the top, but I prefer to attack it from the bottom instead. Whenever I go from the top, I get this tingly feeling around my belly button. I find it very unnerving. Oh no. Save the peel and use it to add a citrusy aroma to your bath. Drop it in the warm water and relax. Insect Condo. This fruit is a member of the plant family Bugiatinidae. I don't know how to pronounce that, I'm sorry. Its name, as its name implies, the Insect Condo is a popular abode choice for a number of insects. And who can blame the bugs for taking up a residence here? This fruit is not just homey, but also quite delicious. This fruit could be hiding more than a tasty interior. On more than a few occasions, I found bugs munching their way through the sweet flesh, presumably enjoying a snack of their own. How funny to think that I share the same taste in fruit as a worm. <laughs> Crispy yet juicy, light yet hearty. Always check for worms before taking a big bite. If you find one, it's a sign of good luck. The, uh, okay, so this is the next thing. This is a tropical picking series. Okay, next up we have the Tropical Picking Series. With this one, a dapper blob. It looks for all the world like this fruit is wearing a jaunty hat. Ah, but the dapper blob's attire is besides the point. It's the juicy flesh inside. Deeply sweet yet delightfully bitter too. That's the real star of the show here, a fruit fit for royalty. Don't ask me how I know, but if you draw a face on this fruit, it, appear it bears an uncanny resemblance to my wife wearing a hat. It even emits the same styles and judgmental aura. Funny how the doodled version of her is as intimidating as the real thing. Peeling this fruit is, is, is a sure way to dye your fingers purple, and, if, and it'll be a while before they go back to normal. Scaly Custard. It's a food, and yet it resembles some kind of scaly beast? Let's agree that the initial impression is not a good one, and yet inside awaits a rich, creamy culinary delight. Oh. You scaly custard you, many have judged you harshly, and for that, I'm truly sorry. The hard scaly shell that covers this fruit gets softer and darker as it ripens, so determining the optimal, optimal time to peel and eat it can be difficult. It's as if the fruit is actively trying to sabotage your enjoyment of it. I've never known produce to be so sneaky. Mmm, tastes rich and satisfying, so buttery you could almost confuse it with the real thing. Almost. Seed Hive. There's no other way to say it. The inside of the seed hive is quite grotesque. That knot of, of black orbs in the belly, in its belly? Yuck! But many seeds means many cultivation opportunities. And there's no reason to turn our noses up at that. I always thought it was better to eat fruit when it's ripe, but this one is just as enjoyable and nutritious when it's green. The same can be said about creatures like us. Many think maturity is superior, but an experienced youth are what provide fresh perspectives. Packed with seeds, don't stare at them for too long, or you might start to feel a bit dizzy. Oh no. Is this a fruit or a shooting star that's fallen to the ground? One taste and the answer is yours. Better yet, cut this star into slices and enjoy yourself a fruity constellation. How heavenly. To look at a cross section of this fruit, if you'd, th you'd think you'd, it was a drawing of a star, like one my son would make. Stars don't actually look like that. So why did we draw them this way? Maybe the secret is to the universe is hidden within those five points. It sort of looks like a sea cucumber until you slice it open. Then you're basically staring at a starfish. Heroin's tear. When you lay eyes upon the, the elegant tear shape of this fruit, it may just bring a tear to your own eye. The perfection of it makes everything else in life seem somehow less perfect. Then when you taste how perfectly sweet it is, prepare to weep with joy. Peeling this fruit is arduous due to its soft skin. When I tried to eat it without first removing the peel, a rash developed around my mouth. I had better success when I s slit grid-like cuts into the skin and flipped it inside out. The results were delicious. Its meat has a subtle, subtle sweetness to it and is almost creamy. Its meat has a subtle sweetness and is almost creamy. If I close my eyes while eating it, I'm transported to a tropical locale. Okay, the slapstick crescent. Clearly this fruit was designed to be sent on outings with children. Note the built-in wrapper that's easy to remove. But children mustn't toss the wrapper on the ground. Someone is sure to slip on it and land on their behind. Hilarious? Maybe. Painful? Definitely. 
I must confess, I once slipped and fell on a peel that I thoughtlessly discarded on the floor after eating the fruit inside. I'm really too old to be making mistakes like that. I can even hear my own voice scolding myself. Don't forget to clean up your trash. Ah, the taste of a healthy yet unremarkable choices. Fire Breathing Feast. Despite its wild and intimidating outer appearance, this fruit looks quite fancy and refined on the inside. The, uh, the tiny black specks decorate bright white flesh. All in all, it looks like an egg from the nest of some fire breathing half animal, half plant beast. Throughout my life, I've met people who seemed flashy or fancy, but were actually quite down to earth. I've also met people who were as arrogant as they looked. The same lesson could be applied to this fruit. It looks pretty intimidating, but what's on the other side? Despite its intimidating exterior, the inside is surprisingly sweet. If you eat the red ones, you'll be in for more color a more colorful surprise when you relieve yourself the next day. Oh my gosh. And then of course, next up we have the bedtime series. First one is the dusty bed. If it's a good night's sleep you're seeking, this bed can help. Not only is it quite spacious and comfortable, but if you flip it over, it will coat you in a fine cloud of dust that is said to encourage sweet dreams. But bring a lint roller for when you're done sleeping. I've heard that this mattress possesses miraculous relaxation properties that promise the most restless sleeper a good night of sleep. I was curious to know how this would affect me, who can literally sleep anywhere. Would I ever wake up again? Thankfully, I did. I jumped on it and was engulfed by a cloud of white smoke. The doggy bed. This giant dog shaped bed is perfect spot for a canine companion to sleep on. It's quite thick and good at absorbing slobber if your favorite pooch friend is prone to do such things. Also, a dog sleeping on a dog shaped mattress? What could be cuter? My beloved dog, Bulby, has the impressive ability to fall asleep anywhere he wants. We have that in common. This habit is also one of my wife's, wife's biggest peeve, pet peeves. Perhaps if Bulby had a designated bed, it would create a bit more harmony at home. This smells like soap. Maybe I wouldn't need to shower anymore if I slept on it. <laughs> Maybe. Birdie bed. Birds have long been a symbol of freedom and good luck. In fact, if one appears in your dreams at night, then good fortune is sure to visit you during the day. What in, with, with that in mind, sleep on this bed and you're almost guaranteed to find birds flocking to your dreams. Research has shown that sound waves created by a chirping bird are naturally comforting and induce sleep. Now, I don't have any st strong preferences when it comes to bedding, but if this makes me feel like I'm sleeping on the forest floor, it could be worth a try. Useless for sleeping. Its shape keeps making my mouth water and I can never fall asleep hungry. Oh no. The fishy bed. It said that life first came from the sea, so it's no surprise that we are so deeply connected to water. Thus, this bed, with its fish-shaped design, is meant to lull one to sleep with visions of floating. Just lay down and let the dreams wash over you. This thing reminds me of this one time I was fixing the hull of the SS Dolphin. The combination of the sun and zero gravity created an illusion. It was as if I was a fish floating in the open sea, but in fact, I was just me, floating in a sea of space debris. I've been into this object while half asleep. It was completely devoid of flavor. And then we got the, okay, so that was it for the uh, bedtime series. Now we have the three generation series. This is the granddaughter doll head. This poor separated family. I know they're only dolls, but it's still sad. This grandchild was discovered inside a dark, damp cave. Did she wander off? How did she find herself in such an unsuitable place? She must have been so lonely. What a relief then that she was rescued from such an unfortunate fate. I look forward to one day looking upon the face of my grandchild. If it's as cute as this one, I couldn't help but dote on them. But it doesn't really matter what they look like or if they resemble me or someone else in my family. I've always thought that grandchildren are meant to be spoiled. Aw, cute hat, but makes it hard to see. Then we got the uh, gifting vase. It's hard to see a family separated, even if they are just dolls. Dolls or not, they clearly want to be together. This doll torso looks like it's in the shape of a vase. Perhaps it's a good place to put gifts to help the way your dolls get by until they're reunited. And they will be reunited. I used to know a guy who would give in, would never give in to his kids when they begged him for something. He wouldn't look from his grandkids and he'd give them anything they wanted. It seems that a grandchild possesses immense powers of persuasion or it's just magic. Flip it upside down, crawl underneath, you've got an instant fort. All right, daughter doll head. 
This doll inherited her wise look from her mother. She is lucky to be part of the three generations that have handed down only their best traits. Of course, in reality, children often often inherit the very wor our very worst traits. Whose fault is that? The answer? It's complicated. <laughs> Children often exhibit both the positive and negative qualities of their parents. I think that's why we feel for them so much. What's more, we want them to keep improving and even exceed the expectations we set for ourselves. It's hard work being a kid. I'm fighting the urge to add nose hairs or a mustache. Oh, angry eyebrows. Mooching face. Children mooch off their parents all the time. Don't try to deny it. But to be fair, parents love to be needed, so perhaps they actually like it a bit when their child comes to them with their handout. Anywho, this looks like a good place to store mooched items. I've worked hard, so I wouldn't be a financial burden on my parents, and I don't want my kids to be dependent on me when they grow up. A parent's job is to raise independent children, but not too independent. You still want them to come home for the holidays. Probably used to take baths al fresco. The woody smell is quite soothing. And the mama doll head. You want to see the face of a parent? Well, here it is. It's a commanding visage, no? And yet somehow still warm and inviting. This doll, in her infinite wisdom, knows she must strike the perfect balance between strict expectations and eternal love. As a parent, you need to be able to hide some emotions from your children. It's harder than you think. I remember telling my parents about my career goals and seeing the disappointment in their eyes. It hurt, but I'm glad it didn't pull me off my path. If I put this on my head, I look just like Nana. And then the empty vase. Look at this enormous face. Like a parent who's given too much to a child, it's completely empty. Is this all that remains of a sad story? Maybe. Maybe not. Only that parent can say whether giving so much brought them disappointment or their greatest joy. Once you have children, money starts disappearing faster than you can save it. My wife always says, if it's for the children, it's worth it. I admire her enormous heart. Still, every year it seems like the children get more and more expensive. Walking on the rim of this object is a thrilling and difficult challenge. All right, so that was all of the uh, Three Generations series. Now we have the Gourmet series. Ooh, okay. This is the King of Meats. I wouldn't normally think to call a meat majestic, but look at this thing. Large and imposing. It demands a certain respect from all who consider eating it. I can almost hear it now. You think you can eat me whole, do you? Bah ha ha I dare you to do your worst. I never expected to find such an appetizing cut of meat in a dark underground lair. Why was it there? How was it made? And is there a reason for its large size? I imagine it was an offering to some great figure. I shall pay my respects later as well. Big enough that no one will notice if I slice off a bit to sample the flavor. The maestro of flavor, after subsisting on the blandest of space-faring food, I was not prepared for the symphony of flavors this dish unleashed on my tongue. The sublime melding of the top and the bottom flavors, surely a culinary maestro orchestrated this masterpiece. I'm not sure why you'd want to eat raw fish. Maybe cookery on this planet advanced so far they were able to recreate the essence of the original ingredients. It'd be easier to eat if I could cut it down into smaller pieces, but that might be insulting to the chef. Perfect for dipping, the right sauce can bring out all kinds of unexpected flavors and aromatics. Belted delicacy. This food item looks for all the world like it was it's wearing a belt around its middle. Fashion choices aside, it tastes like heaven. The yellow part, whatever it may be, is surprisingly sweet and delicious. Maybe more of our food stuff should wear a belt? I understand the white granular parts on the bottom to be fish eggs. One time, I went fishing with my son. We caught a fish who was carrying eggs like these. It was a revelatory moment for him to see how life can differ from species to species. A more sophisticated palate will appreciate the notes of umami in the yellow sponge-like layer. Fish bed snack. As far as I can tell, this is some sort of fish atop some sort of white stuff. The species don't matter as much as the taste. Which is good, nothing too fancy or ostentatious, just the kind of back to basics flavor profile that we all crave now and again. One of my favorite birthday gifts as a child was a book I received called 20,000 Millimeters Under the Sea. I believe I owe my adventurous spirit to that novel. How funny that a piece of seafood from a different planet could remind me of my childhood self. An excellent palate cleanser, put you in the mood for, puts you in the mood for a strong cup of tea. And then, uh, 
the the Four Grill Brothers. This dish was inspired by the legend of the Four Grill Brothers. Two brothers felt only meat was fit for a grill. The others believed only veggies belonged. A sword fight erupted among them. They nearly skewered each other, but ended up creating the skewer instead. Hmm, I can tell it'd give me tons of power and stamina. I'm not athletic, but if I ate the whole thing, I'm sure I could work up work for three days straight without a wink of sleep. Now that I think about it, I don't want the president to hear about this and get any ideas. An unpredictable culinary experience. It's up to the eater to decide which part to eat first. Okay, so that was the uh, gourmet series. Now we have the soulful musician series with quite a lot of entries. Uh, the harmonic synthesizer. This clam-like sound generator is all natural. The purity of its percussive tone is irresistible. Clack, clack. My taste in music is highly refined, but my wife and kids have no taste at all. For example, when I ask my family if they want to go out for karaoke, they twist their faces and give me a nasty look. They don't know what they're missing. At first, I mistook it for a giant clam. My stomach growls every time I tap it. Mmm. Spouse alert. Do you have one of those spouses who loves to play pranks on you? For example, one who gets a laugh from sneaking up and startling you with a boo. Well, put this on your prank pulling partner and you'll always know when they are approaching. It's a must have item for the spouse who wants to have the last laugh. Sometimes I miss my carefree bachelor days. Once you have a family, those days are history. I like spending time with my wife, but sometimes I just want to be alone. Could it be a fruit? It looks like there's some kind of seed on the inside, but the husk is inedible. Path Creator. This warning device, worn by ancient guardian deities, would be rung loudly for all to hear when a villager committed a wrongdoing. Anyone who heard it would then immediately fall to the ground, clearing the way for the guardians to pass. When I was a kid, I set off the alarm system at the primary school just to see what would happen. As predicted, I was scolded, but I have no regrets. We are naturally curious creatures. Why else would we be here? I still get the urge to set off alarms, but sadly, I've gotten better at resisting those impulses. I made the mistake of entering the golden bowl and ringing from within. The noise was deafening. Time marker. This great bell has traditionally been rung at the end of each day, each month, and each year. And what a beautiful tone to mark the patches of time. Of course, once the counts up how once one counts up how many times they've rung the spell, that pretty jingle turns into quite may turn into quite the startling jangle. How is it that so much time has flown by? Oh no, here we go. Despite its solemn appearance, the sound emitted by this object is airy and bright. It reminds me of an innocence, the innocence and wonder that lives in the heart of a young child. It's important to never lose that sense of childlike wonder. I know I haven't. Beware, it's easy to get stuck when you climb up into it. Oh no. Wind detector. Ah, what striking tones do you play as the wind dances through this silvery treasure? The musical notes that flow from the holes announce the arrival of, the, of a breeze, and in doing so, they weave a strong song both sweet and melancholy. It's a sentimental soundtrack, one best suited for, all, for a fall afternoon spent contemplating the passing of the seasons. Unpainted spaceships look a lot like this, shiny and ripe for adventure. As a kid, I would go down to the spaceship dock just to watch the ships being assembled. That's where I started to dream big. In reality, this is likely some kind of noisemaker. Despite its appearance, this is not a chocolate bar. I chipped a tooth when I tried to bite through the foil wrapper. Poor Louie. Uh, ambiguous hostile. It seems that something, or more likely some things, lived within the inner cavity of this device. What were those things? What was their purpose? Were they forced to live together as part of an experiment? Some things are destined to remain unknown. Based on its shape and where it was found, I have deduced this is a nest for some type of aquatic creature. On Hakatate, fish are known to use sunken buildings and objects like their own underwater apartments. I'm sure ha many have a life flourished here. I put my face through one of the holes and smelled something odd. Oh no. Mega horn. Bounce on the squishy bulb end to produce an earth shattering roar that likes the likes of which you've never heard. Large brass instruments such as this added volume to band performances. Just don't stand in front of the horn and if you like your eardrums. I'm not sure my eardrums will ever recover from the thunderous noise emitted by this artifact. I can only imagine it's pl it played a role in many a naughty child's practical jokes. If I had one of these as a kid, I'm sure I would have been a terror. I can't wait to scare the boss with this thing. Oh my.
<laughs> Mechanical Harp Memory Song. This device plays a beautiful me me melody that elicits feelings of nostalgia. There is something so familiar about it, and yet the same at the same time, it's completely unknown. Mysterious, to be sure. Strange. Despite its calming tones, something about this melody makes my palms sweat and send shivers up my spine. It's as if it's sending me a warning about unexpected troubles in the future. This would be the perfect musical accompaniment to a cup of fruit juice. Mechanical Harp Lullabies. The song played on this device is intended to make the listener feel sleepy and yet terrified to fall asleep at the same time. How, how odd that a piece of music can make you feel like you're staring down a mouthful of razor sharp teeth. There is a healing quality to this song, and I can't help but gravitate towards it. Perhaps this is a machine meant to lure prey for a stronger predator. The strong do have a disproportionate advantage on this planet. Wait, then does that make me the weaker prey? Nana used to sing me a special lullaby to put me at ease. I would instantly fall asleep. Ah, Mechanical Harp Windmills. To feel the excitement of a grand adventure, all you need to do is play this device. It seems to sing of heroic tales and captured princesses. I hope one day I'm able to sell these rare treasures to a hero as valiant as these dulcet tones. My son is always playing some sort of adventure game. He becomes the hero, defeats his arch nemesis, and saves the day at last. I admire heroic figures like that, but if given a choice, I'd choose my own life again and again. This song is positively invigorating. I can't stop listening to it. Emperor Whistle. Heal healing tones are old news? Well, greet this the new trend, Super Sounds of Awakening. Air passing through the inner chamber plays a high note that acts as an acoustic refreshment. When I blow air into this rock, it makes the air on my neck or the hair on my neck stick straight up. But if I blow a little bit harder, the sound becomes crackly and soft. It's so pathetic, I can't help but burst into a fit of giggles whenever I hear it. The sound this makes would m wake even a deep, deep sleeper like Nana. Shake a smile. Crying when you want to cry, laughing when you want to laugh, acting on your every impulse without worrying about the consequences. Ah, to be a baby again. This treasure elicits feelings of nostalgia for that time and memories of the love and joy a baby can bring. This object rattles when you move it. It sounds quite similar to a frequency, the frequency emitted by baby goods on my home planet. Imagine this would work in a pinch if you had a crying baby you needed to soothe. Reminds me of Nana. Aw. Amplified amplifier. Your voice is weak, it does not carry, no one notices you. If this is true, then this item is for you. Starting today, you are a gym teacher. You will never be ignored again. I wasn't surprised to discover this had been found inside a groovy long legs deep underground. It certainly gives off the same vibe vibes as the creature made of inorganic and organic materials. On this on a separate note, every time I look at it, I want to dance. So fun to jump up and down on it. All right, so that was everything in the tr the uh what is it? The Soulful Musician series. Now we have the Great Adventure series. Double Dragon Eyed Scope. This massive scope allows two viewers to stand side by side and see far into the distance. As if that wasn't impressive enough, it looks as if its design was based on dragon eyes. It's just a thing for a couple of adventurous explorers who hate taking turns. It's reminiscent of a telescope I had when I was a kid. My father and I would stare up at the skies together and talk about our discoveries. That telescope nurtured my adventurous spirit. I love to meet the adventurer who peeked into these lenses. When I looked through it from the bigger end, everything seemed tiny. I felt like a giant. Temporal mechanism. This piece of technology doesn't work, so there's no way to confirm it, but I believe in my heart of hearts that it is part of a time machine. A foolish belief, maybe, but I have faith that the future holds many great things, and this is simply a sign of what's to come. I was entranced by the, the longer needle in it as it spun around and around, and, it complete, and co I completely lost track of time. This object doesn't strike me as otherworldly, but whenever I look at it, it's like I can feel the space-time continuum bending around me. The long stick ticks along a lot faster than the short one. If I had to pick, I'd choose the laid-back one. Director of Destiny. This astounding device indicates which direction fate is flowing. By reading the magnetic fields found on planets and in living organisms alike, it can read one's fortune. The science is too complex to explain, but whether you go north or south, do heed its guidance. The arrow-like object floating in the center appears to move around at will, but it's actually always pointing in the same direction. 
It could be trying to point me towards my destiny, but I'd rather figure that out on my own. Could be useful for food storage. I just need to figure out how to open it. And Detective tr Detective's Truth Seeker. Surely this powerful viewing device was used by a brilliant professor trying to catch a glimpse of the truth hiding in the most fundamental level of the universe. But when they looked through here, did they find the truth? And did that truth look bigger and a bit out of focus? Everything looks so much bigger when you peer through this lens. You can see these smallest details and all of the different components that make up a single object. That's the proper way to conduct a scientific investigation. As fun as it is to make food appear larger, this object can't actually increase the amount. Unlimited locomotive. Oh, this is a different series. Yeah, okay, this is the uh, Roundabout Express series. Some people love to ride rails because it reminds them of the past. Others ride rails because they're excited about what lies in the future. I say a train trip is more than just transportation. It is unlimited possibility. Hop aboard and find out. Why is it that a child's eyes always seem to light up at the sight of a train? My son was fascinated with them, and it was the first toy he ever wanted. I was the same way as a kid. Even now, I'm wishing I could hop on this train and go for a ride. Choo-choo. Very difficult and uncomfortable to ride. Middle management tank car. This tank car works hard. It carries heavy and difficult to handle loads. Yes, it's pulled along by its superior, but it does a vital job connecting that leader to the cars behind it. It may be the middle management of rail cars, but that's nothing to be ashamed of. Long ago, railroads were the lifeblood, lifeblood of civilization, and the power to transport people or supplies remains key to our survival. Someone's got to move the fuel, right? I like to think our company by, plays a, sim, a similar role in space. It gives meaning to the daily grind. An enjoyable place to sit and play. Leisure car. Passenger cars like this aren't fancy, and yet there's something elegant about taking a ride on one. You simply recline in your seat and stare out the window as someone ferries you to, the, to where you need to go. This kind of leisure has a dignity about it, no? As a student, I once took a local train, a really slow one, on a journey to wherever it was going. I was the only passenger. The unchanging scenery stretched on and on. I felt like I was the only person in the world. Sounds a lot like space travel, huh? Place your order on the right and pick it up on the, at the left window. Beware, service is slow. The Life Station. This is a place where lives intersect in all sorts of ways. Some people come here for, for sad goodbyes, others come for happy hellos. Some people find themselves here wondering where they're going next. Is this a train stop or a life stop? Or maybe both. During my first job, my parents would meet me at the train station when I got home from work. I've, I always thought I'd do the same thing for my kids, but it's usually them waiting at the station for me now. It always warms my heart, but I wish I could return the favor. Comfy digs. I wouldn't mind staying here for a while. Straight and narrow track. This straight railway track is perfect for the person who knows exactly where they want to go in life, from point A directly to point B. No twists, no turns, and no turning back. It may not be the most adventurous route, but adventure is not for everyone. They say that following the straight and narrow path is a virtue, but I've learned firsthand that it doesn't always lead to your destination. When I started working directly under the president of Hockadate Freight, I thought it was the in inevitable next step in my career. All it led to was piles and piles of paperwork. I'll be happy if my kids take a slightly twisted route in life, as long as it helps them achieve their dreams. The color makes me hungry for some delicious fruit. Turn of events track. What a profound curve this track here exhibits. It's not so different from life. Sometimes you think you know where you're going, but then a curve in the track takes you for an unexpected ride. There's no getting off this train, so sit back and enjoy the surprise. I always slow down on sharp curves, but sometimes I crave the occasional thrill of speed. Maybe if I floor the accelerator while the parking brake was engaged, it would satisfy my, my desire. Sometimes I look around and wonder if civilization isn't simply the result of all uh, of us all trying to satisfy our desires just enough to stay productive. I keep thinking the next time I jump into one of these holes, I'm going to fall to my doom. Back at the beginning track. Sometimes in life, you lay down a track that seems straight as, as an arrow, but the fact is, it's not straight, not at all. Follow the track and you could end up right back where you started. But don't let that get you down. Maybe you're right back where you should be. I took my son to the zoo a few years ago, and he suddenly started crying. 
To calm him, I walked him back, back and forth on a path with no exhibits. We didn't see any animals that day, but I learned that sometimes the best solution is as simple as a change in direction. I got my head stuck in one of the gaps. My panic screaming loosened it enough for me to get free. Thrill ride track. When a sharp turn catches you by surprise, what do you do? Slam on the brakes or throw up in the throttle? No matter what choice you make, you're in for a heart pounding thrill ride. Be it best to grab for that seatbelt if you've got one. Some people think I don't like the concept of a set path or staying on the rails. That's not true at all. The only thing that matters to me is that I'm going, to, going in the right direction. How I get to my destination is irrelevant, much like the opinions of others. I'm unsettled by both the shape and the color. Okay, so that was everything in the Roundabout Express series. Now we have the Oral Augment series. Mouth of Lies. Slip a coin into the mouth of this machine and in return it will tell you a joke, or so I'm told. But so far, it's only returned silence for every coin I've put in. Perhaps it's broken, or perhaps the joke is on me? So, the idea is you put your hand in the mouth and pretend it's being devoured by whatever's inside the object. Maybe some people find that funny, or even romantic, but it seems like a mediocre party gag to me. Shake it and you'll hear an unmistakable sound of money. <laughs> Monster teeth. What enormous creature could these teeth belong to? And how did it come to part with them? The mind reels to imagine it all. Though this much we do know, the straightness and whiteness of the teeth suggest it had access, access to excellent dental care. I did not want to cross paths with the owner of these teeth. Of course, given the height of those molars, I'm guessing they're too big to have much in the way of physical agility, and that could work to my advantage if we did encounter another, one another. I could just run in frantic circles until they eventually gave up. I wish I could eat all of the big things that this big mouth could eat. <laughs> brush of wisdom. Surely such a large brush could be used to scrub a great many things. The mind boggles at the possibilities. Of course, one must use such powerful tool of, of cleansing wisely. Think carefully before you proceed. I'm reminded of a toothbrush I used when I was a kid. I always wanted to brush my own teeth, so when my mom finally gave up helping me, it was a sweet victory. Unfortunately, that's when I started to get cavities. I guess that's the price of independence. I like to bury my face in the long, soft fur. <laughs> brush of foolishness. The soft bristles of this brush, how could they feel when scrubbing one's own back? But how easy it is to lose yourself in the feeling. As I say, too much of a good thing is a bad thing. Don't be fooled by this brushing vice. Know when enough is enough. Brushing a child's teeth for them is hard work, made worse by the fact that they're oblivious to the perils of tooth decay. I stopped brushing our kids' teeth for a time so they could learn for themselves, but that idea did not go too over too well with my wife. There is something soothing about the way it smells. Boss Lollipop. What a surprise it is to find that this lollipop offers no flavor at all. The odd protuberance is neither sweet nor savory, and yet, mysteriously, it lures one into sucking on it. Even more surprising, once you have a taste for this flavorless lollipop, you are almost certain to feel so soothed that hours fly by in a satisfied haste. I look at this and am instantly overcome by thoughts of my mother and all the mothers out there. They represent the power of nature itself, cocooning the universe in love and fortifying it with their strength since the dawn of time. Give it a whiff and all I got was a nose full of nostalgia. And the maternal sculpture. The shape. It is, it is at once familiar and also comforting. Surely this sculpture was erected to remind us all that mother's love is universal. The shape resembles a mammalian appendage, but I have no idea what it actually does. It's dripping in what can, I can only describe as beast drool, and he I'm hesitant to touch it, but I've got a duty on my mission to my mission, and maybe it won't be so bad if I close my eyes. This reminds me of my Nana. She used to feed me milk from this kind of thing. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, there's still one more little doggy bowl over here. The bathing pool. This bathing apparatus is sure to be the envy of all who see it. Though primarily used for delightfully refreshing cold plunges, it can also hold hot water if it's delivered. True, the edges are slippery, but once you're in, it offers hours of carefree splashing. The bathtub we have at home is much smaller. If we had one like this, we could use it as a hot tub and relax together as a family. Then again, it's hard to unwind when surrounded by ex excited children, especially those who like to splash you in the face. Perfect for catching critters, big and small. Just leave the, a little bait in there and see what happens. Okay, so that's everything from Oral Augments. Now we have the Assembled Courage series. 
Think Tank Combo Bot. Look at this robot. It was made to command, to lead. The greatness is in its eyes and in its horns. But how can one be great, a great leader, robot or otherwise, without followers? Likewise, what is a head without a body? Important questions for us all to ask. I was in all of module robots when I was growing up. Their strength and abilities impressed me to my core. I doubt anyone's ever admired me in such a way, but maybe that's not so bad. I find great satisfaction in being respected as an equal. The rotating action will work great for my for mincing garlic. Nexus Combo Bot. Ah, the very heart of the robot. It comes it all comes together right here. Separate parts joined to become one. Voila, a team is born. It takes determination and drive to pull everyone together. But that's what the heart of a team does, and that's how victory is won. Once I get started on something, I'm the type that can't help but keep piling on more and more for myself to do. If that's considered hard work, then I guess I like hard work. The only problem is the result of hard work isn't always good work. I wonder how much this would sell for if reassembled. For Fist Force Combo Bot. Look at this robo arm. It's ready to seize victory in its steely fist. It fires at its enemies, not out of anger, but out of necessity. It does what must be done and never flinches from that duty. Yes, that's what the Valor looks like, and it's as good it's a good look indeed. It's crucial to believe that you are capable of success. But just because you believe it doesn't guarantee it will happen. Then again, if you don't believe it, you're unlikely to succeed at all. That's why you have to clench your fist to remain strong in the face of every challenge. For me, the ultimate success will be returning home to my family. I believe I can. Perfect for tenderizing meat. The Peacemaker Combo Bot. If the right arm is all about valor and victory, the left arm is all about love and peace. You could say that while one hand throws a punch, the other reaches out for a handshake. This symmetry is important. It keeps the whole body, nay the whole universe, in balance. For me, love and protectiveness go hand in hand. When I think of my daughter, rambunctious, willful, a bright spark of joy, both feelings come forth at once. I'd do anything to keep her spark from fading the way mine has. If she read this now, she'd say, lighten up, dad. They say peace and love go hand in hand. Neither seem to add much in terms of flavor. The Kickstart Combo Bot. This robot's right leg is pl planted solidly on the ground. Its stance is firm. The posture says you can do anything if you only have the courage and the conviction to do it. Inspiring, isn't it? Yes, yes it is. Now I too am ready to put my own foot down. Legs are some of the most important parts of a living organism. Not only are they used for walking and running, but that movement helps circulate blood throughout the body. Some even call the legs the second heart. I wonder if my toes serve a, cold, a second purpose as well. I've been looking for something like this for mashing potatoes. And then lastly, the sure-footed combo bot. One can't afford to waffle on the battlefield, nor can one afford to rush in with half-baked plants. Yes, courage is required, but also calmness. Yes, conviction is needed, but also composure. You can rest assured that the left leg will stride into battle, but only after careful consideration. Many people don't realize that they not only have a dominant hand, but a dominant leg as well. That leg can even be more muscular or longer than its non-dominant counterpart. Too big of an imbalance between the legs can have staggering effects. If I have a dominant hand, does that mean I have a dominant foot? If so, which one is it? I mean, I guess if somebody, you know, rolls a ball your way, which whichever foot instinctively kicks it would probably be your dominant foot, right? I have hooks, so it's hard for me to tell. Uh, treasure catalog, soulful artist series. This one has a lot. Uh, uniquely, you goon. Red is red, of course it, of course. Or is it? First, there are many shades of red, and second, even the same shade of red means different things to different individuals. For some, red is a painful fire. For others, it's a warm love. Maybe there's a one-of-a-kind red for us all. This is my favorite color. I love how it imbues passion and emotion into everything it touches. Come to think of it, the first thing I encountered were red. Perhaps it's why I instinctively trusted them. Colors can influence behavior in all kinds of ways. I find the color unsettling. <laughs> yeah, I guess maybe that's why Alomar's gloves are red. Decorative goo. This tube of decorative blue goo is sure to inspire creativity in anyone who comes upon it. It should also be a reminder to welcome new colors into your life now and then. Don't get stuck returning to the same hues over and over again. Go wild, unleash a new you. This color is very similar to that of a blue pigment. I prefer red. My whole mouth turned blue after one lick. And some other stuff kept coming out blue for the next few days. Probably won't eat it again. 
even if it is my favorite color. So yeah, the Louis gloves are blue, so maybe that's just how it is. They match up their favorite colors with their gloves. Illumination goo. In fortune telling circles, this is the color of illumination. It has the power to light the path before us, showing us which way to go if we want, to better, a better, want better luck in life and specifically money making endeavors. I hope the illumination goo will light my way. I heard that Pikmin of the same color were found in the same location. Could there be a correlation? Some creatures change their appearance to match their environment. I'd like to observe what happens to those Pikmin when exposed to other environments. Makes me think of my favorite yellow foods. What a regal color this is, this noble goo. What a regal color this is! Noble and dignified in hue. It demands a solemn different, or deference from all who gaze upon it. No wonder it's the color of kings, queens, and other folk of high status. I confess, I yearn to have a coat made of this color myself. Found in a dark location. Luckily, it was just bright enough to be spotted in the vicinity of purple Pikmin. I've never associated purple with strength, but I've since had to revise my thinking. Reminds me of the color of almost frozen lips. Brr. True goo. Some say this hue is the absence of all color. Others say, in fact, it's all colors combined. I, for one, believe both are true. No, I don't know why the whys and hows of it, but I do know this color goes nicely with every other color out there, and that must mean something. Discovered in an obscure locale alongside white pigment, Creatures with bright colors are usually more likely to be packing poison, while creatures with dull coloration are generally harmless, but this doesn't apply to white Pikmin. In fact, they're dangerously poisonous. No doubt they use this to their advantage. My teeth have been sparkling white ever since I used this to brush them. I wonder if it took care of my cavities too. Probably not. Ambiguous goo. A bit of white, a bit of black. This color has made its home halfway between the two. Some say it's an ambiguous hue that refuses to plant its flag, but maybe it's just it just enjoys living between two ends of the spectrum, enjoying the best of both worlds. This color reminds me of rock Pikmin. When I first touched one, I was surprised by how cold it felt. It was a pleasant sensation, and they didn't seem to mind my curiosity. Much like this treasure, rock Pikmin were found in a dark, chilly place. How appropriate. The boss likes to wear this color. Guess it suits grown-ups. A uh, captivation goo. This color, so charming. Anyone who lays up eyes upon it finds their mood improved. Needless to say, it's the go-to hue for painting cheeks and lips when one is in the mood to captivate. Would it work well if I painted it on my arms? Perhaps I'll try. An attractive color similar to that of a winged Pikmin that were found in its vicinity. It mystifies me how much helpless creatures have survived for so long. Their bright color makes it so easy for a predator to spot them. Needless to say, I find them to be particularly fa fascinating. I look like a ripe fruit when I cover my face with this stuff. It makes me even hungrier. Refreshing you. This is neither the color of the sky nor the color of the sea, though it is nearly the color of both. No, as blue hues go, this one is like a cool splash of water on your face, or like shaved ice on a summer day, or like the calm surface of the swimming pool after my love swam away for the last time. Oh, oh my, I fear I got swept away for a moment there. This color reminds me of the ice emitted by the sus nivis ventus. Is that a coincidence that I encountered this treasure and ice pikmin in the same area? It's no coincidence that I that ice pikmin are called that. If I licked one, I'm sure my tongue would stick to it. I looked at this color and think about ice cubes. It doesn't matter how many I eat, they never fill me up. Neon goo. Like a neon sign blinking at night or a luminous bug floating across a field at sunset, this color grabs your eye and doesn't let go. But will you follow where it leads? Neon, by its very nature, may lure you towards adventure or danger. Who knows what a goo of this hue has in store for you. The same color as the glow pigment that appear while exploring at night. Many think neon colors are artificial, but they're actually the result of certain materials reacting to short wavelengths of light. So really they are quite natural and another example of how our perception can be unreliable. If I painted my whole body with this color, would I disappear forever or never get lost? I don't know. Well, there we go. That was all of the Soulful Artist series. Now we have the Ancient Secret series. Lamp of Inspiration. This lamp is the very definition of inspiring. With the figure of a proud woman holding a torch on high, it not only lights up a room with, with its glow, but lights up the spirits of those who gaze upon it. 
The statue seems to be imbued with the majesty of an ancient goddess. When I looked up at her, I can't help but be mesmerized by her beauty, until my neck starts throbbing in pain. The right hand is holding up a generous serving of soft syrup ice cream. Chocolate, if I had to guess. Interesting. Beckoning mannequin. This charming creature beckons to all who pass by. Come to me, it says. I'm too adorable to resist. Decorate with opulent flourishes, it seems to promise not just friendship, but good fortune as well. While looking at the statue, I found myself smiling and petting its head for no discernible reason. It must possess a magical ability to captivate people and convince them to do its bidding. How can something so devious and manipulative be so cute? All I'm getting are greedy vibes. Louis not falling for it. Ancient statue head. On Hakate, the ancient statue head is almost as popular as the gyroid bust. With her cool goggles and dramatic personality, this statue oozes a mysterious aura, so the competition between the two makes sense. But what's even more mysterious is this figure's missing body. This looks a lot like a figurine my son learned about in school. I've always wondered why she wears goggles. What does she have to hide? Maybe a secret pass with another ancient statue floating around out there. I look forward to discussing this theory with my son. There is no way I'd win a steering contest against her. The Contemplation Station. When one comes upon this landmark, one can't help but contemplate how many things, or contemplate many things. First, what is this figure contemplating? Moreover, what should I be comp contemplating? Open your mind to big questions like these, and you're sure to, con to contemplate great things. Could I be related to the person who modeled for the statue? While examining it earlier, I found myself striking the same pose, without even realizing it. If we do share the same genes, how do they end up on this side of space? Hmm. Deciding what to eat next is a quandary that will forever thwart my, the mind. As soon as it is resolve, resolved, it begins anew. <laughs> That's for sure. Unfinished statue. Many have wondered what this statue would have looked like if the artist had completed the work. Would the arms have been folded? Held straight out? Might wings have been carved where the arms belong? If only the artist hadn't stopped at such a crucial juncture. Though, I confess, nothing is more fun than guessing when there's no right answer to be found. What manner of calamities had befallen the planet at the time this statue was created? Apocalyptic catastrophes? Extreme weather? The wrath of the gods? The question that artifacts like this inspire are what make them truly valuable. This made a nice snack for someone. If there's a way to enjoy eating rocks, I would like to know how. Persistence machine. What a device. Push it over, knock it down, kick it aside, it always bounces back. How it manages to do so remains a mystery. But if you're ever feeling discouraged, give this machine a shove and rejoice in its return to being upright. May it inspire you to do the same. I've never been the type to give up. No matter how many times I fall, I'll always get back up again. At first, I thought I could practice alongside this machine, but its stubby body reminds me too much of the president. One glance at it, and I lose all motivation to continue. <laughs> the shape itself is familiar, but that's it. Giant's Fossil This fossil is all the remains of a heroic giant from ancient times. He was known for showing compassion to not only allies, but enemies. As we contemplate his revered visage, we should let his past benevolence act as a guide for our own behavior today. Looking upon this warrior's calming visage is a peaceful way to spend an hour. The eyes seem to, th seem to see through everything, as if their gaze is freeing you from the darkness in your mind. Perhaps I've stumbled upon the sacred key to life's greatest questions. This bears a striking resemblance to something else. What else? Expression hider, oh, creepy. This clever contraption is meant to be used when you don't want to reveal your emotions. Stand behind it, and it will render any expression on your face unreadable. Its blank eyes and straight lips will keep your innermost feelings safe from prying eyes. I can't pinpoint the exact moment, but this reminds me of, my, of the face my wife once made when I delivered a perfectly executed dad joke. It's been a long time since I've been face to face with such beauty. I can feel my heartbeat and my eardrums. And then finally, the buddy display, one of my favorite treasures. This device not only stores, but also displays images from the distant past. And there's something about the image frozen on the screen now. The two friendly creatures pictured there are familiar somehow. Try as I might, I can't quite put my finger on it. Well, mysterious and fluffy creatures. I can't find evidence of them in any of the existing creature databases, but there's something familiar about them. 
It's almost as if I've met them before. I guess I'll chalk it up to ancient memory that's been imprinted on my genome. I'd like to take a ride on either of these creatures. <laughs> I can imagine you do, Louie. All right, so next up is the Gifts from the Sages series. Heat sensor. Touch the tip of this device to your cheek, and you find that the number that appears there matches the warmth of your heart. When faced with stress or anger, apply this sensor to your skin. Is the number higher? If so, it's time to focus on keeping your cool. Want to find the warmth in your heart? What a brilliant idea. Next time there's a mix up between my wife and me, I can just show her the numerical value of my feelings for her. Then we could use it on her and, actually that part might backfire. I like the smaller end and it was a little bit salty. The rest was pretty unappetizing. Huh, Inter internal clock measurer. This timepiece doesn't measure the passage of time in general, but the passage of time as felt by one, the one holding it. The user presses the top button once per second, but how fast or slow they press it depends on what a second feels like to them. Profound. Tasks in space require accurate timing. Docking a spaceship is a good example of that. If the monitors on my ship were to break, I'd need to measure the time using my instincts alone. This is the perfect tool to help me develop an accurate sense of time. Could be handy to have one collecting fruit and you're too tired to keep count. <laughs> Solar powered computing machine. This enormous computing machine not only allows for complex number crunching, but ensures these critical calculations can be complicated whenever needed, not or completed whenever needed. Note the enormous solar cell that powers it. Whoever built this marvel has harnessed the incandescent fury of the sun itself and used it for math. I may be able to embed this one on the wall of the ship's computer room. It could be useful for making unusual calculations should the ship's AI ever crash unexpectedly. Space pilots need to be prepared for any emergency, and I'll take all the help I can get. I'm not sure if I'm using this incorrectly. It looks like it has buttons, but they can't be pushed. Number Jumper. This clever exercise machine combines the joys of doing math with the thrill of physical exertion. When performing complex math tasks, simply jump from key to key to key. I dare say finding solutions to math problems has never been so fun. This is an extremely sturdy calculator. I never thought sturdiness was a necessary quality for a calculator, but I do recall my wife recalculating her monthly budgets multiple times after shopping trips with extreme vigor. And the calculations I've used for both life and work do have a tendency to get thrown around. I guess the craftsman on this planet had the right idea. It's a nice place to lay and think about the day. The adjustable pads mold to your body shape. Huh. And then of course we have our next series, the Paleontology series with the Octoplus. Alien invasion? No, no, it's just an octopus, or octopus. Or is it? There's something quite strange about this one. Could it be a new species, perhaps? Well, whatever this thing is, the way its adorable beady eyes stare unblinkingly at me, I'm almost certain it is communicating telepathically with me. A strange life form that mimics an octopus. Hmm. We've discovered other creatures that use mimicry, but in this case, it's fairly unconvincing. I'm not even sure it is a life form. I intend to dissect it to investigate further, but first I'll try one tiny bite. The head and tails have the same flavor and texture. Tastes like fish. Mystery squish fish. What a mysterious new species of fish. Its body is transparent, yet inside it's full of black liquid. Give it a good squeeze and it, this liquid squishes right out. The liquid is tasty, although quite salty, to be honest. Surely that must mean it comes from the sea. It's disturbing to see a mouth that can be removed like a cap. If it were reattached improperly, would the body bodily fluid simply pour right out? I remember when a supposedly airtight container of mine once failed. My bag smelled like onion soup for a week. Just one splash of this creature's liquidified innards improved the flavor of any dish. I'll never leave home without it. Nutolite shell. This is the fossil of an ancient sea creature. Sure, it looks like nothing but a brown blob from above, but flip it over and, surprise, it sparkles like a gem lit from the inside. The iridescent pattern reminds me of a water-dwelling newt found on my home planet. A fossil excavated at the beach. From its shape, I can deduce that it was cast by an aquatic creature. That could indicate that the current site of the beach was once the ocean floor. It only took one bite of a charred space newt to straighten on his bad back. I wonder what medicinal properties this might have. And then the slipper bug fossil. Clearly this is a fossil of a slipper bug. These creatures lived in ancient times and always traveled in pairs. Quite often one would get separated from the other. No amount of searching would reunite them. Wait, am I thinking about real slippers? 
Discovered along a mountain stream, it's a shape reminds me of the type of footwear used when moving through the shallow waters. Perhaps this creature mimics the shoe prints of the planet's inhabitants as a way to hide in plain sight and steal their food. An excellent tool for mashing and creating fruit. <laughs> okay, next up, the Point of Honor series. Relentless Spear. In times of old, competitors would face off against one another to see who could throw this enormous spear the farthest. It was said that the only way to take the winner's spot was to train as relentlessly as the spear flies. This is to say, competitors had to give their all to their spear training. Nothing less than total focus, total dedication, and total confidence would do. Those who give their all found they could throw the spear very far indeed. This spear looks like a rocket from the early days of space exploration. It may even conceal some kind of high propulsive force within, but I hope it has more of a romantic history and that it protected explorers as they sailed through space, pursuing their dreams. Cold to the touch, but fun to climb. Noble Bident. This treasure has not only two prongs, but two personalities. That is, it's, also, it's so beautifully designed, a noble person might hang it on their wall as a decoration. At the same time, it so fears a warrior might use it as a weapon, a spear appreciated by rulers and warriors alike. That is a mighty spear indeed. Ah, my little girl has always been the princess of our household. If there was a miniature version of this, I'd love to present it to her as her own personal fork. I can imagine it now. She'd be so ecstatic, swinging it all around, wreaking havoc, scaring the dog. Never mind. I think a little princess is a tad too spirited for a gift like this. If two people work together, they could use it to drop fruit from a considerable height. And the shattering lance. What would you say if I told you this spear is capable of shattering everything from a single solid stone to an entire iceberg? Would you shake your head in disbelief? Well, it's the truth. In fact, it works so well that should you start using it to break things, you might find it hard to stop using it to break things. It's just so satisfying. Of course, that's how one suddenly finds oneself surrounded by nothing but rubble. Careful, this tool is very sharp. Its original owner must have wanted to pierce or crack things open at any cost. As a lover and preserver of, of unique objects, I'm not quite sure I understand the purpose or value of an item such as this. Think of all the hard-shelled snacks I could open with this thing. <laughs> all right then, so now we have one of the most exciting series in my opinion, the newly nostalgic series. All right, for this one we have the Micromanagement Station, which of course is a Game Boy Advance Micro, or I guess maybe just Game Boy Micro. Uh, this desk features a built-in display surely used to show important things, such as maps and vital statistics. No doubt many heated discussions have taken place over the matters shown here. One hopes that those who worked and fought at this desk also took breaks for rest and frivolity. During slow days at work, at work, I like to play this game where I use zero gravity to float toy rockets in front of the ship's window. Then I act out scenes from my favorite childhood TV show and pretend there's a galactic war going on in the distance. I should probably edit these notes before the president asks to review them. I jumped out of my skin for the first time to display it up. Oh my gosh. The glinty circular disc, which of course is a Nintendo GameCube copy of Wave Race, uh, this disc vexes me greatly. I've analyzed it, meditated over it, and even give it a good whack or two, and still I can't decipher its purpose. But drawing upon my rather prodigious treasure knowledge, I surmise it is either a piece of equipment used for gathering solar energy, or it is a weapon capable of reflecting light at troublesome beasts to scare them off. Quite useful either way. I think this might be a tool for warding off predators. Perhaps if I attach it to my back, the creatures of this planet would be de deterred from chasing me. I could test this theory on Pikmin. Of course, they might end up carrying me instead, treasure and all. Ooh, it's so shiny. I can't decide if I'm drawn to it or if I should run in the other direction. Then we have the life controller, which of course is an NES controller. The cross-shaped structure on this device is not only satisfying to press up, down, side to side, but also clearly moves something. Strange to, strange to say, but I almost feel as though it's controlling me. But who would be controlling me? I must know who it is. I like pressing the different directions of the mathematical symbol, but there's something captivating about the two round buttons. I can't help but want to push them over and over as fast as I can. I don't want to break them, but I don't want to stop either. Nothing and no one call, tells me what to eat. <laughs> Spinning Memories Plank, which of course is a uh, Game Boy Advance copy of Kuru Kuru Kururian. 
spinning, spinning, spinning. These memories are spinning in my head. Or are they memories of spinning itself? Wait, what is happening? I'm starting to believe this mysterious black plank actually contains someone else's memories. Dizzyingly strange. How interesting that the artist used a black plank as a canvas and how they chose to depict the pilot. The look, they look like the type that works hard for their beloved family, though the design of the spaceship is all wrong. Good luck flying that thing through narrow meteor ca crevices. I've been looking for a tray like this to use at mealtimes. It looks pretty easy to carry too. No more meals will be lost to the poorly placed to the poorly placed wall. Masterpiece Plank, which is another Game Boy Advance game. I don't exactly remember what this one is, but uh, very interesting. This yellow plank, simply marvelous. The next, the text upon it is indecipherable, yet somehow moving. Could it be some sort of story? A masterpiece, I'm sure of it. How exasperating it is to not be able to read it even as it sits right there in front of me. It is a bit unusual to call something a masterpiece before you read it, but I've got a good feeling about this one. I think it's meant for children, but is it about a boy or girl? Hopefully both. It's been hard to please everyone in the audience at bedtime lately. The color of this thing reminds me of a really delicious fruit. The telekinesis detector, of course, is a left blue Joy-Con. Do you believe in psychic powers? You will once you just observe this device's uncanny behavior. That is, it vibrates all on its own. Surely this is proof that telekinesis, or yes, even psychokinesis, exists. Gah, did it just vibrate again? This machine is equipped with an advanced vibration feature. The vibrations seem to be communicating in a vacuum, perhaps trying to reach out to its corresponding system, which has likely been lost to time. Who knows what the machine is trying to say, but it's telling me something about the sadness of abandoned technology. Makes for a great back massager. And then of course we have the connection detector, the right red Joy-Con. This enigmatic object seems designated to connect to something, or maybe to make a connection between the two things. But what does it connect to, or whom does it connect? Well, we can all agree that everything is better with connection than without. Sharing is one of civilization's most important virtues. We share food, shelter, stories, and sometimes even checks. I can only hope this belief is also held by the president of our company. I'd like him to share in the form of a holiday bonus this year. Keeps bringing that up. Look at all those buttons, and that rotating nub thing. I'm not letting anyone else touch this, it's mine. Creativity Conduit, which of course is a Super Nintendo mouse controller. Can you feel it? The creative energy that flows through this object is undeniable. The color, the curvature, the smoothness to the touch. They light up the right side of the brain, the, said, the side that governs the arts. Infinite imagined possibilities await. I don't have a creative cell in my body, but my daughter somehow avoided this genetic deficiency. When she's drawing, she becomes so absorbed by her art that it's as if she can't hear a word I say. That or she's just ignoring me. I have no idea if she draws, well, if what she draws is any good, but the ability to focus on something so deeply is talented enough. Either way, her future is bright. There's a ball hiding inside this thing for some reason. Take it out and you can't roll it anymore. Stone of Advancement, of course, is a blue Game Boy Advance SP. Notice how resplendent the blue of this slab is. It's called Cobalt Blue. The pigment is extracted from an ore renowned for owning one's intuition, intelligence, and reflexes. Yes, the more I gaze upon it, the more advanced I feel myself become. Space is a funny place. You can use, be using the latest in galaxy navigation technology and still find yourself lost in a sea of space trash. But that's life, isn't it? If you want to advance, you've got to be flexible. This also applies to settling mar marital disagreements. It opens and then it closes. That's pretty fun. Winged Freedom Sculpture, of course, is a Nintendo GameCube WaveBird controller, so it's wireless. Beauty soars to new heights here. This magnificent sculpture captures the form of a white bird gliding through the air. But what does it mean? I say this isn't just about a bird. This is about freedom. Just look at it. It is freedom. I sort of see a winged aspect, but mostly this remi reminds me of a model spaceship I played with as a kid. The overall design is perfect for transcending all kinds of atmospheric barriers. Plus, it looks so cool. I see it has two rotating nubs, but it's unclear which one I should play with. Dimension Converter. Okay, so that was all of the uh, the um, newly nostalgic series. Now it's time for the Ultra Hyper Technology series. Dimension Converter. 
The technology built into these specs is incredible. To begin, there's a filter in each lens that alters the light at the quantum level. Dimensions are converted in the process and things you couldn't see that were right in front of you are revealed. Eye opening. What your eyes might see is not an extract representation of reality. We can only see one part of the world within the narrow range of visible light. This magnificent device proves that theory. I'd love to see it show it to my kids one day. It would boggle their minds. These would enhance any video game experience. So I guess I do know of video games, which is pretty cool. Soul Reverberator. The implications of this technology are quite frightening. Not only does it broadcast music played by a musician, but pieces of the musician's own soul. We always knew they put their hearts and souls into their songs, but this takes it to a whole new level. I'm picky when it comes to music, but I'm fascinated by how a melody can perfectly capture a person's soul or even a specific feeling. I wonder what my song would be. I'd like to think it would sound bold and romantic and reflect my adventurous career. Maybe I should just write it myself. Maybe you should. I climbed on top of, of the knobs. The middle one was the most comfortable. Personal injury plank. To use this mode of transportation, you must stand on the trolley and kick the ground to propel yourself forward. You can also sit on the trolley and push yourself along with your hands. It's more thrilling than riding a typical trolley, but also a lot more work. The ability to stay balanced is critical to exploration and space travel. It is okay to lose your balance, as long as you can regain it the right way. This tool is perfect for strengthening this, that skill. The only problem is I can't get it to move forward when I'm on my back. Wee, so fun to ride. Don't see it specs. An incredible invention. These glasses block out things you don't want to see while letting you see the things you do want to see. Is this a healthy way to view the world? I'm not sure it is, but I'm also not here to judge. These shutters make it difficult to see clearly ahead, so I'm not sure why they'd be found in a dark cave, as it's not as if they could just even be used as a proper hiding place. They remind me of playing hide and seek with my, kid, with my kids and pre pretending not to see them. Oddly difficult to see through, I have no idea what's in front of me. And then of course we have our next section, Nature's Candy Series. The first one is the Love Nugget. I don't know what it is about this fruit, vegetable, whatever it is, but take one bite and your heart is sure to heat up. I know mine does. Is it love at first bite or am I just imagining things? This tasty red snack isn't quite a fruit, but it doesn't seem like a vegetable either. I've analyzed it extensively, and whenever I think I've settled that ma the matter, I discover something new that calls it into question. This is why I'm not a scientist by trade. Exquisite balance of sweet and sour. The umami flavor almost doubles when cooked with meat. Crush nugget. If a crush was a taste rather than a feeling, this fruit is where you'd go to experience it. The feeling starts small when you take that first bite and think, hmm. I'm not sure if I like it. But then you take another bite and another, only to discover you not only like the taste, but have come to love it. Suddenly you have a full blown food crush on your hands. Just remember, many things in life are acquired taste. So be sure to keep an open mind. When I was a student, a girl in my class asked me to go shopping with her. It would have been rude to refuse, so I went. My friends kept hassling me, saying it was a date. It was so embarrassing, but come to think of it, my wife asked me out soon after that. I wonder if she was jealous. Yummy, but not very filling. Anxious Sprout. This plant grows very fast, which makes it a joy to tend to for garden enthusiasts. It also makes a great snack. Isn't it nice when a thing brings happiness to your life in more than one way? I say those are the sorts of things worth keeping around. This plant grows so fast it reminds me of my own children. One day, they are little babies in my arms. The next day, they're sprouted They've sprouted up into fully fledged people. I have my wife to thank for that. She does so much while I'm so frequently away for work. These delights grow fast, but not faster than I can eat them. I'd be happy to prove it. Crew cut gourd. This gourd's selling point is the diversity of ways it can be eaten. Boil it, bake it, or fry it. It all works. Added bonus, when you stand it on the on end with the stem up, it looks like a fellow with a crew cut. Ha. I once saw a prototype of a spaceship shaped a lot like this. Unfortunately, it doesn't, didn't fly straight. It just spun around in place. Examples like that are why I prefer a more traditional approach. Being original for the sake of originality is usually a waste of time. Stir fry over medium heat to get that melty inside and crunchy exterior. Child of the Earth. This plant sucks the good things out of the ground it grows in to get its lumpy, round shape. No, it doesn't look all that exciting, but I suspect the nutritional value is quite high. 
During my explorations, I found vegetables like this. I have never seen anything like them. This dark dwelling vegetable stores all of its nutritious energy in its roots. I think the name that it's been given, Childs of, Child of the Earth, is very fitting. When left unattended, its leftovers will be beginning will begin to sprout. I might try bur burying it underground to see if it takes root. Daughter of the Earth. This vegetable was tended to with the utmost care. Doted on, you might say. You can tell by its exceptional flavor and nutritional value. Yes, all the love given to it has returned it, or turned it into a sweet and savory food treat. Delicious and delightful. When my son was born, I was almost immediately worried about him. But it was a different it was different with my daughter. I sensed from the start that she was strong-willed and sturdy, a sweeter version of her mother. This daughter of the earth reminds me of her. Bake in a hot oven until you can pierce the middle with a fork. Slather with butter while still warm. And then the mysterious carriage. I understand that the ancient literature from this planet tells of a noble woman who used this fruit's rind as a carriage. Clever. Additional lore tells of some sort of midnight deadline and missing footwear. Literature is complicated. Large and the size is right for retrofitting into some sort of vehicle. Maybe a carriage? But then what do you do with the goopy insides? Flippantly throw them out the window as you roll away in your fancy new transport? Never. I am vehemently opposed to wasting food. Scoop out the flesh and bake to elicit a fruit, fruity, sweet flavor. And then the snack bean. I love how this stylish bean comes with its very own hard wrapper. It's as if it was made to be carried around and snacked on at a convenient time. It smells like quite yummy too. Funnily enough, even thinking about having a bite makes me get quite thirsty. Don't think I, I don't need any special tools to break open the shell, and the fruit inside is edible. Cracking these open is so satisfying that I find myself getting carried away and opening more than I could possibly eat. Note to self, work on moderation. Crack open the shell to snack on the crunchy nuts inside. Don't forget a drink, though these make you thirsty. All right, so that should be, okay, there's one more actually. The foolish fruit. I'm told this strange fruit is called a foolish fruit. With its odd shape and silly hat, it does have a rather goofy air about it. Still, there's no need to make fun. It's perfect just how it is. The shape of this fruit looks a lot like my grandpa's face. It's so similar that I, if I were to name it, I'd call it a grampy face fruit. My wife always thought that my taste in names was catastrophically bad, which is why she named both of our children. But I think this one has a certain ring to it. Can be grilled or sauteed, but I like it best when eaten raw. Interesting. I don't think I can agree with that one, but next up we have the Sword and Shield series. Blast Shield. Even the blast from a rocket leaving a planet can't penetrate this shield. Its protective powers are so robust that after years of use by a battle-worn soldier, there's but one small scratch on the surface, a fine piece of vintage armor, to be sure. The first time I rode in a spaceship, I was a student working part-time for an intraspace transportation company. The excitement I felt during that first launch was unforgettable. The iconic rocket engraved on this shield reminds me of that moment. Shimmers and sparkles in the sunlight. It's bewitching. Ring of Return Shield. See how this shield is engraved with the image of a massive ringed planet? In ancient times, the ring was thought to be a curse that caused space travelers to forever end up right back where they began. But nowadays, the ring has become to re represent a joyful return home after a long journey. It was also customary to give this shield to someone you love in hopes it would bring them, to, them home to you safely. When I was little, I'd look at pictures of the planets and I'd imagine the rings around them were roads you could travel on. Of course, once I got to space, I learned that those rings are actually made up of dust particles. I've never been so disappointed. A jelly donut on the verge of exploding. Oh my gosh. Satellite shield. Did you know that satellites are highly vulnerable to meteors and other space debris? This shield was specially made for space workers who protected these vital pieces of tech from damage. If this shield can withstand a blow from a meteor, it can withstand anything. Someone told me that when a satellite is decommissioned, some of its lights will start to blink spontaneously as it falls through the atmosphere. It's likely a glitch, but I like to believe that the satellite's sending one last message before burning up into nothingness. Comfortable spot for a quick nap. Heroic Shield. Emblazoned across this shield is the image of a hero beloved for leading this civilization into the stars. Soldiers who've fought enemy life forms revere this figure the most. Needless to say, the shield is strong enough to be worthy of her heroes, new and old. The figure on this shield is wearing something quite similar to our spacesuits. That would mean these living beings must have looked something like us. 
I wonder who they were and what their faces looked like. Could they have been our ancestors who migrated through space to our planet long ago? The mouth is huge and trying to eat something. Floating cookies, I think. Shooting Star Shield. To be a great warrior, one must be able to withstand not just one attack, but attack after attack. This small but powerful shield is designated to protect its owner from an onslaught of blows that land like a shower of shooting stars. Endurance is strength. I often encounter comets and meteors on the job, and collisions are bound to happen. I once had to make a crash landing for that very reason. I like to look back at those events as unexpected adventures, but at the time, they're pretty harrowing. Could be easily mistaken for some kind of jewel and sold for a hefty sum. I'd like to find more of these. Heart Sword. It is said that with this sword in hand, one can triumph over any enemy. It's also said the blade was given this hue to inflame the warrior heart within. I must say, my heart is beating faster, and yes, my blood has begun to boil. Yes, yes, let the battle begin! Even though it's awkward to handle, I assume it's a weapon of some kind. I like how lightweight and user-friendly it is, but I'm not sure how effective it would be against most threats. Either way, it's a lot of fun to play with. I like the way it looks when it's plunged into a fruit. Spirit Sword. This sword is known for bestowing on its owner the power to make allies of the forest spirits. Clearly, it was given this odd green hue in anticipation of forest combat. The color seems rather bright for any forest we know of, but maybe forests here have are very vibrant? It must be been pretty hard to see the sword in the forest, as it would blend in with the foliage. Applying apathetic coloration to a weapon is more than just practical, it's brilliant. I'm always amazed at the creative solutions that float around in the minds of others. Looks like a lot, of gra or a lot like grass. Ice Sword. Clearly, this ancient sword was forged in battle on some sort of an ice planet. Just look at it. The deep blue coloring is evidence that it once had the powers that worked best in below freezing temperatures. I could swear, all these eons later, it's still cold to the touch. I've visited a few ice-bound planets while delivering cargo throughout, the sp throughout space. Based on my experience, I find it hard to believe this material could withstand such a severe environment. I think it's likely this object was used for another purpose. It's fun to stab fruits with this thing. <laughs> Heroic Sword. This sword was once wielded by a hero who stood on the battlefield, cutting down enemies. It's said the sword's bold color drew the enemies in and distracted them. The hero made easy work of them as they stared, transfixed by this blade. My son used to have a toy sword in a similar color. He was obsessed with it and brought that sword everywhere he went, including the dinner table. That is, until I explained that it was dishonorable for a hero to attack the weak, a weaker citizen wielding only a fork. Interesting color, I'll never have to use a fork again. And okay, we have one more. Bright Sword. This sword's sunny sparkle is sure to catch the eye of your opponent during battle. And, that, and that's your chance. As they blink away the, the brightness, thrust the pointy end at their weak spot and finish them. Cowardly? That's up to you. History is written by the victor. With all these different colored swords, I assume that the armies on this planet color coded their troops. An entire unit with matching weapons and uniforms would have been a sight to behold. I'm sure this color especially stood out. When a shaft of sunlight hits the handle just so, it's beautiful, or beauty un overwhelms me. And it's like I've been transported into a painting. All right, Toys of Giants series. Unfloatable boat, a rare and precious boat that does not float. It was once used to predict the village's future. If by some miracle that boat remained slightly buoyant in the water, it meant that the village had the approval of the gods. Sadly, the boat's shoddy construction makes that seem like a rather unlikely outcome. They say it's possible to float, uh, float this unfloatable boat with the help of divine intervention. That sounds like a lot of luck to me. I've had my fair share of bad luck, but at least I've been fortunate enough to survive. Anyhow, my chances don't look good. Thought I'd take it out on the water, but it sank as soon as I boarded. Faux Fishy. A sacred fish created to amuse and comfort the ancient gods. They would submerge the fish in a heavenly spring and while the hours away, pretending to catch it and feed it. It would seem the gods had blessed themselves with way too much free time. I'm much more used to seeing fish painted in profile instead of from the top down. I suspect this is supposed to float on the water, but I'd be quite startled to encounter a fish like this under normal circumstances. This fish is too hard to chew, inedible. 
Space Spinner. This object rotates with tremendous force if spun along the center axis. Just as its name implies, its design was inspired by the rotational structure of space. Much like this with space, you're forced to ask yourself, where and when does it all end? The movement of the universe always seems slow to me, but it's a matter of perspective. Maybe the movement of this object is how a higher power perceives it. We're all so small in the grand scheme. I get dizzy thinking about the epic scale of space. Or is it just the space spinner? My eyes, they can't stop spinning. So fun. Sweat-soaked blue bird. Some, someone put a great deal of work into crafting this particular replica of an avian creature. Clearly, each, each inch, each crevice has been infused with the sweat and prayers of its creator. But all that hard work and dedication is paid off. Behold, the aura that emanates from these folds foretells of great things to come. Perhaps happiness truly does arrive on the rings of wings of a bird. Attaching an intangible wish to a tangible object seems to be a universal habit. I wish for my family's happiness, but haven't quite found the right talisman to attach to it. My family must be wishing for my safe return. I hope they have better luck. Not the most comfortable bird to ride, but I, I like its color. Skin of the Phoenix. A sculpture representing the charred skin cast off by the immortal phoenix. The red paper is clearly inspired by the color of its flaming wings. Though immortality is an impossible wish for any loving creature, this bird is imbued with the fervent desire for a miracle. This bird reminds me of a mythical creature famous for granting immortality to those brave enough to seek it out. I have no interest in living forever. Or maybe the idea of risking my life for the sole purpose of avoiding death just sounds a bit wonky to me. Why not enjoy the time you have while you have it? Anyway, this is a nice shade of red. I was disappointed to learn that it can't fly. Shame. Priceless bird. This golden paper sculpture is modeled after a bird known to invite good fortune. Laden with luck, it's sure to make many a wish come true. And as the desires held within this universe are endless, this bird may spread happiness for millennia to come. To have a charm that's solely devoted to financial luck comes off as vulgar and gives me an icky feeling. On the other hand, money is a necessity, and that's an inescapable fact. Well, there is one escape, more money. Wouldn't that be nice to have a bit more? Maybe we can sell this for a profit. The Aspiration Ritual Ball. These balls were an integral part of a ritual performed during the New Year festivals. Each ball was imbued with people's hopes and dreams, and if caught by the ritual pole, those hopes and dreams were bound to come true. What a joy it must have been to witness such a beautiful tradition. I'm deeply moved when I imagine ancient peoples entrusting this small, smooth ball with their hopes and dreams, then passing it down through ages. It'd be a comfort to know that my dreams won't die with me, but will somehow transcend time. I bit into it, thinking it was a fruit. Sadly, it's not. Aspiration Ritual Pole This ritual pole was used during an ancient festival held at the start of each new year. If the ball landed on the sharp end, the people's wishes would come true and they would dance in celebration. Though it's commonly believed that people danced either way. I'm so bemused by the idea of catching a dream, but it's difficult to achieve in practice. I still haven't been able to catch the ball with the spike upright, Perhaps I need to try an easier angle, but would that diminish the challenge and thus the quality of the dream? You may be able to poke something with the spiky part. Divine Balloon. Made from paper so impossibly thin that it appears to be the handiwork of a higher being. Be careful not to lose sight of this balloon. Despite its size, it can float along the faintest breeze. Just one gust of wind might carry it above the clouds beyond your grasp. Don't worry too much if it deflates, simply pump more air into the top hole, and the original shape is restored. The material, though paper thin, seems to, to repel water. Such an inspiring creation. Only the most advanced civilization could conceive such a work of art. It's like a metaphor for both the fragility and durability of life itself. The sound of it getting crumpled up sends a shiver up my spine, in a good way. Deity's Portrait. Okay, so this is a new one. This is our second to last series, the Collection Obsession series. Deity's Portrait. This portrait shows a half-man, half-fish deity worshipped by ancient sailors. He was known for being both kind and cruel. One minute, he'd test the sailors by sending bad weather their way. The next, he'd send them with a blast of air from his horn to their sails. 
I once had a trump card, a premium license given only to first-rate space navigation officers that allows you to bypass the arduous license renewal process, but I'm sure I lost that qualification with this recent accident. I guess it's back to annual visits to the license renewal planet on the edge of, of, of space. The lines are always so long. Oh no, what? I've always wanted to play the trumpet. Devil's portrait. What an unsettling portrait. Just look at that devilish face, not to mention that clown-like getup and that odd grin. What is he up to? No good, I say. No, there's nothing more unnerving than when someone smiles at you and you aren't sure why. Does true evil really exist? I can't say for sure, but I've seen a smile like this before. It's often graces the face of the president of Hakate Freight, usually when, when he's asking me to work overtime, unpaid. Hmm, so I guess I can confirm that true evil exists. I like the look of this character. Seems like a fun companion. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Courage Emblem. This symbol looks like a container of some sort, perhaps one that can contain life itself. I get a sense of vitality from it, almost as if, there, uh, if the more of these you have, the more power you have to overcome my adversity. But be careful, I'm sure they're not easy to obtain. Some might look at this and see a symbol for life, but this treasure better represents courage. The two are closely related, of course. Power and wisdom also have roles to play, but without the courage to take that first step, your journey cannot begin. The symbols remind me of mock bottoms. I'm hungry again. Power emblem. There can be no doubt that the symbol seen here represents power. Look at it. Everything about it screams strength. Surely in, in the right and even wrong hands, its power would be immense. Perhaps it's best not to approach it unless you have to. There's physical power, and then there's mental power. Anyone who's witnessed an argument between me and my wife can see there who's quicker on their feet in the heat of the moment. That doesn't bother me so much. I just wish I had the same fortitude and wit to stand up to the president. All I see are empty plates in need of some food. Wisdom emblem. I feel certain the shape seen here represents wisdom. Just look at its arching symmetry. It's elegant, but not ostentatious. Complex, but not overly ornate. It brings to mind scholars with noses in books and scientists working towards conclusions. Possessing wisdom isn't always a good thing. Sure, you can examine a subject from multiple angles, but you can also get stuck in a maze of thoughts. Am I envious of people who can just act on instinct without overthinking every last detail? Let's see. I don't. Maybe. Works well for a makeshift fan, and even features a picture of a salad. Also fans my appetite. Love Emblem. Looking at these symbols all lined up, I feel my heartbeat quicken. And yes, I feel the, this rush of warmth that must be love. This kind of love says, cherish all things, love yourself, love your enemies, love everything. It's a tall order, but I will try. If my travels through space and my time spent observing various life forms have taught me anything, it's that love can take many forms. Some creatures get the nutrition they need to grow their eggs by eating their mates, but that's an extreme example. I've had a lot of sweet fruits that look like this one shown here. Money emblem. My mind wanders to dark places when I look at these symbols. All I see are gemstones, and ill-gotten gemstones at that. Perhaps they're stolen jewels, confiscated by police and laid out like this as evidence that the sink of crime is in the, in the air. Love I feel for my family and the passion I have for my work are so very important to me, but so is money. Love and passion are all well and good, but you can't appreciate any of it if you go hungry, and you'll go hungry in this universe without money. A collection of jewels such as this would sell for a lot of cash. Work emblem. I don't know what it is about these symbols that puts me at ease, but they do. Might be a good idea to hang this sheet up at the workplace when the, street, the stress starts kicking in. Of course, without stress, how will I get my work done? Quite the conundrum, no? In my line of work, it's crucial to stay on top of your to-do lists. When things are busy, it's easy to get sloppy and let things slide. But that's when consistency matters most. There's nothing like that rush of joyful relief you feel when crossing off a task. Looks like a veritable garden of crunchy sandwich fillings. Gold Nugget. What can I say that hasn't been said a thousand times before? Obviously, it's gorgeous, and oh, how it glitters. Still, it's not every day one gets to see a gold nugget of this size. Will the wonders of this strange planet ever cease? I certainly hope not. Appears to have the same composition as the gold on my planet. I've heard that some heavy elements, like gold, are created during rare collisions between neutron stars. But to think the same element exists on a faraway planet reminds me, space is so vast. 
And then, uh, wait, Louis. When I see this, all I want is more. So that was all of the treasure catalog. So one last, or all of the collection obsession series. Now one last series as part of the treasure catalog, the Hands of Fate series. The Long Shot Totem. Rolling the stone so that it lands on the specific symbol you want is no easy task. 12 sides is a lot of sides. Why even try? But when you do at last get the symbol you hoped for, what a thrill. It's sure to keep you trying again and again. I've lived long or lived through some harrowing events, and the trick to surviving in space is to prepare for every possible situation. But this is technically and literally impossible. Sometimes you just need to roll the dice, hope for the best, and let the universe do its thing. Only useful for deciding when deciding between 12 or less options for your next meal. Go with the flow totem. With this many sides, how is this totem not just a sphere? Give it a roll and it seems like it might never stop. And when it does, well, there are so many numbers it could land on. Does it really matter which one? Best to just go with the flow. Having to choose one out of 20 possible scenarios during a voyage through space would be an object, ob object lesson in randomness and very unfortunate. On the minuscule chance it should ever occur, the only solution would be to throw up your hands and laugh. Fun to watch because it rolls so well. Chance Totem. This mysterious stone is quite heavy, but once it's rolled, it's relentless in its pursuit of fate. Six sides and six paths await you. Where the roll lands, so goes your life. Now, can you master the work of art that is your fate? When I gaze at this stone, I can feel my fate being forecasted. It must know what's going to happen to me. I'm sure it sees that I'll be hailed as a brilliant visionary and brave explorer when I return to Hakatate. I'm not sure which is luckier, one or six. Difficult Choice Totem. This tool can be helpful when one finds oneself faced with an especially hard choice. Simply roll this stone and leave the decision to fate. But when the roll ends abruptly, will you like the decision fate picked for you, or will you wish you decided for yourself? While exploring, I'm often faced with the difficult question, which way do I go? North, south, east, or west? A tool like this could be useful in those moments. Of course, one roll would be too random, it'd be best to roll it a hundred times and take the average result. Climb at your own risk. Talisman of Life, Crane. The citizens of this planet once wished upon this luck wafer for a long life. You see, the strange bird pictured there is said to, to live a very long life. Additionally, the bird seems to be facing a supernova, the final stage of a star's existence. Ah, to live for billions of years like a star does. One can hardly even imagine it. I hope to one day celebrate a high-numbered birthday, but I don't think there will be any large birds in attendance at the party. Just think of how much trouble they, would, they could cause. If space has taught me anything, it's the plan for the worst-case scenario. The bird looks like it has a lot of meat on its bones. <laughs> Talisman of Life, Cherry Blossom. Starting school, getting a new job, people in ancient times prayed to this luck wafer at moments of big change in their lives. Flowers do bring to mind new beginnings, so it makes sense. We all want to blossom, don't we? Springtime always reminds me of the day I moved out of my parents' house. At first, everything was fresh and exciting, but I quickly realized that life on my own was a lot harder than I expected. I also realized I should thank my parents for all they've done for me. Puts me in the mood for snacking. Talisman of Life, Moon. The ancient people of this planet used this luck wafer during wedding ceremonies. They did so because the moon is the object one stares at when they think about someone they love. Or at least, that's what I stare at when I love when I have love on my mind. Alas, at this very moment, I have no one to think about. When my son was little, he thought the moon was just a powdered donut in the sky. He would cry and cry, I want to eat the moon. Apparently, I was the same way. These days, he loves to look at the moon through a telescope. Guess the apple doesn't fall far. White and round, I'd eat it. Talisman of life, rain. The ancient people turned to this luck wafer when things weren't going well for them. It served as a reminder that no matter how much it rained, the storm always eventually passed. And the same goes for bad times. These two always blow away on the breeze. I love rainy days. They're the perfect time to catch up on paperwork, relax a bit, and dream about my next big adventure. That is, if I have any energy left after entertaining my kids, who can't go outside to play when it's wet. Eh, I'll take what I can get. Reminds me of the time I lost my lunch after drinking some rainwater. Talisman of Life, Phoenix. I've heard a story about a company that was in decline, but when they hung this wafer above the entry door, their performance shot up from the ashes like a phoenix. Hmm, 
Maybe if I hang this picture, it will light a fire into my appraisal business. Maybe this object would help increase productivity at Hakodate Freight. So would a better spaceship. Hmm. Maybe it's my fault. If I stopped miraculously surviving such dangerous situations, the president might realize we need to upgrade our equipment. I bet this piece would sell for a lot of money. Universe, okay, so we're back. There we go, we have run through all 239 treasures analyzed as all three character um, data points. Oh my goodness, that took so long. I, I don't think I'll ever drop by again, Chanelis, but uh, thank you for the offer. So you might be wondering, after doing all of that for so long, what left is there still to check out? And for that, we still have a few more things here on the Pikmin 4 main menu. And if we press any button, we can see that there's Dandori Battle. Put your planning skills to work and manage the clock in this fierce competition that can be enjoyed solo or with two players. Now, since we've already played Dandori Battle throughout the story, we don't really need to right now. But as you can see, if you're curious, you could play against a computer, play against a friend, or team up with a friend against a computer. So these can be pretty cool. Maybe I'll at least showcase it, new elements added to Dandori Battle, new characters added to player settings. So yeah, this is pretty cool. This is where we could do some different things like Trial Run, um, but obviously we've already done that. Trial Run was, of course, the first battle we had against Leafling Alamar. Uh, we can choose it here, do player settings and stuff, and um, I think we could choose different characters. So yeah, for player one, we have um, our main character, but we also have Colin, and uh, I'm forgetting their name right now, but we also have Alamar Louie as the computer components or opponents. And I think a second player could choose this as well. So yeah, this is pretty cool. There's a lot of different settings you can get into here if you really wanted to get into some specific kind of battles with your friends or against computers. If you guys wanna see me play through some of that, I guess we could. But for right now, I think we've really seen it all just throughout the game. And then lastly, there's the gallery mode. Experience the excitement all over again. Rewatch the cutscenes you've seen so far. So I don't believe there's really anything more here maybe. We have Almar shipwrecked, the rescue course to the rescue, Almar's been rescued, credits, heading home, the SS Dolphins heading home, and then Almar's shipwrecked tail farewell, then Almar's shipwrecked tail escaped, and then Almar's shipwrecked tail no escape. Um, I think out of all of them, this is the only one we haven't seen. So yeah, everything before here, we've already seen, but we've not seen Almar Shipwreck Tale No Escape. This is what happens if you run out of time um, when trying to find all of the ship pieces. If you don't get them all within the 20 days or whatever time it gave you, um, this is the cutscene that plays. So the ship is trying to fly away, but it's really having a hard time. Oh no. And uh oh, we'll make it? <laughs> no! All the way back down to the ground. Not good. I attempted a takeoff with the SS Dolphin still in disrepair. But despite my desperate hopes and optimism, it came crashing down yet again. <laughs> and of course, because of that, Alamar gets zipped up and turned into Leafling Alamar, which we have seen this part. It seems like no matter what ending you get, it sort of technically still ends the same way, because either that or Alamar flies off with Moss and then has to turn back around. So, no matter what, we end up right back here. <laughs> Yikes. So pretty cool that in that way, like, you know, there's always still technically a, a correct ending to the adventure. But yeah, that should be everything. I we, We've seen all these just through playing the game. So very cool. With that being said, I am quite satisfied. I think we've checked out everything we need to see in Pikmin. For. So the question might be, what's next? I've talked about it a little bit in previous episodes and people are still asking, so I'll remind everyone. We still need to complete Pikmin 3 Deluxe. I plan on doing that eventually. I don't know when exactly. Might be a while because of all the other new games coming out at the moment. And of course, eventually as well, I would like to play through Pikmin 1 and 2. I think those would definitely come after Pikmin 3 Deluxe, so we might have a while to wait until that happens, but it's on my long, long list of games to play that keeps me up at night. <laughs> So, in the meantime, thank you guys so much for your support throughout this series. It has been a ton of fun playing this game, and I'm really glad you guys enjoyed this series. Everybody's been checking out the episodes and really enjoying each one, and telling me how excited they are to see the next episode, and that always means so very much to me. And I hope you guys are just as excited to see me play through some of the new games coming out soon. Stuff like Super Mario Wonder, um, the new Sonic game that I'm forgetting the name of, Super Mario RPG Remastered, tons of cool stuff is on the way super duper stu soon, so stay tuned for that for sure. But with that being said, that is gonna wrap it up for today's episode of Pikmin 4. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.